Don't push on me so they can probably hear you if you say anything. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dr. Barry Trachtenberg, heart failure cardiologist and co-director of the Houston Heart Failure Summit. On behalf of the Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center and the J.C. Walter Methodist Transplant Center, we would like to welcome you to our sixth annual and our first virtual Heart Failure Summit. Good morning. I'm Ashrit Guha, also a heart failure transplant cardiologist and the co-director of this summit. We're thrilled to have a great lineup of speakers today and a special breakout session. Um, before we begin, we have a few uh, housekeeping items that we'll go over. During our main session today, please submit your questions by texting DEBAKEY, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, to 37607 wants to join and then text your question or go to pollev.com and enter DeBakey. During the breakout sessions, you'll be able to select the sessions that you're most interested in. So there are a total of, um, the, the, you're limited to three sessions and each session um, is for 15 minutes with five minutes of Q&A. And you will be prompted to select the first session and then prompted again after you finish uh, each session. During the breakouts, please submit your Q&A through the chat feature. And for all our, our friends who tweet, please feel free to tweet any slides that you like. And, and please try to remember to use the hashtag HHFS2021, that's HHFS, Houston Heart Failure Summit. 2021. And uh, finally, we'd like to thank our uh, sponsors. We are co-sponsored by the Texas chapter of the American College of Cardiology. In addition, we are endorsed by the Heart Failure Society of America, which is a multidisciplinary professional membership organization that's working to improve heart failure care and significantly reduce the burden of heart, of heart failure on patients and families worldwide. HFSA provides opportunities for its members to connect through in-person meetings learn and earn continuing medical education. 
and develop professionally through mentorship and leadership roles and explore groundbreaking research. Uh, finally, we would like to gratefully acknowledge uh, Abbott Laboratories for providing an educational uh, grant to partially support today's activity. And we would like to thank our exhibitors for participating, including uh, Axia Therapeutics, AstraZeneca, Bayer Healthcare Pharmaceuticals, CareDX, Impulse Dynamics, Janssen for pulmonary hypertension, Medtronic, and Pfizer. Please visit our virtual exhibitors during the breaks. Finally, it is my great, great pleasure and honor to introduce our first speaker, our first keynote speaker. This is Dr. Randall Starling. Dr. Starling is a member of the section of heart failure and cardiac transplant and staff cardiologist in the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. He's a former section head of heart failure and cardiac transplant at Cleveland Clinic, and he is the past president of the Heart Failure Society of America. Dr. Starling is a professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine. Dr. Starling received his medical edu education at Temple University and went to University of Pittsburgh for his internship and residency and completed cardiology fellowship at Ohio State University. Dr. Starling has been a principal or co-principal investigator on numerous clinical trials, including National Institutes of Health trials, grant-funded trials, industry-sponsored trials, He's conducted uh, just numerous trials in heart failure, mechanical support, transplant, and uh, he's been published in over 360 peer-reviewed articles and is um, an ed editorial member of uh, the, Journal of the Journal for the American College of Cardiology and on the editorial bo board for Jack Heart Failure and really is one of the you know, really leaders in the field of heart failure uh, and we are so honored to have him here and look forward to his keynote uh, and there will be uh, five minutes uh, for Q&A at the end of his talk. Thank you, Dr. Starling. Good morning. Hi, I'm Randall Starling from the Cleveland Clinic. It is my great pleasure to participate today in the Houston Heart Failure Summit. My thanks to Dr. Trackenberg, Dr. Awul, and colleagues for this very kind uh, invitation. Today, my topic is goal-directed medical therapy in 2021. My disclosures, no direct reimbursement, uh, you can see everything here, uh, advisory committees for clinical trials and the FDA advisory panel. So let's begin. Heart failure is clearly an epidemic and it's concentrated in the elderly uh, population. So looking at this figure, we can see from 20s to 80s, a marked rise and this is the percent of the population over 80, 10% has heart failure. If we look at heart failure hospitalization, it's a very, very common problem in the Medicare population. Over the last 10 years, it's been approximately a million patients per year hospitalized in the United States with heart failure. So, when we look at heart failure uh, hospitalizations and we look at some of the very important outcomes in heart failure hospitalizations, they include mortality, readmission, cardiovascular readmission, heart failure readmission, and combinations. What I want to demonstrate to you in this figure is the ejection fraction does not matter whether it's reduced, whether it's preserved, whether it's mid-range, these events occur the same. So if we look at five-year mortality, irrespective of ejection fraction, it's the same. So just remember, all of the trouble we go to to measure ejection fraction, at the patient level, it doesn't seem to matter too much. If we look at survival, median survival, now here it is broken down by age. And in the red bar is the normal life expectancy 
in the US. So let's go up to our population over age 80, where the normal expectation is about a 9% median survival in years. Patients with heart failure, again, irrespective of the ejection fraction, it's about two years. So again, the effect of age on survival and heart failure, very important. So the 2016 ESC guidelines looked at classifications of heart failure based upon heart failure with reduced ejection fraction under 40, mid-range 40 to 49%, and preserve greater than 50%. So they felt it was important to break patients down into these three different categories of heart failure. However, this very important paper was published in the European Heart Journal in 2019. <clears throat> the title, The Continuous Heart Failure Spectrum, Moving Beyond an Ejection Fraction. So what we see in this left-hand panel is something that every cardiologist knows, variability in the measurement, variability in the same patient in the same measure. Why does it occur? The measurements are imprecise. So these authors highlighted the fact that we're really dealing with a continuous heart failure spectrum. Moving beyond the ejection fraction classification, they propose the importance of phenotyping. Break down the patient based on etiology or disease mechanism. Look carefully at phenotypes. We have done clinical trials for years looking at large populations with heterogeneous patients, making it very difficult at times to really show an effect of a therapy. The call for us all now is to look more carefully toward personalized mechanistic trials on small populations of homogeneous patients. Perhaps the best example of that would be comparing a HEFPEF study in HEFPEF patients at large versus an amyloid study. What would happen if we gave tofamidus to HEFPEF? It would be ineffective, but when we drill down to the right phenotype, it's highly effective. So GDMT, what this really means is guideline-directed management and therapy encompassing clinical evaluation, diagnostic, testing, and pharmacologic and procedural treatments. This applies to reduced mid-range preserved and recovered ejection fraction. So let's look at the guidelines. What's our Bible to teach us how to treat these patients? So this is the, the, the big document published now Four years ago, ACC, AHA, HFSA, focused update of the 2013. It's already out of date very quickly. And in this document, specifically to make a point, there was a comment related to ARNI, Secubitril Valsartan. Discontinue ACE or ARB and initiate ARNI is level of evidence one, but it was recommended. It was not a strong recommendation. As you can see, step two says adequate BP, ACE or ARB. Step three is to take the patient off of the ACE RB and to put the patient on ARNI. More recently, the 2021 update, to this particular uh, document addresses this issue in HEFREF stage C, now saying clearly ARNI is preferred. So ARNI, Secubitril Valsartan is the go-to drug. But what else did this document show us? It now shows there are many additional classes, including beta blockers, 
aldosterone antagonists, now STLT2 inhibitors, of course, diuretics, hydralazine nitrates, and evabridine. But some of these drugs, we have to titrate. So it's not write a prescription and you're done. It is a process. So they refer in this document to intensification. And that intensification is a process that can take two to four months. Patients should be evaluated in one to four week cycles. So important concept, serial evaluation of the patient and titration, look at the necessary information to optimize the patient. GDMT is not static. GDMT is fluid and fluctuates and must be adjusted and must be optimized. But is this fast enough? When a patient is diagnosed with heart failure, should we wait two to four months or should this be done more rapidly? Some think this is an urgency and we should strive to get this done in a month, no more than four to six weeks. So let's review what we know about the medical therapy that we now have. So secubitral valsartan was tested in a clinical trial called Paradigm HF, and this was published in the New England Journal in 2014. And there was an editorial that appeared from the editors, in fact, highlighting the paradigm shifts in heart failure and put a timeline out there. I think it's historically quite informative and important to look at this. So go back to 1986 when we looked at the VHEF study, which was nitrate and hydralazine. Then enalapril came online in the consensus study and very ill heart failure patients. Then the SOLVE studies looking at ACE inhibitors, which became first line therapy. The US Carvedilol study with beta blockers, the DID study, the seminal rail study led by uh, Dr. Pitt from University of Michigan with MRA and on and on down the line, including defibrillators, CRT, et cetera, <clears throat> all the way up to Paradigm HF. So it's been a long timeline. And for many years, we, there just were no advances and therapy was relatively static until Arnie came along. What's quite disappointing commentary though, is what we learned in this paper, which was published one year after the approval of Arnie. So Secubitril Valsartan FDA approved in July of 2015. So a year later, looking in a registry, it was reported that Arnie therapy was prescribed in approximately two of 100 patients hospitalized for HEFREF during the year following approval. So this story played out over about five years. It took a long time to make the conversion from ACE ARB to Arnie, but I think we've finally gotten there. But we learned a lot from the Secubitril Valsartan story as far as the delays in adoption. There has literally been an explosion of new therapy since 2017. So the next set of information that I wanna go over very quickly at a very high level is just to mention for those of you that are not immersed in heart failure care, some highlights that you may not be familiar with and to emphasize what has been learned in the last five years. So let's look at DAPA. DAPA glyphosin is a class known as an SGLT2 inhibitor. More on that in a couple minutes. So this very important study looked at over 4,000 patients with a primary endpoint of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization 
looking at placebo in red and dapagliflozin in blue and showed a dramatic result with a hazard ratio of 0.74, highly significant effect of this drug on top of ACE ARB, beta blocker, MRA, and in a small number of patients, secubitril valsartan. Next came along DAPA, chronic kidney disease. Why was this study done? There was a signal that this drug may actually have a protective effect with respect to renal function. So DAPA CKD looked at 4,300 patients with a GFR between 25 and 75. Now with a primary uh, endpoint that was a composite of worsening renal failure, onset of end-stage renal failure, death due to cardiovascular or renal disease. Dapagliflozin reduced the risk of worsening renal function, death in patients with CKD, with or without diabetes. So looking at this study, uh, specifically at the data now, a 50% decline in GFR, end-stage renal disease, renal or cardiovascular cause of death. Hazard ratio 0.61, highly statistically significant. Also of great interest, looking at death from any cause, those that received dapagliflozin had a lower risk of all cause mortality. Stunning results with this drug. Another year passes and another study is reported. This study reported by Milton Packer at ESC 2020 with a drug by the name of empagliflozin. This is also an SGLT2 inhibitor. Some subtle differences they looked at a smaller cohort of patients, same primary endpoint, and again, a very, very positive trial with a 25% reduction, highly significant. So the data on SGLT2 inhibitors is growing rapidly. So SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. I've shown you two studies. Let's combine them and look at the meta-analysis. So this was published in Lancet less than a year ago. And we look at all-cause mortality. We look at cardiovascular death. And we look at first hospitalization for heart failure or cardiovascular death and one can see the results. There were some differences in mortality effects with empagliflozin. We don't know specifically why. It may have had to do to some degree with the duration of follow-up in these patients, but suffice it to say, these drugs are highly effective in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. Now, what about the use of ARNI? So in this meta-analysis, they have broken down between patients receiving ARNI and not receiving ARNI. And you can see uh, the number of patients uh, receiving ARNI is actually quite small. Having said that, the effects with and without ARNI appear to be uh, consistent. So there's no reason to believe that adding these drugs on top of ARNI, beta blocker, and MRA will not produce benefit for the patient. So what about diabetes? And clearly shown in this uh, figure from the meta-analysis forest plots with diabetes, without diabetes, across the board, the drug works and is highly effective. 
We don't know why these drugs work. We don't know the mechanism of action. This is a very important ongoing area of research. There's some data to suggest that there is an effect on the cardiac sodium hydrogen exchanger and that this particular effect may result in less apoptosis. We know that these drugs uh, result in glucosuria. They have a diuretic effect. Oftentimes diuretics have to be down titrated. They appear to reduce oxidative stress. They appear to be cardioprotective and reduce apoptosis. Uh, again, the exact cardiac mechanism of action is not known. Some leading theories do suggest that it reduces cell death, and these effects are valid for diabetic and non-diabetic patients. So just one month ago, January of 2021, another study was published in the New England Journal looking at sodaglyphosin in patients with diabetes and recent worsening renal function. These patients were hospitalized with acute heart failure, receiving uh, diuretics. They were all known diabetics or met criteria for diabetes during the hospitalization. Again, stunning results with sodaglyphosin versus placebo with a reduction in the primary endpoint, which was death from cardiovascular causes and hospitalizations or and urgent visits for heart failure. So now three separate drugs, three separate large, well-controlled clinical trials in patients with acute heart failure, outpatients that are stable, improvements with SGLT2 inhibitors. What was really remarkable, exciting, and encouraging in the sodaglyphosin study was this pre-specified analysis based upon ejection fraction. All ejection fractions were included in this study. When they looked at less than 50 and greater than 50%, the results were consistent. So this may be a glimpse to the future when we learn from the empaglyphosin uh, studies in preserved heart failure that should be reported out within the next year, whether this drug works across the board irrespective of ejection fraction. Victoria looked at verisiguat, a soluble guanolate cyclase inhibitor. This particular drug uh, did meet its primary endpoint. It was modest. The risk of death or time to first hospitalization uh, was uh, reduced with a hazard ratio of 0.9, significant p-value. The FDA approved this drug in January of this year. I think Many of us are wondering and thinking about the niche population of patients that will benefit from this drug the most, likely to be people hospitalized, some perhaps maybe not tolerating a neurohormonal antagonist. This drug shows promise that it may help out this group of patients. Then we look at Paragon HF. So just to re remind everyone, Paragon HF looked at secubitril valsartan in patients with an ejection fraction over 45%. Primary endpoint, death from cardiovascular causes, hospitalizations for heart failure. So this drug did not reach its primary endpoint. The hazard ratio was 0.87, it was not statistically significant. So there has been much, much discussion about this trial. And a lot of the discussion has revolved around the p-value. Traditionally, 
must be less than 0.05 to be considered a positive trial. The heart failure hospitalizations were adjudicated by a standard known as the Hicks criteria. Many of these patients were enrolled outside of the US and the adjudication committee had to adhere to very strict criteria. So there's some debate as to whether some endpoints were missed. Nonetheless, the FDA convened an advisory panel on December 15th. This drug was discussed by uh, approximately 18, 17 or 18 eminent uh, clinicians in the field that voted in favor of this drug being approved. The discussion basically said mildly reduced ejection fraction for reasons uh, you can understand based upon some of my earlier comments. They wanted to stay away from a specific ejection fraction because of the vagaries of the measurement, et cetera. Let's also mention another new drug, uh, Omicamptive Macarbal which is a cardiac myosin activator. This drug works by a unique mechanism of action. It is not an inotrope. It is known as a calcium sensitizing agent. So it increases the force of contraction without uh, the requisite increase in intracellular calcium. So a novel new drug in the field. So the results of this study in over 8,000 patients were published in the New England Journal uh, earlier this year. The primary outcome was a composite of first heart failure event, hospitalization or urgent visit, or death from cardiovascular causes. So the hazard ratio, 0.92, p-value 0.03, so uh, this drug uh, does appear that it can be used in patients that perhaps won't tolerate uh, SGLT2, uh, secubitral valsartan, and beta blocker. Should it be added on top of them? We just don't know at this point. I think it's important to show you some of the features of the patients that were in this trial. 21% female, very small number of uh, blacks. 17% of the patients were recruited from the US. Only 3% were class four. These were very sick patients with a GFR of 58 and an entry BNP of 2000. About 19% were on secubitral valsartan and a very, very small percentage, less than 3% on STLT2, which we really didn't know about the efficacy of this drug when this study uh, was enrolling. So here's yet another drug that shows promise. We await uh, the FDA review of this drug. And again, I think we'll have to determine the niche where this drug fits in. So where are we with medical therapy for heart failure? So this slide, which was put together by Joanne Lindenfeld in 2018, took us across the board with everything we've talked about today with the added benefits of devices and including the MitraClip, which came online in 2018. Moving to 2019, here's a slide prepared by Greg Fonero, looking at relative risk reduction and mortality from way back when, when we had nothing, with the 35% two-year mortality, and then progressive, let's add them up, secubitral valsartan, beta blocker, aldosterone antagonist, SGLT2 inhibitor, now we're looking at 24-month mortalities at close to 10%. So 
Much has improved over the last 25 years with heart failure. And now <clears throat> looking uh, ahead to 2020 and the advent of, of dapagliflozin, uh, again, we see that as we add more drugs on, the patients continue to derive benefit. So we have to think in terms of all of these drugs for all of our patients when possible with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So we're now looking at four pillars of care for patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. ACE ARB ARNI, beta blocker, aldosterone antagonist, and SGLT2 inhibitors. I think it's also very, very important to point out that these drugs save lives, these drugs reduce uh, hospitalizations, they improve quality of life. But when we put patients on medicines, and in some cases, devices, for some patients, there's no improvement. For some patients, there's partial improvement. But for some patients, there's complete improvement, reverse remodeling, improvement of an ejection fraction to over 50%. We know that we never stop these drugs with very rare exceptions. So guideline-directed medical therapy can do so much for your patients, survival, quality of life, and actually the structure and function of the heart. So do we use these drugs in the US? So the CHAMP registry looked at this question and here's the data from 3,500 patients and 150 sites. On treatment, not very good. Less than 15% on ARNI, less than 70, uh, percent on beta blockers, less than 35% on uh, MRA, and only about 60% across the board really on good medical therapy. Target doses were received by few. Look at these numbers, 17% ACE ARB, 14% ARNI, 28% beta blocker. Why don't these drugs get titrated? I don't know that there's a good reason why it doesn't happen, but it doesn't happen. And many of these patients just didn't have any attention to their doses. No titration took place longitudinally over one to two years. There's many excuses, reasons, hypotheses, as to why these drugs don't get uh, initiated and titrated. Uh, is the patient that's stable, should they not receive the drug? I don't think so. W who determines the maximally tolerated uh, therapy? We do, we have to see these patients, we have to push the limits, we have to continue to titrate them. Do some patients push back? Yes, but we have to do our best to educate them. And it, just to emphasize again, the effects of these drugs are additive. So as we start off with nothing and we climb the ladder to, in this particular study, didn't have SGLT2 inhibitors, but when you add ARNI beta blocker and MRA on a network meta-analysis, you have reduced mortality by almost 60 to 70%, quite, quite dramatic. So we have to continually think about this when we're seeing our patients. And this uh, published in Lancet last year, looked at estimating lifetime benefits of comprehensive disease-modifying pharmacologic therapies 
uh, now a comparative analysis of three randomized uh, clinical trials showing you're talking about eight years that you potentially are adding on to the patient's lifespan when you get them on all four pillars of treatment. When patients are in the hospital, some have described this as a teachable moment where we can really take advantage of this situation to optimize medical therapy. And this uh, study published in Jack Heart Failure uh, said, well, what do we do when patients come in the hospital? Do we initiate? Do we continue? Do we switch? You know, what exactly happens? So what did the authors find? So they found that in many cases, beta blockers are withdrawn. Some patients aren't treated. In a minority of patients, they are continued. And in an even smaller number of patients, they're newly started. And guess what? Of course, the mortality rate is highest in the patients that don't get beta blockers or that uh, have had limited exposure to them. And same thing is true uh, with ACE inhibitors. Those that were continued or started in the hospital versus those where it was discontinued had the highest mortality. Now, this doesn't mean that we're bad uh, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, uh, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants. Some of this is based on the substrate of the patients that are very sick, but that's not always the case. And this is a reminder to us how important it is that we work on getting these patients on therapy when they're in the hospital, if we can. So again, why not GDMT? And what can we do about it? Well, I would like to think there's a number of things we can do about it. And certainly the American Heart Association with their Get With the Guidelines effort, and now the American College of Cardiology is accrediting heart failure uh, uh, teams. And this is about teamwork, your team working with ours stronger together. So there are many efforts underfoot to help us do a better job with GDMT. And really the underpinnings of all of this is an area known as implementation science. And this is embedded in the whole area of healthcare innovation, which we're all immersed in today. So many groups are looking at innovative strategies, methods, tools, technologies to quicken implementation, decision planning, support tools for all of us to try to do a better job. Guidelines are guidelines, but we have to translate them to become reality. So I want to review some of the efforts that the Heart Failure Society of America is involved with. Many of you, I'm happy to say, are members of the Heart Failure Society of America. Dr. Bimraj uh, ha has been quite a champion within the Heart Failure Society, and we appreciate all of his time and efforts. But what HFSA is working on is a heart failure uh, certification known as Heart Failure Cert. And this has been developed to recognize providers who have demonstrated specialized knowledge and skill. So anyone that, for example, hasn't taken the heart failure boards, but is very uh, committed to the care of heart failure patients, could be a family doctor, an internist, an ER physician, uh, a nurse practitioner. Uh, they can take an examination, uh, master a body of information, receive a certifying examination, 
and designate themselves as an expert in this field. So heart failure certification provides uh, a infrastructure for education and emphasizes the importance of a multidisciplinary team approach in patient-centered care. And there will be a heart failure certification examination. And we hope this will launch uh, this year in 2021. So in closing, I want to turn back to this recent 2021 update on the 2017 ACC expert consensus and really drive home teamwork. Principle 11 in their document, team-based care is critical to optimizing GDMT and may include frequent follow-up visits, telehealth visits, and remote monitoring. So we won't be successful as one person. We have to do this as a team. And in some cases, it's a team of teams to get this work done. And we have to constantly remember and remind ourselves why is GD, GDMT important? As we've learned, it improves survival and outcomes. And GDMT is the underpinning that must be properly optimized before all other therapies can even be considered. And ICD, CRT, a mitra clip, an LVAD, or a transplant, we have to have run the table and optimized the patient with GDMT before even considering these therapies. And also remember, GDMT is forever. When a patient gets put on these therapies, they're likely gonna be on these therapies the rest of their lives. So in summary, there are four classes of life-saving medications for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. There is limited use of approved proven medical therapies. We need greater implementation and teamwork. And ideally, we will use all four classes together and many of our patients. So I wanna thank you for the privilege and opportunity to present to you today. I hope that we can take questions and further our discussion. And my utmost thanks and gratitude to the organizers of the Houston Heart Failure Meeting. And I look forward to our further discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Starling, for an incredibly thoughtful and expert talk. Um, we are very grateful for you um, being here in person uh, or via Zoom to answer live Q&A after the, uh, the rescheduling of our conference due to the, the Houston uh, snow popocalypse, as it's being called. So thank you for being. That was really a, a whirlwind tour over the last few years of all the changes we've had in this field. I wanted to ask you, and you touched on this and towards the end of your presentation, but with over 6 million patients in the United States suffering from heart failure, and last time I checked, you know, just a little over 1,000 board-certified heart failure cardiologists, um, you mentioned you know, involving the Heart Failure Society to get more nurse practitioners and pharmacists to help implement some of these strategies. But as you can see, with all these new drugs, and you know, it's not just starting them, as you mentioned, it's titrating them. Uh, it really does require some expertise. And uh, even among non-heart failure cardiologists and internists who are seeing a lot of these uh, patients, how, what's the best way to, to get this message out? And, and how can we treat these patients most efficiently and get them titrated because we're seeing so many patients that are still not on half the medications that have been around for a decade and certainly not up titrated on the ones that they're on. Yeah, thank you for that uh, question and, and comments, Barry. Uh, just a couple side notes. 
I know this conference was rescheduled because of the storms and the power outage. And I'm in the middle of a power outage here today, connected on battery power and my cell phone. So uh, the internet connection's a little bit shaky. Uh, it's ironic. And yeah, I recorded this uh, for the March conference. So I was happy to see that most of what I said was still up to date. It's a rapidly changing field. So the question has to do with implementation and how do you get it done? Uh, if I had the answer, it would be implemented. There are many ideas about it and what the Heart Failure Society of America has decided as a first step it does relate to uh, increasing the workforce, if you will. As you already pointed out, there's a limited number of advanced heart failure physicians. We think of this in basically uh, three tiers. So at, at one level, you're gonna have individuals, maybe a nurse practitioner, maybe a hospitalist, someone that's interested and takes care of these patients, uh, masters the curriculum of the heart failure certification and is fully qualified with continuous updates to implement and titrate GDMT. Um, HFSA also hopes to uh, uh, certify centers, so looking at the whole spectrum. So for example, my center in Cleveland, yours in Houston, uh, but other centers that don't have the expertise that wanna learn more. And yeah, there will be advanced heart failure physicians kind of at the top of the of the heap that are going to have to give input and uh, suggestions as to continuous improvement. So I, we definitely believe we need a lot more individuals involved that understand the importance of GDMT, what can be accomplished with GDMT, and, and how to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Starling, for that. Uh... Amazing talk. We have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, one of them is, would you advocate to start beta blockers and SGLT2 inhibitors at baseline before uh, starting ARNI and, uh, uh, and uh, MARS? Probably it's the mineralocorticoid uh, antagonist. Yeah, I saw that question go by in the <laughs> chat box and uh, maybe it's a trick question because, uh, as some of you know, uh, our friends, uh, Dr. Packer from Dallas and Dr. McMurray from Glasgow published an article on how to implement the four pillars. So they, they did make a suggestion of starting SGLT2 and beta blockers first, followed by uh, Arnie and MRA. Uh, I respect their uh, suggestion, but it, really, I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I happen to believe that we should not take six months to a year to get a patient on optimized therapy. We should be getting it done in one to two months maximum. And if you look at these recent drug trials, the curves separate early. So I think we should feel some sense of urgency. Uh, I think we're going to learn as, as, a, as a community, hopefully, what's going to be the best way to do this as far as sequencing as it's referred to. Thank you. Just as a follow-up to that, uh, do, you do you see a role for digoxin anymore? Another trick question. <laughs> so uh, I, I think digoxin it should be viewed as an innocuous drug. Uh, our colleagues in Europe from many meta-analyses, I think, have raised a lot of concerns. So if you look across the Atlantic, uh, digoxin is not used very much. I think you can go back to the work that was done uh, by Jim Young, perhaps when he was at Baylor Methodist, looking at digoxin and using it for patients uh, for symptom control. So I, I think it does have a role, but now with all the new drugs that are out there, um, 
I think its its use is probably going to become even more limited. Thank you. I think there's another question which. Uh, so there's, yeah, there's another question about algorithm for up titrations, which, which I think you touched on. But but just to kind of go further with this topic, I, I was going to ask. I mean, do you think there's a role to put more of the up titration uh, in the patient's hand? I mean, should we be able? Should we give them a you know, instructions to, you know, start with this and then in two weeks start with this and increase the beta blocker in two weeks uh, and check your own blood pressure or create an app that they can do all these things so that the limitation of, you know, physician scheduling and coming to the clinics is, is less burden on the patient? Well, I'll give you my own personal views on this. And I think that the one of the positive spinoffs of the pandemic has been the proliferation of virtual visits. So if you have a patient that's engaged that can take their own vital signs and maybe even get labs for you periodically, I, I think that virtual visits are an ideal platform for titration. And yes, even going back Probably a decade ago, my colleague, uh, late colleague that many of you know, David Taylor, he would write a prescription and he would say for uh, Carvedilol 6.25 and he would basically tell the patient an auto titration. Uh, 6.25 for a week, take it up to 12 and a half in a week, take it up to 25, blah, blah, blah. Uh, again, if you have any gauge patient that's reliable. I think it opens many more options for you. Uh, I'm sure there are cell phone apps now and will be more to come to try to help patients with this. Uh, in large part, it, it, it relates to the sophistication of the patient to state the obvious. So some of our patients will be much more challenged with getting this done and they may require face-to-face -face frequent visits. Thank you. I guess uh, one uh, last question is, do, do you see, uh, in looking into the future, would, would there be a poly pill for heart failure? Well, you know, that's a favorite of uh, Salim Youssef from, from Canada. And I, I would say the answer is likely yes. Um, will it be in the U.S.? Will it be primarily in other countries of the world? Uh, to be determined. There's a question that just went by on the chat that I'll address very briefly. It said, why are cardiologists reluctant to use SGLT2 inhibitors? My answer is I don't think they are reluctant to use SGLT2 inhibitors. And think of it in the context of Arnie. It had a very, very slow adoption rate. Now we have another new drug uh, you know, we adopt things slowly, and now we're dealing with the drug that was designed or developed to treat diabetes. So it's going to take us a little longer to wrap our arms around it, but I see the use of it, at least in Cleveland, catching on pretty quickly. Dr. Starling, it's been a pleasure to have you. I'm sorry we couldn't have you in person, but uh, we really uh, enjoyed being able to, to learn from you and to, and to visit with you and wish you best of luck with your, uh, with your electricity and your power and uh, hope, uh, hope everything's okay in Cleveland. All right, thank you. And I'll look forward to uh, watching some of the conference the rest of the day. Congratulations to you and the team there for uh, organizing this event. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll uh, move ahead with our next talk here. And uh, the next presenter is one of our colleagues, here, Dr. Fida. So Nadia Fida uh, currently serves as the medical director of heart failure and uh, imaging at one of our uh, sister hospitals in Houston Methodist Baytown Hospital. She completed her residency and heart failure fellowship at uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine and then moved to Houston for her cardiology fellowship and uh, then joined our uh, advanced heart failure and transplant faculty. She has been instrumental in building the heart failure program in our sister hospital and her research interests include cardiac recovery and mechanisms of uh, myocardial injury. 
So she will be talking today about uh, COVID and heart failure. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Heart Failure Summit 2021. I will be talking to you about COVID-19 and heart failure. Objectives of my talk today are introduction and epidemiology, role of cardiac injury and heart failure in COVID-19, pathophysiology and mechanism, prevention of COVID-19 in heart failure, how to evaluate the patients with heart failure and COVID-19, management of heart failure in COVID-19. In late December 2019, an outbreak of viral pneumonia was reported in Wuhan, China. Shown here in this slide is the state-of-the-art review published in JAK uh, last year, where authors have highlighted number of studies and available reports, suggesting an association between cardiovascular risk factors and underlying CV conditions in the COVID-19 cohorts. These reports also include two large population-based data sets, uh, shown here at the bottom panel with several thousand of patients um, with underlying high prevalence of cardiovascular risk factors, uh, cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, coronary artery disease. As we see here uh, in this published uh, data, the increased case fatality rates and ICU admissions were more likely to be in patients with who have a higher comorbidity burden for cardiovascular risk factors than patients who do not. Uh, in the large uh, population data set that we saw earlier um, in the uh, last slide um, with close to 45,000 patients confirmed uh, the prevalence um, of these comorbidities noted cardiovascular disease to be 10.5%, diabetes 7%, hypertension 6%, all notably higher than the overall case fatality rate of 2.3%. Here is depicted increases in cardiac uh, troponin levels indicated of myocardial injury in patients with COVID-19 and is associated with worse outcomes. Here also we see the role of heart failure um, and the prevalence of heart failure uh, in the population uh, data sets that are affected with COVID-19. To understand better the effect of COVID-19 and heart failure, it is important to understand uh, how the virus um, acts and the mechanism of injury associated. Here, as we can see, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, interacts via its spike protein to its functional receptor, which is an angiotensin converting enzyme 2. This viral receptor complex then gains entry into the cell, um, which is a type 2 pneumocyte uh, most commonly affected as the uh, cell of entry. Uh, the endocytosis occur, which then leads to downregulation of the ACE2. This leads to unopposed local activation of the renin angiotensin endosterone system. Um, and leads to more uh, lung injury, um, inflammation, prothrombotic effects, and other end organ injury. This um, mechanism led to earlier preclinical studies which suggested that uh, RAS inhibitors like uh, commonly used drugs in heart failure, for example, lisinopril, enalapril, uh, captopril, losartan, valsartan, et cetera, can increase ACE2 in expression raising concerns regarding their safety in patients with COVID-19. Although the virus has been initially thought to be associated with these respiratory symptoms, it has become rapidly clear uh, that it affects other multiple organs. Abrupt withdrawal, however, of the RAS inhibitors in high-risk patients, including those who have had heart failure and prior MI, for example, may result in clinical instability and adverse health outcomes. Multiple pathways have been suggested to explain myocardial injury and elevated uh, clinical um, uh, response and related clinical scenarios. Older age, male gender, obesity, smoking, and the traditional risk factors of cardiovascular disease and underlying cardiovascular disease and uh, cerebrovascular disease, as we've seen earlier in the presentation, is are very important predisposing factors uh, which relate to underlying severity of the illness caused by COVID-19 um, and outcomes. 
And as we saw, as this uh, virus gains entry into the cell via the ACE2 uh, functional receptor, it leads to unopposed activation of RAS um, angiotensin aldosterone system. More vasoconstriction inflammation ensues, uh, causing uh, pulmonary damage in the beginning, uh, manifesting as acute hypoxic respiratory injury, uh, pneumonia with the virus, and um, in several cases, a superimposed bacterial pneumonia pulmonary edema, which can be due to underlying heart failure, if it, there is a pre-existing heart failure in place, or because of a new onset heart failure, or because of the myocardial injury that ensues, leading to more pulmonary edema. The prothrombotic state of the virus leads to worsening uh, effects and leads to worsening acute respiratory distress syndrome and other order injury. At this stage with the treatment, some patients will recover and some patients will uh, go into a prolonged host inflammatory response, which is manifested by a cytokine storm, depletion of the T lymphocytes, macrophage activation, which we see as uh, the uptrending biomarkers of inflammation, interleukin-6, CRP, ferritin, D-dimers. All this uh, milieu results in um, inflammation and coagulopathy, prothrombotic state, procoagulant state. Uh, these conditions uh, can lead to cardiovascular injury. There is a whole spectrum of how uh, uh, the cardiac disease will either manifest uh, de novo in the setting of the SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 or the underlying exacerbation of the illness. Um, myocarditis can occur either due to direct uh, viral injury or because of the inflammatory response. However, uh, to keep in mind, acute myocarditis, heart failure, and sudden death may occur in patients with no history of prior cardiac disease after COVID-19 infection. Few cases of acute myocardial injury, sometimes with clinical presentation of acute heart failure and fulminant cardiogenic shock are described. A demonstration of acute myocarditis uh, was shown only in very sporadic cases. And, she, and histology findings were mostly of low-grade inflammation with non-specific cells of inflammation present. Acute cardiac injury, on the other hand, manifested as troponin, elevated troponin levels is very prevalent. Acute coronary syndromes can happen either due to type 1 mechanisms or type 2 MIs uh, from thrombotic state, cor uh, coronary embolism, uh, oxygen uh, supply and demand mismatch. In several patients uh, that manifest uh, either the existing uh, decompensated uh, state of heart failure or new onset heart failure, their uh, BNP and anti-pro BNP levels uh, can be very high even later on in the disease. It is important to keep in mind as the inflammatory milieu predisposes the patients uh, to arrhythmia, the COVID-19 drugs um, can prolong uh, QT intervals the notorious being hydroxychloroquine, um, azithromycin, which is commonly used to treat or prevent superimposed bacterial infections. Many of these drugs that are used to treat COVID-19 interact with the cardiovascular medications um, and can lead to further exacerbation of proarrhythmic uh, potential of these uh, drugs. For example, Beta blockers um, uh, and calcium channel blockers can interact with lopinavir, uh, ritinavir, uh, causing disturbances in QT intervals. Uh, so does digoxin, evabradin. Uh, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, as we, as we have talked a little bit uh, earlier on, and we will touch base upon later in the presentation, can, um, um, should, can be continued earlier on in the disease but if the patients are going into end organ in, um, uh, injury, especially the kidney injury may need to be withdrawn, uh, especially uh, with uh, rising creatinine and potassium levels. Therefore, it is extremely important as we have learned uh, from these that the preventive measures are taken um, uh, to ensure uh, that uh, heart failure patients are protected. When it comes to how to evaluate the patients uh, uh, with heart failure and COVID-19 concomitantly present, it is extremely important that a thorough history and physical examination has taken place. For example, patients who have had underlying cardiovascular disease would raise the flags that these are the patients who, will who can have worsening of the COVID-19 illness 
and poor outcomes. COVID-19 exposure will determine if the patient has a higher risk of acquiring COVID-19 uh, or testing positive for COVID-19 when the test results haven't come back yet. Chest pain, fever, upper or low respiratory tract infection symptoms, anosmia, loss of taste, and fatigue are all symptoms of uh, COVID-19 infection. Though keep in mind that fever is not a very sensitive sign of COVID-19 illness and is not present in all the patients. Uh, if the patients are disproportionately dysnic, has an elevated uh, jugular venous uh, pressure, have RALS, have edema, still can, signs can be confusing with COVID-19 as it is a pulmonary disease. Also because um, and, uh, the heart failure can exacerbate uh, underlying pulmonary edema and congestion of the lungs. But, but a thoroughly obtained history and physical examination can help uh, differentiate the two diseases um, if they're not concomitantly present. Um, tachycardia, of course. Uh, the EKG abnormalities are very prevalent in this population. 17% have arrhythmias, 75% have abnormal EKG, and about 13% or so of, of them will have prolonged QT intervals. Uh, the lymphocyte count, uh, the, the deteriorating lymphocyte count and depleting lymphocyte count is associated uh, with increased mortality in these patients. Uh, BNP is elevated in many patients with COVID-19 and heart failure. Uh, however, a low level of BNP has a very high uh, negative predictive value of excluding cardiac dysfunction. Uh, as we um, as, uh, have elucidated earlier, 20% or so of hospitalized patients will have high troponin level, um, elucidating myocardial injury and have uh, poor outcomes. Markers of inflammation and thrombogenicity, uh, for example, C-reactive protein, um, this uh, sedimentation rate, ferritin, LDH, interleukin-6, fibrinogen, D-dimers are all important in understanding how severe the illness is they will usually become more severe in patients who are becoming ill uh, and who survived um, uh, of the illness versus uh, patients who um, did not uh, survive, had very high markers of inflammation. Procalcitonin uh, should be measured um, in all the patients um, and uh, is an uh, important uh, marker of when uh, superinfection is suspected. When it comes to imaging, it can be very helpful. Of course, um, uh, chest imaging with chest X-ray and um, uh, CD um, imaging for the chest to elucidate uh, the damage to the lungs. Uh, echocardiography and uh, cardiac CD and cardiac MRI have their roles uh, in patients who have heart failure and COVID-19. Uh, th uh, Transthoracic echocardiogram uh, can tell us, of course, uh, about the biventricular function wall motion abnormalities that these patients may have, but very importantly, it gives us an indication of non-invasive uh, filling pressures um, when we are trying uh, to determine, um, 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 to adjust the medications uh, like diuretics and heart failure medications, and clinical exam may be limited because of concomitant lung involvement. Strain analysis on the transthoracic echocardiograms can lead us uh, to um, detect systolic dysfunction ahead of time. Uh, cardiac MRI is very helpful in elucidating tissue edema and helping uh, in prognostication. If the patients uh, present with uh, chest pain and acute coronary syndrome, elevated uh, biomarkers of injury like troponin and serial um, measurements that are uh, higher, uh, or a myocarditis-like picture, Angiogram must be done uh, to, uh, to rule out coronary artery disease. Invasive hemodynamics may be needed in the patients who are worsening um, uh, and uh, requiring more inotropic or vasopressor support. We may need to do right heart catheterization to elucidate the mechanism. Uh, entomyocardial biopsies are indicated in patients uh, who have presented with uh, myocarditis and intense shock or um, high degree AV block and ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, though, as we mentioned earlier, uh, it may um, not always show the picture and the only picture we may get is of uh, small inflammation uh, or inflammatory cells. 
Uh, this uh, review, um, uh, this study published by Ziske and Lichter et al. in circulation last year, uh, studied systematically echocardiography in patients uh, with COVID-19 and how uh, cardiovascular disease benefits and its spectrum. Uh, they showed that, that the RV dilatation and dysfunction was the most common abnormality found on echocardiograms, uh, close to 39% of the patients. And if the patients came back with the disease um, or worsening, their RV functioning was worsening as well. Only 32% of patients in that cohort had normal echocardiograms. Uh, LVEF was associated not only with clinical deterioration, but with also with mortality uh, uh, if the low LV, uh, if the systolic dysfunction is proven and the LVEF is lower. This is a case um, uh, of a very young um, a man uh, with no prior medical history of heart disease prior to his COVID-19 infection. Uh, he noted uh, palpitations for which a holder monitor was placed that showed 26% PVC burden. Uh, MRI done uh, five weeks post-infection still shows, as you can see depicted by the red arrows here in the inferior and the lateral walls, uh, myocardial edema. Um, and damage uh, to the myocardium, which could be predictive of myocarditis or thrombotic myocardial injury. Here, uh, I'm showing you again uh, the uh, case of a very young woman with no prior cardiac history who presented with um, STEMI, and uh, we can see ST elevations in the lateral leads here and the AVR concerning for left main disease. And indeed, there is a thrombotic uh, subacute occlusion of the left main here. Uh, this patient was uh, recovering from COVID-19 uh, that she acquired two weeks ago and recuperating at home. Now let's talk about uh, patient management. Uh, whenever we encounter a patient with heart failure and COVID-19, it is extremely important to assess their clinical status. Whether this is a patient with underlying heart failure and is presenting with COVID-19, or <clears throat> there is a high suspicion of a de novo heart failure in the patient uh, with no pre-existing disease. Um, it, volume status must be clinically examined uh, and how the patient's perfusion is uh, should be examined. If the patient is compensated on clinical exam or appear dry, then the fluids can be administered to treat their infection. Um, diuretics can help in small doses to decongest the lungs uh, that uh, we know from the mechanism of injury because of the inflammation, lungs become very congested in bed. It can help with improving the oxygen requirements. Uh, if the patient is in decompensated state, then of course diuretics uh, to decongest and anotropes and uh, vasodilators as needed uh, to support uh, the cardiovascular system. Um, as uh, we go by doing this, patients with underlying heart failure, uh, we should uh, adjust their um, medications, uh, for example, um, that targets the RAS axis. As we saw, that is the primary axis that the um, virus is acting upon by a ACE2 receptor. If the patients are already on ACE inhibitors, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, MRAs, et cetera, and they are compensated, these medications can be safely continued, depending, of, of course, upon the blood pressure and the fluid status and the kidneys of a function of the patient. Uh, these uh, medications uh, may need to be withdrawn uh, if the patient has kidney injury or hyperkalemia or worsening clinical status. As we talked about, we have to pay close attention to other medications like beta blockers, dishoxin, evabridin, et cetera, that can um, interact with COVID-19 drugs um, and uh, uh, can increase the prorhythmic potential. At the same time, it is extremely important to have a multidisciplinary care uh, of these patients um, in, in COVID-19. The infectious disease specialists and pulmonary doctors, intensivists, pharmacy are all crucial uh, team members uh, in helping supporting these patients uh, and will determine COVID-19 treatment plans um, uh, FDA approved versus in trials, uh, antiplatelet regimen, anticoagulation regimen. Uh, as we all know, this, these patients are very predisposed to prothrombotic and procoagulant states. If the patients are clinically worsening uh, and the sh uh, shock is ensuing uh, with a high vasopressor of his uh, inotropes requirement, or if uh, the pulmonary support cannot be maintained, for example, 
that we are not able to maintain oxygen saturation 94% and above with non-invasive ventilation, proning and mechanical ventilation is needed. And still, uh, ARDS is persistent and severe. We may need to move forward with uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. If it is only pulmonary support needed, then VV ECMO is of uh, choice um, as determined uh, by their uh, clinical risk and the benefit ratio. If the patients are requiring high doses of vasopressors, then we may need VA ECMO. It is important to discuss, of course, a very controversial topic as we have touched upon it before, ongoing um, effect of ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Um, because of uh, SARS-CoV-2 interaction with ACE2 as a functional receptor. brace corona trial uh, was the only randomized uh, trial in this population that has really helped us um, uh, with the understanding. Uh, eligible patients were randomized uh, to temporary suspension of their baseline ACE on an R versus continued use of these medications. Hence, in conclusion, among patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19 infection, and receiving chronic ACE and ARB inhibitors, suspending ACE and ARB uh, um, is not beneficial uh, or versus continuing them. It does not improve their days alive and out of the hospital. Hence, patient management, to summarize, all patients uh, with heart failure should be eligible to receive vaccination. Patients with heart failure are at very high risk of major complications. Heart failure may predispose in turn again to pulmonary complications in COVID-19. Uh, GDMT, that is uh, guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure should be continued when possible. Um, and it may need to be withdrawn in severe illness and um, uh, of COVID-19 when kidney injury is ensuing. We as clinicians should be very aware of the drug-to-drug -drug interactions between the COVID-19 drugs and the cardiovascular drugs. COVID-19 directly and indirectly increases the risk of cardiovascular complications. Multidisciplinary decision-making is required for patients in shock, needing MCS, for example, intraiotic balloon pumps in Pellar ECMO. Uh, less that patients with COVID-19 need close monitoring of INR, given COVID-19-associated coagulopathy and um, interaction of some of the medications, especially uh, uh, lupinavir, ritonavir combination with warfarin. Heart transplant patients with COVID-19 need adjustment of their immunosuppression and monitoring for hematological abnormalities in addition uh, to close follow-up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia, for this uh, uh, fascinating overview, uh, especially of these really difficult patients. Uh, one question I had was, um, you know, we have a lot of patients who are on either dual antiplatelet therapy or, or NOAX, uh, and then, you know, they get COVID and it's always a little challenging in terms of how to manage them with their um, you know, known coagulopathy and, and with, with COVID. Any insight into that? Uh, you're muted. Okay, I, I guess we are not able to uh, get her answer, but... Uh, yeah, she uh, typed it in the chat box, as just said, and, and not for... Oh, um, I, th I think she's just... There's another... Meanwhile, while we're working on the audio, there's a question in the chat box. Do we think SGLT2 inhibitors will be beneficial in patients in COVID positive patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. I think we don't know, there's not any data with SGL2T inhibitors specifically in COVID positive patients. We know it is beneficial in heart failure, reduced ejection fraction patients in general, probably wouldn't start it if they're acutely COVID positive, but uh, would probably start it um, once they recover. Uh, Dr. Fida, do we have you back on audio? No, okay. No. Okay. Uh, okay. But, but uh, Barry, just as a continuation, there is a trial that uh, is looking at SGLT2 and COVID out of uh, uh, Kansas. So I think uh, we might, we'll know the answer to that question once the trial's complete. 
And there's another question, what is the gap in the literature for heart failure in COVID-19? Uh, well, there's um, tremendous gaps. Uh, we've, there's been thousands of studies in COVID, which you know, just, just recognized over, a little over a year ago, and there's been an, an incredible amount of data in the field, but despite of that, you know, it's only been a year. Um, there's only, you know, we're, there's still so much that we're learning. So there's a tremendous gap in terms of, um, you know, the question of myocarditis and how prevalent that is in patients with COVID, uh, what the primary cause of cardiomyopathy is in these patients, um, what the best way to treat them um, in, in, outside of their GDMT in terms of uh, specific <coughs> therapies tailored towards COVID that have been researched. There's so, um, there's more gaps than knowledge, I would say. Um, I don't know if you agree with that. But I don't know, I completely agree. Yeah, yeah, that I think there's so many, uh, you know, uh, I guess unanswered questions. And the other thing we still don't know is the long-term effects, right? Because uh, we do know that uh, COVID affects uh, the endothelium and uh, at least with MISC in, in kids, we know that they, you know, they have, they form these coronary artery um, uh, aneurysms, but uh, we still don't know what it does to the microcirculation in, in, in the heart. So I think the, the long-term sequelae is still unknown and I think um, uh, yeah. that needs to be studied. And I see, I see Dr. Fida's answer, since she's not able to get audio, she's answering in the chat box uh, the first question um, regarding antiplatelet and, and anticoagulation. You can see her answer in the, ch in the chat box. In general, she says antiplatelet, such as aspirin, are used for thrombotic complications. Lovenox for prophylaxis and IV heparin in patients with troponin elevation. If the patients are not coagulopathic, then their baseline anticoagulation should be continued. So um, with that, uh, well, first, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fida, for that, that great presentation. Sorry for the audio disconnect, but uh, we really appreciated your overview of COVID. Uh, we will move on to the next speaker, who, um, again, will be 20 minutes, followed by Q&A. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our own Dr. Paul Sherman. Dr. Paul Sherman is a clinical electrophysiologist here at Methodist. He is the director of our EKG lab, and he is an assistant professor of, of, uh, of medicine. Dr. Sherman did his uh, medical school training in, in the Universidad Central in Venezuela and went to Albert Einstein for his residency and was here in town for, at Baylor College of Medicine for his fellowship in cardiology. Uh, and Dr. Sherman will be talking about the treatment of heart failure beyond CRT from an electrophysiology perspective. Thank you, Dr. Sherman, for joining us. Good morning, everyone, and thank you again for joining us here at the Houston Heart Failure Summit. My name um, is Ju Kim. I'm one of the heart failure morning, I, cardiologists here. And my job uh, today is to I think we have the, wrong the current state of temporary mechanical support, circulatory support devices. I have no disclosures related to this talk, and my objectives are clear. It's to review the available temporary mechanical circulatory support devices. I will touch on their indications and contraindications, the hemodynamic effects of these, and I'll try to conclude with a case-based example of how we Hello. Uh, can you guys hear me and see my screen? Yes, you're good, Dr. Sherman. Yes. Um, okay, so basically, um, um, thank you for the invitation for this amazing heart summit. Thank you for Dr. Guha, Drakenberg, and excellent panelists. Uh, we're here to talk about heart failure beyond CRT and is to give you a little bit of spark of how we can electrically change the dynamics into the heart failure. I have nothing to disclose. And first of all, starting with the recent data we have come up with the heart failure patient, in, the increased interest in rhythm control and the impact that atrial fibrillation with RVR could potentially get into a patient with already compromised with a cardiac output. And we have an understanding that the, the, the better outcomes are being more aggressive and more aggressive with rhythm control. One of those topics is the tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy that it could be on pulse, the underlying cardiomyopathy, or be the single etiology of the heart failure. And this is usually described in, in 1962 when Whipple did it in an animal model where he rapidly produced contraction of the ventricle for sustained periods. And then he demonstrated that the heart was significantly compromised after the in, induction of the tachycardia. And it's 
also too important to elucidate that the, it's a rate dependent. The faster you are, the more likely you're going to get the tachycardia or the cardiomyopathy. So high ventricular rates usually tend to produce dilation, mitral irritation, elevated feeling pressure, decreased contractility, thinning of the wall, and eventually uh, disinclination of the neurohormonal cascade again. If you see here on the right side panel, uh, this is a patient probably with AFib. We did a catheter ablation, rhythm control, and you can see how the left atrium shrank after achieving a good rhythm control and the LV also decreasing the, in dimension once the rhythm control. So this is the, the hallmark of this cardiomyopathy is the reversal etiology of this if it's addressed and control, okay? So it's usually a diagnosis that is confirmed after the restoration of the normal structure of the heart or improving significant of the symptoms, okay? The treatment... It's definitely the rhythm. You can do it with antiarrhythmic drugs or you can do it with catheter ablations, cardioversions. It's, it has many ways or many times you have to use it, uh, multiple uh, combinations like antiarrhythmic with catheter ablation plus cardioversions. As long as you can control the rhythm, which is the ultimate what you like, and also hopefully reverse the cardiomyopathy. And once you control the rhythm, it is possible to cure that cardiomyopathy. Okay, here you see on chest x-ray on the left side, somebody with tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy, we control the rhythm, and now the chest x-ray a year later. How about the, what we expect the recovery? So it has been described in a day or two, um, you will see some normalization of the LV function. It also depends for how long the tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy has been and how advanced has also been in the, in the stage. Um, there still could be a residual contractile dysfunction that could take about a month in some animal models that have been studied. But in a month, all hemodynamic variables should return to normal. Okay. Another important topic is the presence of PVC. Once that we have controlled the rhythm, it's very important to consider this extra feet, especially from the from the bottom of the heart. These PVCs they they can effectively compromise the cardiac output or induce cardiomyopathy like tachycardia does. So you may not be in tachycardic, but you may have cardiomyopathy due to an extra beat. So suppression of these beats are extremely important, especially in compromised patients with cardiomyopathy. I have this, um, this risk score for you guys when you see somebody in the clinic and you say, well, how likely does this patient could develop cardiomyopathy in the setting of a PVC? And we have developed the ABC BT criteria widely used very similar to what we use in chas score but basically um, we look at the burden, which is very important. If the burden is more than 20%, you have a highly likelihood if you're between the 10 and 20 intermediate, and if it's less than 10, then it's a low. If it has a superior axis, meaning from the bottom of the heart, the BBC is coming from the bottom of the heart, it's usually a worse contraction that is coming from the top. And the coupling interval, the longer the coupling interval, the worse. And also if you have non-sustained VT episode, it's even more worse prognosis, okay? So this is an idea to qualify your patient when you see him with cardiomyopathy, the PVCs that you might encounter, how likely does this gonna affect the, the, the heart? And this is an important concept I wanna show. Um, once you ablate them and you suppress the PVC, you might encounter what we call reverse remodeling pretty close to like the, what we do with uh, CRT therapies, that once that we have eliminated the PVCs, the heart starts to resynchronize itself and produce an, um, more and more efficient um, remodeling. And that in the long term tends to be successful in 80, 83% of the patient who has been successfully ablated the PVC. Within, a, within four months after a successful ablation, okay, um, you may experience recovery of the LV function, but in cases it can take more than a year, this process. So this is more, more slow process of recovery than what we see with tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. The PVC induced cardiomyopathy tends to have a more um, slow recovery compared to our rhythm control strategy. So another important topic about this is that we may have to evaluate uh, these PVCs in the context of structural heart disease. They can sometimes be at risk for sudden cardiac death. 
And the coupling interval tends to play an important role, especially the patient with prolonged QT, like this case, you start having PVCs, that makes it a significant more challenging and eye-opening to the situation. It's not the same to have a, a PVC in a normal structural heart with a normal QT that somebody with structural heart disease with a prolonged QT, and now you have the PVC. So we have to put that in context. So here's an idea why this happens. As you guys know, we have the phase zero, the phase one, the phase two, but the most vulnerable zone for another impact electrical is phase three and phase four. When you deploy an electrical system, phase three, phase four, you might induce torsades the point. Now talking about premature beats and impulses, this is a new device that is trying to improve uh, the outcomes in patients with heart failure. It's not that CRT, but it's the same principle. We're thinking about delivering an impulse of a higher output in the myocardium at the level of the QRS. If I show you how those, this works, so it's called the optimizer. Basically you pace at the end of the QRS to make sure that you have give a significant amount of energy to depolarize completely the whole heart in a higher, higher energy. You give a biphase six, usually about 20 milliseconds, a 7.5 volt to have an idea like, like seven times the normal pacing that we do. And we usually, we never did it on the T-wave. This has to be right, right on on the QRS because we want to stay again out of the vulnerable area. So what is this has shown in animal models? Well, it has shown that we have a major release of calcium inside the cells, and also we have a major reuptake of the calcium. So the release and reuptake of calcium inside the cell, it becomes appears to be more efficient in an animal model. Here in the bottom, you can see in a patient uh, that we did um, heart failure and somebody without heart failure, you can see the probands of the of the fosfolobin, which is an uh, important uh, protein in the in the SR, which recaptures the calcium, right? And as you can see, once that we apply the therapy with these uh, optimizers, you can see that the the receptors of those are coming back to normal. As you can see in heart failure, where they decrease, and now they're coming back to normal. This is very important because. This is kind of the onset of the signal of diastolic heart failure. If we can take all the calcium out as fast as we can, this could be a very promising uh, therapy for diastolic heart failure patient, which as we probably know, it's, it tends to be uh, the less study of all. So what about what it does this is, is uh, besides the release of the calcium, also they have proven that there is a change in the genes that they tend to be down-regulated and up-regulated in heart failure. Here's is a change. This is some evidence of improvement on the New York Heart Class Associations. Okay, as you can see, there is a more trend if you have the optimizer that if you don't, if you're in optimal medical therapy. And this is a comparison of the improvement in function capacity compared to CRT. As you can see, the changes in the PVO2 in the, in the six-minute walk in the New York Heart Association and in the questionnaires. So it's a it's an upcoming therapy. Um, it's not available in all centers yet. Um, still a lot of breakthrough through, through, through this. And this is an idea if we decide to implant somebody. Imagine you implant this device and some other person with device, it will do therapy for one hour and then he will wait for four hours to start therapy again. So in a day, you apply five sessions of about an hour. The patient will recharge the device. This device are highly rechargeable and the longevity is expected to be 15 year, more than 15 years. So about every three weeks, the patient will recharge the battery. The patient population that has been studied is different uh, slightly different from the CRT. Here is a good diagram you guys can see is the usual the current FDA recommendation is for people who have uh, ejection fraction from 25 to 45, and they can have wide or narrow QRS. However, if you have less than 35 uh, EF and your QRS is wide, CRT should be the predominant. But for that group of population that is above 35 to 45, it's a wide QRS, you can consider the optimizer. Or if you have a narrow QRS and you're between 25 and 45. Another important gadget that is uh, comparable um, to CRT is the, 
uh, phrenic nerve stimulation for central sleep apnea. This is another, another device that could be used in patients with heart failure is the majority of patients with heart failure have central sleep apnea. And these patients, they tend to have hypopnea episodes. This is a sleep study. And what you can see the apnea episodes here, when you have the chain stokes and the rapid loud noise happening at the chain stoke associated with the hypoxic episode on the bottom. And as you guys can see that if you're doing beta blockers and you're using ACE inhibitors to try to do this, you do a neurohormonal at night, he's just spiking um, epinephrine and adrenergic responses for this. So uh, the, the outcome tends to be worse, right? So yes, yeah, so this is an important problem in patients with centra, with heart failure. 75 or 80% the patient have AFib or heart failure. And that's why we screen it in the, in the, aggressively in our, our heart failure group also, trying to screen for those patients with central sleep apnea and treat the central sleep apnea, you know? Um, if I tell you the outcomes usually, here's what we're talking about, the increase in pathetic drive. You already, with heart failure, you have that increasing pathetic nervous system. And then on top of that, you put the central sleep apnea, even more sympathetic activation will be uh, responsible. So here's to elucidate that, that the heart, this patient with central sleep apnea tend to have more readmission. Here in the, in the, in the left side of the column, you can see the majority of them, they don't have a cent a sleeping disorder. But once you start having central sleep apnea, now the readmissions, the majority of the readmissions, they tend to have a central sleep apnea disorders. So perhaps this could be one of the mechanisms that decompensate patients already on a stable medical treatment. So it's very important to screen for this and try to adjust it. This is again, proving that the patient with worse outcome are the patient with central sleep apnea more than the patient with obstructive. And definitely if you don't have any sleep disorder, your outcome tends to be more beneficial. This is this is mortality. Um, so how does this work? Well, it's very similar to the prior device that we go. It's a similar, that looks like a pacemaker, but in case these, the leads are not going inside the heart. One goes to the ossicus vein and the other guys goes to the pericardiophrenic vein. So once you deploy there, you, you start, instead of capturing the heart, like a pacemaker does, this will pace the phrenic and it will move the diaphragm in a more simultaneous way. Here I have a patient with a heart failure with EF of 45, the first patient that we did is our, our department Houston Methodist here, and it was the first in Texas that actually we did. The patient has central sleep apnea on CPAP. You can see that he still has the apneic episode and the hypoxic event. So the, the CPAP did not, not modify the central sleep pop. You know, so we brought him for a central sleep stimulator. As you can see now, we have entrained the diaphragm and we're moving all the ventilation without producing the apneic episode and the hypoxemic episode. So I would say we have achieved, with the heart failure perspective, a more complete neurohormonal control on top of the medical therapy. And the patient feels better, they sleep better, they feel more refreshed. So you also have a good quality. Here's a zoom of this, how it works. As you can see, these, these black uh, spikes in the bottom are usually the, the stimulator which makes a physiologic contraction of the diaphragm. And then you make a contraction of the diaphragm with a movement of air that is interesting because this is negative pressure. CPAP put positive pressure into patients with heart failure. And people with right heart failure, we know how devastating could be elevated pressures. This is an idea how therapy, we can in one patient put therapy on and therapy off. As you can see, once the therapy is on, no more apneic episode. Once we turn off the therapy, we start having more apnea. This is the study that they decide. It was an idea to decrease the, the uh, hypoxia ignis from more than 50%. That was the intention to treat. And this is the study. It was 73 compared to 78. Um, most of them, they had heart failure with um, a device already 40% of them and an ejection fraction about 40%. And 60% of them, they had um, heart failure. The central sleep apnea ignis was high, moderate to severe, 30 to 26. This is not recommended to mild central sleep apnea. So you see a market uh, decrease compared to the control um, in all parts, central sleep apneas and percentage of REM and quality of sleep. So we see a marked improve of primary secondary endpoint on the pivotal trial. And the success rate was very similar to a, 
of a pacemaker with a 97% success rate, a 3% lead revision. So that's what kind of you expect to have from a pacemaker, no death out of 70 and no serious event events, okay? Um, these are the outcomes um, on function and sleeping scale. We see an improvement compared to the control. Um, here you can see a market improvement, the majority and mild improvement in the minority and willingness to repeat the procedure 96%. So in conclusion, I will say that we really need to screen sleep apnea more aggressive in the heart failure population and treat it. Uh, this is a high risk patient population that they tend to have heart failure readmission and a poor prognosis. Tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy and rhythm control is a very important etiology and we have to always have it present on our mind. And it doesn't mean that the patient will only have tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. He could already have another type of cardiomyopathy and the atrial fibrillation is just a worsening etiology. PVC is an important component with something that we can reverse in our patients. If we can restratify them, see them who are the high risk, who are the low risk, and, and apply appropriate therapy with antiarrhythmic drugs or catheter ablation to suppress it. And also uh, upcoming technology that seems to be promising is the utilization of this optimized device, which is facing on the QRS, which could be an alternative, tr alternative treatment for heart failure patients that they do not qualify for CRT. And with that, I finish. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sherman, for that. Uh, you know, those are great topics that we don't really, uh, you know, talk about enough or, or a lot. And uh, I think they're very important things that uh, we need to consider when we're taking care of heart failure patients. I, I did have a question about the, uh, the PVC cardiomyopathy. So, so uh, two, two questions. One, I, I didn't, the, the V was for sustained ventricular tachycardia or that was... Yeah, okay. the BT is the ABC BT, and mm -hmm. BT is for ventricular tachycardia. So how does that score, I mean, was it tested compared to just looking at, you know, for us, just to remember simply the percentage of PVCs, um, does it outscore looking at versus 15 or 20 percent PVCs? Yes, it has been uh, compared with a control. Uh, it was published in, a, it was a cohort study where we were retrospectively <laughs> looking at these two, like the way they generate CHASVAS score. And it was validated in multiple um, registries, actually, also. So it's, I think it's the, the, the most important to me, I'm trying to pull it back, is that it's very easy to apply in a patient because the, the, everybody loves Shasta score because it's the easiest score to, to use. And this is actually a, a pretty simplistic access burden, coupling interval, and VT. So... If, you are, if your score goes between 9 to 12, it will be considered high, putting all these together. Each of them, um, axis will be one point, burden will be three, and coupling will be four and four. So if you are above nine, I think it's a patient that is high risk for induced cardiomyopathy. You should really consider suppressing it. Great talk, uh, uh, Paul. I guess we're getting a question. Uh, is, uh, um, can you develop cardiomyopathy with sinus tachycardia? Very good question. Um, in appropriate sinus tachycardia, it's, um, it's a disease or a condition that could be very poorly tolerated. Um, if your heart rate is always tachycardic, it is possible um, to develop. However, we don't see it that often. We see it more with atrial tachycardias than with sinus tachycardia. Because with the sinus tachycardia and in difference with atrial tachycardias, you are, when you go to sleep, your sinus node is going to be suppressed. You're going to, your sinus node is not going to be as fast as during the day. So you are slowing the heart rate. And like we talk about, this is a rate, res rate responder tachycardia, meaning the faster you go, the more likely you go. So first of all, sinus tachycardia doesn't go as fast as an atrial tachycardia. It still will follow a, phys a physiologic mechanism, okay? And when you go to sleep, even if you have sinus tachycardia, you still will go be suppressed by the parasympathetic tone and the and the the vagal tones that go during the sleep. So it's less likely than an atrial tachycardia. There are extreme forms of inappropriate sinus tachycardia. Most of them, I would say, they do not develop cardiomyopathy. But there are extreme forms of inappropriate tachycardia that I will explain to develop some, some cardiomyopathy, especially if they're super fast during the day. Thank you. 
So just uh, one quick question is uh, this, uh, the central sleep apnea uh, treatment with phrenic uh, nerve stimulation, is that studied only in HEF-REF or is that, uh, was that studied in HEF-BEF as well? Ash, very good question. Uh, this trial was not designed for heart failure. This trial was enroll patient with heart failure, but majority of them, like I show you, it was for for reduced ejection fraction. So 60% of the patient had heart failure, and the average it was 40%. So I would I, I would say that the majority seems to have a, re, a reduced ejection fraction. But it will be very interesting to look at in, in diastolic. And I don't know if the incidence of chain strokes um, is more predominant in, in reduce than, than preserve. But that, I, don't, I don't know the answer of that. No, I, I mean, I, at least we do see quite a few of diastolics have it too. Now, in diastolics, probably it's going to be a combination since a lot of them are uh, you know, obesity, uh, obese as well. So I think, yeah, it's something that uh, hopefully in the future we can study. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sherman, for that great talk. We'll let you go back to clinic and, and curing uh, heart failure or treating heart failure um, with EP. Thanks so much. And, Thank you, uh, guys. Appreciate your being here. Well, we'll uh, move on to our next talk. And our next speaker is our own Dr. Ju Kim. Dr. Ju Kim is a, a heart failure transplant cardiologist. He came to us from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University where he did his heart failure training, but prior to that, he finished his internal medicine and general cardiology um, training at uh, George Washington University Hospital in, in DC. Uh, Dr. Kim is also our associate director of our CCU and has uh, uh, research and clinical interest in cardiogenic shock and mechanical circulatory support. And he will be talking today about the current state of temporary mechanical circulatory support. Dr. Kim, thank you very much. And you can take Good stage. morning, everyone. And thank you again for joining us here at the Houston Heart Failure Summit. My name is Ju Kim. I'm one of the heart failure transplant cardiologists here. And my job uh, today is to review the current state of temporary mechanical support, circulatory support devices. I have no disclosures related to this talk and my objectives are clear. It's to review the available temporary mechanical circulatory support devices. I will touch on their indications and contraindications, the hemodynamic effects of these, and I'll try to conclude with a case-based example of how we use these devices in real, real life. Today, I'm gonna to focus mostly on the percutaneous options that support the left ventricle. And these are the four uh, devices that I'll be reviewing. So let's start with the first device, which is the intraortic balloon pump. This is a uh, tried and true and probably the, the oldest device that we have. Um, it is a balloon that is mounted on a catheter. And this balloon, uh, as, as you see on the cartoon, uh, fills with helium gas to inflate and deflate throughout the cardiac cycle. There are two markers on the balloon pump, as you see there, the distal marker and a proximal marker. These are radio opaque and can be identified on the chest X-ray. There are also uh, two lumens in here. One is the, the gas lumen to fill the balloon and the other is the arterial lumen. Its uh, indications include things like cardiogenic shock or acute coronary syndrome and refractory angina, as well as uh, procedural support. Some contraindications specific to the balloon pump include severe aortic, aortic insufficiency, as well as peripheral vascular disease that may preclude its or increase the complications with its insertion for um, uh, in vascular insertion. The intraortic balloon pump uh, works by inflating with the onset of diastole. And on this graph, it's depicted uh, by the arrow next to the letter A there um, at the dichrotic notch on the aortic tracing. And with the balloon inflation, there's diastolic augmentations depicted by letter D. And as diastole ends and systole, and systole is, is uh, starting, the balloon is deflate, deflated. The net combination or the net effect of this is that the diastolic augmentation it leads to increased coronary perfusion. And the deflation uh, at the onset of systole 
leads to a decrease in, in afterload, decreases in cardi uh, cardiac work and the uh, myocardial oxygen demand and consumption, and also leads to a modest improvement in cardiac output. How does this translate on the pressure volume relationship? Well, the top panel labeled A shows the aortic tracing or the pressure tracings. And in the, the red, where it says off, the ventricular um, the, and sort of the aortic pre, uh, pressures without any uh, balloon pump support. And that's depicted in the pressure volume relationship in, in B and in, in outlined in red. But once the balloon pump support is turned on, you see that the balloon starts inflating at the onset of diastole or at the dichrotic notch, and there is good diastolic augmentation. And this leads to a leftward shift of the pressure volume loop. It leads to reductions in systolic pressures and, and increases in stroke volume. The next one is the impella. This is now a microaxial continuous flow uh, transvalvular pump that is placed across the aortic valve and it, uh, expels aspirated blood directly from the left ventricle into the ascending aorta. This leads to a direct unloading of the left ventricle, leads to decreases in diastolic wall stress and wedge pressure, and also increases coronary perfusion pressure. Indications for this also include high-risk PCI or cardiogenic shock. Contraindications specific to this device also include the presence of uh, a me mechanical aortic valve, since it does require placement across the valve, Critical severe aortic stenosis with valve areas less than 0.6 uh, centimeters squared. Um, because of its transfemoral nature for the devices that I'll show you in detail in the next slide, uh, peripheral arterial disease can be a contraindication. Um, right heart failure, the presence of ASD or VSD, and moderate to severe aortic insufficiency all can be contraindications for this device. The Impella comes in many different uh, flavors, if you will. Um, the first generation was the Impella 2.5 depicted on the the top left hand of the screen uh, that was capable of delivering two and a half liters of flow. The next came um, the Impella CP, which is uh, to the right of that, uh, providing about not, uh, four liters of uh, per minute of flow. And the device to the right of that was the Impella 5.0, providing about five liters of flow. And then to the um, the rightmost the one outlined in blue is the newest device, which is the Impella 5.5, which is capable of providing uh, flows up to six liters uh, per minute, um, but the maximum flow is about 5.5 liters per minute. Now, the remaining device then in the middle that I included just to show is the Impella RP, or the right ventricular uh, Impella. Now, the Impella um, is designed as a, as a pump that has an inflow, uh, which is located in the ventricle and an outflow area, which is located in the aorta. Therefore, it directly unloads and decreases the end diastolic volume and pressure and increases the aortic pressure and the flow. This leads to decreases in the oxygen demand and myocardial oxygen supply, increases in its supply, and also increases the cardiac output, cardiac power output as well. The impact of the impella unloading on a um, pressure volume relationship is depicted here, uh, outlined in solid black, is uh, the pressure volume relationship of a, um, a myopathic heart with an elevated and diastolic volume and a small stroke volume. But with an impella, um, there is a leftward and downward shift in the pressure volume uh, relationship, um, which depicts its direct unloading of the left ventricle, but also assumes this triangular shape as the isovolumic contraction and relaxation phases are blunted. Um, with direct unloading with a continuous flow device. The third device we'll discuss is the tandem heart, and this is a, a percutaneously placed uh, centrifugal ventricular assist device. And <clears throat> this device is um, placed uh, via the, uh, a peripheral approach with a drainage catheter that is placed uh, through the femoral vein in this, in this cartoon um, into the right atrium and, and using a transeptal puncture the drainage is placed in the left atrium. The return after the blood is uh, um, uh, drained from the left atrium, uh, it is returned into the femoral artery in this case with the descending aorta. Now, because of the direct unloading for the left atrium, it uh, is, is able to provide high cardiac output and, and, and will reduce the end diastolic uh, pressure or volume in the left ventricle. Indications for this device also similar, but contraindications specific to this 
include the presence of a left atrial thrombus, and since it is directly unloading um, from the left atrium, the presence of a severe peripheral arterial disease, right heart failure, uh, ventricular septal defect, and, and inability to tolerate any systemic anticoagulation as it is an extracorporeal pump. Now, the impact of the tandem part on the pressure volume relationship is depicted here. And the, the tracing outlined in blue is the, the baseline, but with um, increasing uh, amount of support through the tandem at 1.53 or 4.5 liters per minute of flow, you can see that there are reductions in the end, end diastolic pressure with increasing flow. There are also increases in the end systolic volume um, and decreases in the LV stroke volume. Finally, the ECMO. ECMO is essentially portable cardiopulmonary bypass, and there, it comes in two flavors, the veno, veno, veno venous or VV ECMO, which provides predominantly pulmonary support, versus veno arterial or VA ECMO, which provides the both heart and uh, lung support, or complete cardiopulmonary bypass. The indications for VA ECMO in this case for um, I'm talking about uh, cardiogenic support um, are, can be lengthy, but contraindications I think are important to note here. And essentially it has to do with the fact that an ECMO really is a, a bridge. And regardless of the indications depicted on the left side of the screen with shock or acute, due to acute MI or acute on chronic heart failure um, or uh, right ventricular heart failure or, or postcardiotomy shock, the use of VA ECMO really is a bridge to get to your destination, whether it's to transplantation, recovery, or some other form of durable mechanical support, um, or some decisions such as potentially withdrawal of care in, in, in the worst case scenario. The hemodynamic impact of VA ECMO is, is depicted on the VV, PV loop. Again, the baseline is depicted in green, but as you can see with increases in increasing level of ECMO support, there is a rightward shift of the pressure volume loop. There are actually increases in the end diastolic pressure due to the increased afterload as depicted in the, um, uh, uh, in the various lines um, going from the end systolic pressure um, uh, volume relationship or the end systolic pressure um, to the volume intercept at the uh, end diastolic volume. And it also re uh, leads to reduced stroke volume. Now, because of this impact of taking already a uh, myopathic ventricle um, and increasing the end diastolic uh, pressure and decreasing the stroke volume, um, one strategy is to unload the ventricle or quote unquote vent the left ventricle using a device such as an impella catheter. And the uh, maladaptive or, or potentially um, harmful um, hemodynamic effects of VA ECMO um, can be mitigated by using this uh, quote unquote ECPELA approach, which is a combination of VA ECMO with uh, LV unloading using an impella catheter. And I'll try to finish and wrap up with a brief case. This is a case of a 65 year old man with a long standing non ischemic cardiomyopathy, which an ejection fraction less than 20%, also has a history of an LV thrombus that is on anticoagulation. Was initially admitted with cardiogenic shock and his hemodynamics are uh, depicted there, but his uh, wedge pressure was elevated and his cardiac index was low. He was admitted and initially su supported with inotropes and diuretics. However, throughout his early part of the hospital course, um, he began to have frequent uh, PVCs. Uh, despite inotropic support, he began to develop lactic, lactic acidosis and showed signs of uh, end organ dysfunction, such as renal failure. Therefore, uh, throughout his hospital course, the uh, ephemeral balloon pump uh, had to be placed um, urgently. This led the patient to, to be bed bound. Um, and it did result in some improvement in his, in his hemodynamics. However, over the next few days, um, he was not able to tolerate any weaning attempts off the intraortic balloon pump. So one of the approaches that we have adopted here is that we uh, place these uh, intraortic balloon pumps that are traditionally placed through a femoral approach in the axillary artery. And by um, um, using uh, ultrasound and, and at times uh, fluoroscopic uh, roadmaps, we're able to place uh, an arterial sheath in the axillary position. 
And by placing the balloon pump through that axillary artery, the patient is able to not only sit up, but also stand up and ambulate. This does require close monitoring and the chest X-ray on the top of half of the screen shows the, the sheath depicted in yellow and an arrow uh, that may be difficult to see, but there is a marker between those sternal wires uh, that depicts that distal marker, I'm sorry, the proximal marker of the intrared balloon pump. Now the, the three panels on the bottom of the screen show um, uh, what could possibly uh, go wrong in this scenario where in panel A, the two uh, proximal and distal markers of the balloon pump are shown, are seen on the same uh, image, which shows that the aortic, uh, the interior balloon pump is folded in the ascending aorta. Um, similar concept with B, where the two markers are seen um, in the same uh, uh, film, and you can see the outline of the balloon pump that is now folded in the ascending aorta uh, at the arch. And in C, it uh, shows the distal tip of the uh, um, intraortic balloon pump engaged in one of the abdominal branches off of the main aorta. However, uh, early studies uh, from our center showed that this approach uh, was not only feasible, um, but uh, was successful in, in bridging folks to end organ intervention, such as heart transplantation. And an updated uh, uh, publication from our group in 2020 showed that the majority of patients bridged with an intraortic balloon pump uh, were able to successfully undergo either heart transplantation or LVAD implantation. Uh, going on with our case, despite axillary balloon pump and in dual anotropic support, the patient experienced a worsening end organ function with persistent lactic acidosis. Therefore, on hospital day 60, this particular patient underwent an axillary approach in Pella 5.5 insertion. This not only allowed him to ambulate, um, but also led to increases in end organ function and we were able to wean off the second inotropic support and keep him stable. And three days later, he was able to successfully undergo heart transplantation. So in summary, many percutaneous options exist for a temporary mechanical circulatory support, each with its own indications, contraindications, strengths, and shortcomings. And really careful evaluation of the patient's hemodynamic needs, as well as his device's hemodynamic impact or abilities is really imperative in order to maximize the risk benefit ratio when introducing mechanical circulatory support for the patient. Thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Kim. It was a great overview and a, and a great um, segue to our, to our breakout sessions that we'll have in a little bit. Really appreciate that. Um, one question that's coming in uh, through the, the question box is, you know, who are, is a candidate for an axillary support device and why not just put everyone on an axillary support device? Right, so one of the benefits of axillary approach, <clears throat> as uh, we tried to show in the, the presentation, is that it allows for ambulation. Um, but at the same time, the, the vascular risks are, are you know, not minimal. Uh, with, a, with a groin balloon, um, it, the, the risk is bed bound and you know not able to get folks to to walk and and ensure that you know frailty doesn't really you know complicate their candidacy for some sort of uh, a destination therapy but the axillary approach also involves a small axillary artery that could potentially compromise the uh, vascular distribution of the of the arm and the uh, the place where we insert the sheath um, is very close to the brachial plexus and um, there is a risk of uh, nerve injury there. So it's, uh, it's kind of a risk benefit analysis for, for those patients that uh, would require long-term uh, balloon pump support. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ju. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, these different levels of support um, of Impella and especially for medium to uh, long-term waiting as they wait for something more durable, or uh, whether it's uh, recovery or um, end organ intervention? So I think each of the different Impella devices with the amount of support that they're able to deliver has their own role. Um, for example, you know, our bias in the heart failure population and folks coming with acute on chronic heart failure, the Impella CP, which can deliver up to about four liters of support, may still be insufficient. And so if it is that we're working towards an end organ replacement, whether it's an LVAD or 
or heart transplantation, um, you know, the bias may be to use uh, the more powerful devices that, uh, again, have to take into account the risk of an axillary cut down and a, and a graft to be sewn on. However, on the other end of the spectrum, if it's a, you know, complicated or high-risk PCI patient coming in um, that needs very temporary several hours or, or an hour or two of support um, to ensure coronary perfusion and a blood pressure while a, uh, you know, a left main or a very high risk lesion is being worked on by the interventional cardiologist. An impellent CP temporarily placed in the groin may be just sufficient enough. So I think each of the uh, d different devices has their strengths oh, and uh, a role in management of, uh, of shock and, uh, and different indications. So, Ju, we have a couple questions coming in. Um, the first one is, is there a place for temporary mechanical support in very high-risk coronary interventions in patients with heart failure but not in cardiogenic shock or in an acute phase of myocardial infarction, i.e. assistance before a shock during the high-risk procedure? Um, so, very good question, and I think that's um, <clears throat> an evolving field in a way, and, and there's a lot of work being done uh, spearheaded by, um, you know, Dr. Kapoor and the, and the folks up at Tufts who are looking at this very question of whether you know, perhaps unloading the ventricle prior to a PCI in the cases of acute myocardial infarction shock or even in the setting of an acute uh, MI would prove beneficial. I don't think the jury is out yet and the data is not yet uh, available or, or been even uh, scrutinized and that's the case. Um, but, uh, you know, I think in, in the, the, those patients that come in with acute chronic, I mean, acute heart failure, um, secondary to an acute MI, I think it's certainly reasonable to use temporary mechanical support devices early if there is any indication that that patient may be going into shock. I think one of the messages that we're trying to get out here with management of cardiogenic shock in general is the importance of early diagnosis and um, early institution of, of uh, hemodynamic and support, whether it's a mechanical device or inotropic support. So I think ultimately early diagnosis uh, and you know, early institution of mechanical support may be the answer. And I think early hemodynamic monitoring also will be really important to help figure out who would benefit from, from mechanical support or not as well. There's another question. And there's one more question from the, from the uh, audience. With an axillary balloon pump placement, are there significant differences in patient monitoring or additional possible complications compared to femoral insertion? Uh, yes. So with an axillary approach, again, um, <clears throat> and so when I make rounds on folks that we have axillary balloon pumps in, for example, uh, we look at their chest x-rays to make sure that the markers are in the correct position um, for a number of reasons. One, the because you know the patients are more ambulatory, uh, the balloon pump uh, may be more at risk of uh, displacement. So if it displaces too proximally or gets withdrawn almost out of the body, um, there can be restriction alarms on the balloon pump, and the other bigger risk is that the balloon uh, may get displaced into the ascending aorta, uh, which would, uh, would, again, put the patient at a significant risk of things like even stroke. Um, again, the brachial plexus uh, overlying the area or near the area of the sheath insertion um, you know, warrants us to make sure that uh, motor insensation and, and any kind of nerve injury uh, is not present, and versus a femoral balloon pump where the patients are largely stationary and the balloon is less likely to be uh, uh, displaced. Um, and again, with an axillary approach coming from the top, uh, we also want to make sure that that tip does not engage in one of the more distal vessels or branches off of the abdominal aorta, uh, which could potentially cause mesenteric ischemia. So those are all uh, issues that we need to be monitored. Uh, on folks with axillary support. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kim. Really appreciate uh, your being here and that great, great uh, segue. So now we are six seconds away from, from being perfectly on time. We are, it's 10.15. We um, now are going to take a 15-minute break. We have time 
um, for you guys to stretch your legs and please visit our, our virtual exhibits. And we'll be back at 10.30 with our breakout sessions. And um, these will be, you know, you'll all get to choose uh, several sessions and they'll be available for Q&A at the end of each recorded video session. Uh, that you should already have received instructions on how to join the breakout sessions. If you do have any questions, please um, type a question in the chat box and we'll see you guys in 15 minutes.
Okay, can you hear me? Hello,
Hello. Hello, everyone. If you are still not in a breakout, please look at the screen and uh, gives you the instructions for breakout room selection. And if you have any uh, questions, please uh, text in the chat button and we'll be able to help you. Hello everyone, if you're still not able, if you've not logged into a breakout room and uh, uh, if you're having trouble, please look at the instructions which are being shown on the screen right now and it will, uh, it has a stepwise um, uh, instruction in, in terms of how to select a breakout room and if you're still having problems, please chat, you know, type in the chat window and we can help you. Again, if you have not been able to uh, get into a breakout room, on the bottom right hand corner, there is a breakout room icon. You need to press on that icon and you will be able to enter a breakout room. If you do not see the breakout icon, most likely you're not on the Zoom app and you're using the website. You have to download the Zoom app to be able to access breakout rooms. So please download the Zoom app so that you can enter into the breakout rooms.
Hello again. If you're having trouble uh, getting to a breakout room, uh, most likely you're using a web-based version and you need to download the Zoom app. And if once you download the Zoom app, on the bottom right-hand corner, you're going to find an icon which says breakout rooms. And once you click on it, you will be able to select a breakout room that you, you could go to. Thank you. All right, let's let All right, just to go over this again, if you're having trouble with getting into a breakout room, you're most likely using a web-based version of Zoom or a browser-based version of Zoom, you need to download the app. And once you download the app on the bottom right-hand corner, you're going to find an icon called Breakout Rooms. And by selecting it, you will be able to go to the breakout room that you want to go to. Please let us know if you're having trouble with that.
Hello everyone, again if you're having trouble getting into a breakout room and you are on your phone, there is an icon in the top left corner uh, and if you are on your computer it's in the bottom right corner. So if you can press that icon, uh, uh, says breakout room, you'll be able to select which one you want to go to. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. I just wanted to um, let everyone know we are wrapping up the breakout sessions. I understand several of you had some issues. I want to assure you that we will have the videos available online for you to access. Um, Ms. Medina, you may want to turn off your camera. Also, um, if you have any questions, please let us know. We'll do our best to address them individually. Um, but we do want to let you know that any um, videos you may have missed, we will have them available online for you. Thank you again for your patience. Yeah, welcome back everyone. Uh, I know that some of you are having trouble uh, seeing the slides well on Zoom. If that's the case, uh, please look at the screen now and it gives you the live stream website. Um, so you can tune in, tune in on livestream.com and search Debakey CV Education. Uh, or you could go to the website listed below HTTPS um, livestream.com slash debakey uh, events and 9498395. Uh, uh, however, you will need to remain connected to Zoom to receive CME credits. So you can put C you know, Zoom on mute and then play the live stream so that you're able to see the, uh, the slides better. Again, uh, we are also working on getting you the slides. Um, by email so you you should be able to access the slides and uh, i apologize if some of you are not were not able to go into uh, all the breakout sessions these breakout videos will be emailed to you as well or the link to the videos will be emailed to you as well uh, so that you can watch um, the ones that you are not able to see uh, um, at, at your, your own convenience so with this, we'll go ahead and go to the next part of our uh, uh, 
of our day here. Uh, and um, the next talk is uh, on heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And um, actually, one of our colleagues, Dr. Uh, Imad Hussain, uh, was uh, um, supposed to talk about this, but uh, due to family emergencies, he's not able to. So uh, I'm happy to give this talk. So we'll start off with the case here. and. Uh, uh, we have a 65-year-old patient who, uh, who's female and has uh, a progressive shortness of breath and uh, some occasional chest pain for the last one and a half years. He's had a history of heart failure hospitalization and has a history of hypertension, diabetes, uh, chronic kidney disease, and some AFib. Uh, she's been asymptomatic from an uh, AFib perspective. She doesn't know when she goes into AFib, so we don't know the duration. And on exam, she has uh, some signs of heart failure with elevated JVD and minimal edema and has normal blood pressure. Uh, and her NT pro BNP is elevated and so is her creatinine with a normal hemoglobin. And these are her medications. She's on Coumadin for stroke prevention due to AFib. And she's on lisinopril, metoprolol, and a statin and glipicide for her uh, diabetes. And her EKG is other than um, AFib and uh, right bundle branch block, uh, you know, pretty insignificant. And this is her echocardiogram, which shows uh, a markedly dilated RV with markedly dilated right atrium as well, with a small LV and uh, an enlarged left atrium, but it is smaller compared to the right atrium. Uh, and the EF is 55%. And again, like I said, the left atrial volume index is uh, enlarged. And uh, the E to E prime, which is a measure of the left-sided filling pressure, is elevated to 32. And uh, so is her uh, RV systolic pressure, which is elevated at 34. And her TAPC, which is a measure of RV function, is decreased at 40 millimeters. Normal is greater than 20 millimeters. And she, for her unexplained dyspnea, undergoes a cardiopulmonary exercise test, which again shows a limited peak VO2 at 10.8 uh, uh, and uh, with a peak heart rate of 153 and a decreased peak systolic blood pressure at 102. She undergoes a coronary angiogram, uh, which uh, uh, I think I skipped through here. It's pretty unremarkable. She has some small vessel disease, but uh, uh, no epicardial disease. And this was her right heart cath, again, suggesting that she has uh, elevated wedge pressure with a mean PA pressure of 50, normal being 25, and uh, incre you know, increased transpulmonary gradient, and an increased PVR of 6.92. And she also underwent a nitric oxide challenge, which uh, uh, predictably, you know, uh, increase the wedge pressure. Uh, so these the these are the hemodynamic waveforms, and as you can see here uh, on your left, that was the baseline wedge pressure. And once they got the nitric oxide, you can see a big V wave here on the wedge tracing, going all the way up to 60 millimeters, uh, uh, which uh, again uh, suggests that there is a, a component of a stiff left atrium. So now, uh, you know, th this is a patient who is classic uh, half-deaf patient. So now let's sort of switch into uh, the, the definition and talk about, you know, pathophysiology and uh, um, the presentation and also some treatment op options for these patients with half -pef. So just to sort of start off, this is the Framingham heart failure definition. It does not differentiate patients from with, who have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or reduced ejection fraction. But again, these are the ma major criteria and these are the minor criteria, which encompasses the uh, signs and symptoms of heart failure, which are mostly dyspnea, dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, PND. And uh, on the uh, physical exam has uh, S3 and ankle edema, volume overload. And um, uh, you know, you have to meet uh, one of the major criteria, two of the minor criteria to have a diagnosis of uh, uh, heart failure. 
And uh, for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, it has been a challenging diagnosis to define because if you go through, these are all the trials which have happened in HEFPEF and each of them seem to have a different definition for HEFPEF. But what is really unifying here is that everybody kind of agrees that their uh, ejection fraction has to be greater than or equal to you know 50. Um, so, uh, you know, how common is HEF, you know, HEFPEF kind of compared to HEFREF? And as you can see here, it is now currently the, the most common form of heart failure um, uh, in, in, in our society. And in terms of the characteristics of these patients, they have a lot of non-cardiac comorbidities. They have renal dysfunction, they have anemia, they have obesity, COPD, sleep apnea, uh, uh, and other uh, autoimmune condition and uh, average of at least four comorbid conditions. And when you look at uh, the differences between those patients with reduced and preserved LVEF, one thing which stands out really is the reduced uh, pre predominance of coronary disease in the preserved EF and the greater incidence of, of AFib uh, in these patients. And again, to reiterate the fact that almost two-third of the patients with HEFPEF at some point either have or will develop AFib, and development or presence of AFib is definitely associated with worsening exercise capacity and mortality. In terms of the pathophysiology, you know, um, HEFPEF um, um, starts off with a lot of the comorbidities. So having hypertension, diabetes, obesity, all of these lead to a pro-inflammatory and a pro-fibrotic state, which then causes systemic endothelial dysfunction, leading to a decreased nitric oxide and resultant effect on the cardiomyocytes and also on the extracellular matrix leading to more collagen deposition and increased activation of fibroblasts and uh, leading to resultant stiffness in the left ventricle and in the left atrium and eventually causing secondary pulmonary hypertension and um, uh, AFib and uh, right ventricular dysfunction as you saw in, this, uh, in the patient that we looked at. Again, this slide pretty much you know, uh, summarizes all the things we talked about where there is increased ECM, increased you know, cardiomyocyte stiffness, uh, and ventricular vascular uncoupling, and increased vascular stiffness, uh, leading to a syndrome of uh, HEFPEF. Again, in terms of looking at prevalence for, of HEFPEF, uh, you know, uh, in, in hospitalized patients, the percentage of HEFPEF is almost you know, 55%. And, uh, Again, as you can see here, when you looked at you know, the patients in the 1980s to now, the prevalence of HEFPEF is, is increasing. You know, just to sort of reiterate what Dr. Starling said this morning, you know, does it even matter uh, whether you have HEFPEF or HEFREF? Because once you have a hospital admission and you have a clinical syndrome of heart failure, uh, then whether you have HEFREF or HEFPEF, your mortality is not very good, especially when you're looking at five-year survival. So although in clinical trial population, outcomes are better with HEFPEF, this also you know, goes on to saying whether, uh, like Dr. Starling was talking about this morning, whether you know, we are taking a large population of patients and when you actually phenotype them better and when you, uh, can, you, know, when you group smaller clusters, probably their outcomes would be more reflective of the real world practice. So when you have a patient who have unexplained dyspnea, then you have to assess, you know, uh, there are multiple reasons for an unexplained dyspnea. You have to assess how much uh, of their uh, shortness of breath is due to HEFPEF and whether HEFPEF is even playing a role here. So there are a couple of scores which have been developed um, uh, to understand the pretest probability of having HEFPEF. One uh, is more of a clinical score with uh, 
just look, uh, and the other one um, mostly is echo and biomarker driven score. Uh, and one is H2, H2F uh, PEF and the other one is HFA PEF F score. And uh, based on all of these, whether you're you know, obese, hypertension, uh, AFib, presence of pulmonary hypertension, old age and filling pressure in one. And the, the next one is based on all the morphologic characteristics, which is you know, enlarged left atrium um, uh, and uh, increased thickness of the LV, and uh, the, 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 the tissue Doppler velocities on the uh, lateral and the um, medial LV walls, um, you, you assign different points and then you can uh, um, kind of come to a, a pre-test probability for having uh, diastolic dysfunction. So this is again reiterating what we just talked about. So. Um, once you, uh, you calculate the score, and if you have a low pretest probability, then you don't uh, um, uh, necessarily have to do any further testing. But if you have intermediate to high, especially the, the ones who have intermediate, you could potentially do a diastolic stress test, which is echo-based. And we'll talk a little bit about it in the, in the next slide. But if you have a high pretest prob probability, the, uh, uh, with overtly uh, elevated filling pressures with other signs of diastolic dysfunction, then you've already made uh, um, a diagnosis of FF. So in terms of doing the stress test, so we do a stress echo and uh, exercise the patient, uh, you know, either using a treadmill or a supine uh, bike. Um, and. Uh, we uh, either can use a modifies, modified Bruce protocol or a Norton protocol, uh, depending on the age and other comorbidities of patients. And then, uh, uh, you know, then you, at maximal exercise, you echo the patients really looking for elevated filling pressures on echo and also presence of pulmonary hypertension. And uh, if you meet those two criteria, then you can make a diagnosis of HFF. Again, this is just showing, uh, you know, how uh, in these patients, if you look at E to E prime, you know, at rest, it's only 10, and it goes up to 19. And the TR velocity increases here in the last, uh, last box from 2.6 to 3.5 meters per second, meeting criteria for exercise-induced HFPEF. Again, <clears throat> Uh, you know, we should uh, not miss these other causes, which uh, uh, again would present to you like HFPEF, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you know, constrictive pericarditis, uh, infiltrative or restrictive cardiomyopathy, which is the most common cause of clinical HFPEF that we see, uh, especially advanced HFPEF. So these these have to be kept in mind. Um, uh, and one caveat here is that if you have somebody who has an LVH on echo with wall thickness greater than 15, it's almost never due to uh, hypertension unless patients have ESRD. But even in them, you should have a very, very low suspicion or low index of suspicion for infiltrative cardiomyopathy. And in this day where we do have certain non-invasive measures of uh, picking up amyloid, they should be pursued before labeling them as just, you know, uh, I guess a garden variety HFPEF. Uh, in terms of, you know, uh, other, like the causes of uh, clinical syndrome of HFPEF, like I said, the other causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy, like, um, or infiltrative cardiomyopathy, such as uh, cardiac amyloidosis, cardiac sarcoidosis, all of them need to be, you know, ruled out. And then you can make a diagnosis of HFPEF, which, um, again, you will have to rule out all of these before you can make that cause. Now, in terms of switching gears here to sort of talking about treatment, unfortunately, there have been multiple, multiple clinical trials looking at um, different medications in HFPEF. And uh, this one was, uh, all of these were looking at essentially RAS inhibition, we're starting with uh, uh, ARBs, and this is ACE inhibitors, and there's also another ARB, and this was for, uh, TopCat was looking at aldactone. And really, in all of these studies, 
there were they were not a very significant um, differences in in uh, um, heart failure hospitalizations or with survival um, and again if you look at these other newer studies which have looked at beta blockers and uh, sildenafil and isosorbide mononitrate and INDI, which is a recent trial which got published looking at inorganic nitrates, and PANASH, which looks at a, a, uh, looked at an adenosine uh, agonist. All of these uh, trials were essentially negative trials. So the only trial which has been so far shown to have a benefit uh, with uh, heart failure hospitalizations and uh, um, it, though it was for a combined heart uh, combined endpoint, really the benefit was with heart failure hospitalization and improvement in functional class. That is the Paragon HF trial. Again, this was talked about by Dr. S uh, Starling in the morning, uh, and uh, this led to the FDA approving Entresto for a, uh, like a heart failure indication. Uh, currently, Entresto is approved for chronic heart failure. It does not differentiate based on EF, which means this now should be one of the uh, therapies that we consider in patients with HFPAF. Uh, again, this is uh, some of the uh, you know uh, um, secondary endpoints. Like I said, the NYHF function class improved uh, with an odds ratio of 1.4. And all the uh, other pa uh, other um, measures of functional class, such as KCCQ questionnaire, and uh, all of these, uh, you know, improved um, with uh, um, uh, with Entresto. Uh, however, the all-cause mortality was not significantly, you know, different. Again, the mid-range EF that Dr. Uh, Starling talked about this morning. Again, suggesting that with uh, Paragon there is a benefit in, the, in, this, uh, in these patients. So uh, essentially this is the only treatment that we have right now which has been, which has shown in a clinical trial setting to impact uh, mortality uh, in these patients. So our best bet for these patients is really to prevent the development of HFPEF. As we talked about, all of these patients have a lot of comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, sleep apnea. So if all of these can be addressed, you know, much more quickly, then it can prevent the development of HFPEF. And all of these are, you know, really sort of uh, uh, level one uh, recommendations from, from the guidelines. Now, uh, one thing to mention here is another intervention which has been shown to help in uh, patients with HFPEF is the presence of ambulatory hemodynamic peer pressure monitoring. So this is a, a cardiomems device which did show that in these patients with HFPEF, the it decreased hospitalization uh, and uh, improved their functional class. Again, uh, no randomized trial data to support a mortality benefit in these patients, but uh, again, definitely decreases hospitalizations, and we use it in quite a few of our patients, and we are able to keep them out of the hospital with this. Now, you know, one of the questions we have to ask is why are all these trials being negative? I think part of the problem here has been that we have taken a uh, uh, an approach where we put multiple phenotypes of patients in one big basket and gave them all the same medications, which is why probably these these uh, trials did not you know work as well as we would have wanted to, or these medications did not work. So I think there is a lot more uh, interest and evidence now, in fact, in looking at different phenotypes, and these are some of the phenotypes which have been uh, you know proposed. Um, and based on the on the pressures, the comorbidities, and and different presentations, and hopefully the future trials will include different treatment options for different phenotypes, so that um, 
uh, you know, the, the clinical trials can be more successful and even though they are in smaller groups, the extent of benefit would be uh, much more uh, in these smaller cohorts as long as they are targeted therapies. So uh, again, to sort of put everything together here, you know, when you're looking at these patients with HEF, uh, HEFPEF, as you can see by the colors, they all have different phenotypes and we have to identify these patients based on their comorbidities, their cardiac and pulmonary vascular function, their hemodynamics and, you know, and their biomarkers and group them into appropriate phenotypes so that we can target them better. So uh, in conclusion, HEFPEF represents half or now pretty much more than half of the entire heart failure burden. And it's characterized by uh, you know, increasing age and increasing number of comorbidities. And it is really maybe a consequence of chronic systemic inflammatory state uh, driven by underlying comorbidities more than a disease of the heart uh, uh, you know, itself to begin with. And uh, mortality, at least right now, is on par with HEFREF. But the prediction is, as we are getting better with therapies with HEFREF, the mortality of HEFPEF is probably going to be much higher than patients with HEFREF. And uh, neurohormonal modulation, other than uh, ARNI, has really not proved to be beneficial. And uh, rhythm control, uh, again, be, being out of AFib uh, will help some symptoms. But um, uh, I think we just need newer therapies in these smaller populations to be studied so that we can come up with some effective therapies for HEPF. This, I'd uh, like to end my uh, talk. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into our Heart Failure Summit uh, today, and happy to take any questions. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Guha, for, for pinch hitting with that talk, and it was very expertly done. And I, you know, I'm, I'm really glad you emphasized the different phenotypes, and you know, particularly amyloid is something that, that I'm very interested in. And so there, you know, the data recently has shown that uh, if you biopsy patients so from Hopkins, they biopsied 108 patients with with HEFPEF, and, and they took all comers and did an endomyocardial biopsy, and they found 14% of them had, had cardiac amyloid. Uh, and this has been consistent with other trials of, of HEFPEF. There's about, you know, 15 to 20% that may be um, really amyloid, and those patients don't respond, even if they have a reduced ejection fraction, they don't respond to typical medications that we treat for, with patients with heart failure. Reduced ejection fraction, so these studies like, you know, the spironolactone and and in Tresto that are just narrowly missing that p-value, I think a lot of people are wondering if you were to exclude, you know, the, the amyloid patients, would those really, uh, you know, meet the, the p-value and be statistically significant? So it's very, um, you know, I think we're learning a lot about amyloid and that there's a lot more of it out there than we realize and, and there's e easier techniques uh, to diagnose it other than just having to biopsy everyone. So I don't know, any thoughts on that? No, well said, Barry. Yeah. I think uh, you're spot on because I think that's uh, a concern with uh, uh, all of the earlier studies that a lot of these patients, especially the ones with TTR amyloid, because the age group is so, uh, you know, um, advanced and those with wild type TTR probably were in this, uh, you know, in the trial as, as, as have PEF and uh, we probably you know, you are not going to get that benefit. And that's why I think phenotyping uh, better with uh, all of the, uh, uh, you know, available modalities, whether it's biomarkers uh, uh, or other imaging techniques is very important for us to do better trials in HEFPEF. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's a fascinating area and hopefully as we get more sophisticated with phenotyping that we'll see um, more therapies available for the HEFPEF population because it's been pretty bleak, uh, you know, 30 years of trials for, for the HEFPEF population. So I think um, we have, uh, we're ready to have a quick break um, and we will be back at uh, 1215 with Dr. Youssef site. Uh, uh, talking about cardiorenal syndrome. Please, in the meantime, um, grab a sandwich and, and look at the virtual exhibits while you do so. And uh, we apologize for some of the technical difficulties. And again, we will send out all the videos from all the breakouts um, to you guys uh, to make it available to everyone. 
So thank you, and we will uh, be back shortly at uh, 12.15.
Welcome back. Um, just a reminder, if anyone uh, is having trouble with the clarity of the slides on Zoom to, uh, to look at live stream, and this is the, uh, the, the link right here that you can see. Um, so we are delighted to be back and to introduce my colleague, Dr. Ryan Yousafzai, who is uh, going to be talking to us about cardiorenal syndrome. Dr. Yousafzai completed his medical school at University of Illinois in Chicago and his residency at the Cleveland Clinic Hospital and his fellowships in cardiology and heart failure at Aurora St. Luke's and UCSD, respectively. Dr. Youssef Sai is uh, Assistant Professor of Medicine, and he is the Medical Director of our Heart Failure Unit and of the Adult Congenital Transplant Program. Um, and I uh, look forward to Dr. Youssef Sai's talk, and as always, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Hello, and uh, welcome to Heart Failure um, Summit. Uh, topic that we have been discussing today is um, cardiorenal uh, syndrome. I'm Ryan Youssef Zai, one of the advanced heart failure uh, cardiologists at Houston Methodist. What is the definition of uh, cardiorenal syndrome? The definition of the cardiorenal syndrome has been involved over years. In 2004, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute defined a heart uh, cardiorenal syndrome as interaction between the kidneys and other circulatory compartment that increased circulatory volume, which exacerbate the symptom of heart failure. In 2008, they have the, uh, defined the two major groups uh, based on primary organ involvement, is cardiorenal versus uh, renal cardiac syndrome. Later on, that has been more refined in the five groups, depends on the disease acuity, sequential organ involvement. The five groups are uh, defined under type one to type five cardiorenal syndrome. Type 1 cardiorenal syndrome is an acute uh, cardiorenal syndrome. These are a patient with a heart failure, which result in an acute kidney injury. For example, somebody presented with the acute MI with a cardiogenic shock or acute heart failure exacerbation, which cause acute kidney injury. Type 2 uh, cardiorenal uh, syndrome is a chronic cardiorenal syndrome. These are a patient who have a chronic heart failure and resulting in them chronic kidney disease. Type uh, 3 uh, cardiorenal syndrome is the acute renal cardiac syndrome. These are a patient with an acute kidney injury, which resulting in acute heart failure. For example, somebody with an acute uh, heart uh, kidney injury, which causing a volume overload and causing heart failure by inflammatory surge and metabolic uh, disturbance and uremia. Type 4 cardiorenal syndrome is the chronic renal cardiac syndrome, meaning these are a patient with a chronic kidney disease who do have uh, significant risk factor for heart failure and develop heart failure by LVH, coronary artery disease, and etc. Type 5 cardiorenal syndrome is a secondary cardiorenal syndrome. These are a systemic process which is resulting in the heart failure and acute kidney injury. For example, amyloidosis, sepsis, or cirrhosis. We will talk a little bit more in detail of these uh, different types. What is why it's important? The burden of uh, cardiorenal syndrome is significant. There's a significant increase of the mortality in the patient with a heart failure who also have reduced ejection fracture, reduced uh, GFR. There's a 15% increase in the mortality for every 10 milliliter per minute reduction in the eGFR. And the patient with the renal disease have increased risk of atherosclerotic disease and heart failure. As a matter of that fact, cardiovascular disease is responsible for 50% of the death in the patient with the chronic kidney disease. If you look, you look at the different studies that they have looked at the uh, combined outcome of dead rehospitalization and dialysis as the kidney function getting worse and the stages of the kidney disease are getting worse, there's a significant worsening of outcome as well. The prevalence of the moderate to severe kidney disease is in 30 to 60% of the patient with a heart failure. And 30% of the patient who are undergoing treatment for heart failure develop an increase in serum creatinine. The pathophysiology of cardiorenal syndrome, it's very complex. And it is, I will think, uh, think about it as a, a two-way street, meaning uh, injury to the heart can affect the kidney and injury to kidney can affect the heart. There are different pathways uh, which uh, that are involved. One of them is angiotensin, um, aldosterone uh, receptor system, uh, uh, RAS. The other ones is, is an inflammatory 
uh, markers and inc increasing the cytokine, which causing the uh, water uh, retention, the hemodynamic effect by decreasing the cardiac output, decreasing the perfusion, and increasing the venous pressure, which can affect the kidney, the natriuretic uh, pathway, the BNP and AMP uh, have a deleterious effect on the kidney function. And finally, the system, the sympathetic nervous uh, system by uh, uh, parasympathetic and uh, sympathetic effect can cause peripheral vasoconstriction and mm -hmm. affect the uh, kidney and heart as well. So the, the, the neurohormonal or the RAS activation cause uh, non-osmotic release of an antidiuretic hormone, uh, for example, arginine vasopressin, and cause free water retention, uh, reduce renal uh, perfusion. The low flow state by itself is partly uh, is a cause and mainly is a elevated uh, central um, venous pressure, which causes renal venous hypertension, increase renal resistance, and pair renal perfusion. As a matter of that fact, most of the studies they have uh, they have done right atrial pressure was the only hemodynamic parameter associated with the renal failure. The right ventricular failure, which we see a lot of uh, patient either from uh, RCA infarct or pulmonary hypertension, can uh, cause a decrease in the LV filling filling pressure by uh, ventricular interdependence. Paradoxical septal moment, which causing the reduce the LV and diastolic filling pressure. Non hemodynamics effects, uh, as we talked about, sympathetic nervous system activation, chronic inflammation, imbalance in the uh, proportion of the reactive oxygen uh, species and nitric oxide production, inflammatory pathway which, by increasing a TNF alpha, IL7, IL, IL1, IL6, which increases an acute kidney injury have direct cardiodepressing uh, effect and a uremic effect which can have direct cardiomyopathy and significant burden of the LVH with activation of fibroblast growth factor 23. So we'll, we'll go uh, over different type of cardiorenal syndrome and highlight few important concepts in each type. Cardiorenal syndrome type 1, this is rapid worsening of the cardiac function which lead to the acute kidney injury. It develops in 25% of patients hospitalized for acute decompensated heart failure and contributes to acute kidney injury in 60% of all cardiorenal uh, syndrome cases. This is an independent mortality risk for acute decompensated heart failure. In the meta-analysis, looking at the studies, worsening having a renal um, dysfunction in the setting of the acute uh, heart failure exacerbation the uh, outcome and mortality is much higher uh, in all the studies that they have been looked at this concept. The pathophysiology, uh, this is the process of acute uh, heart disease, either due to acute heart failure decompensation, ischemic injury, coronary angio angiography, valvular disease, uh, cardiac surgery, which can affect the, the, uh, the kidney. The pathway could be hemodynamic by decreasing the cardiac output, decreased perfusion, increased venous pressure, or using the medication for treatment of uh, heart disease can have uh, direct toxicity and vasoconstriction effect, which makes the renal function worse. The hormonal factor, like a natriuretic peptide uh, and natriuresis can have a del deleterious effect on the kidney function, and um, inflammatory, mark, uh, inflammatory pathways and uh, increasing the cytokine uh, secretion uh, and the endotelial activation, which can cause renal failure as well. Uh, and this is uh, the outcome is acute renal injury with acute hypoperfusion, reduced oxygen delivery in necrosis, decreased GF EGFR and resistant to ANP and BNP. And as we talked about, this is the two-way street as the worsening of the kidney function can have an effect to the heart as well by vasoconstriction, sympathetic activation, and RAS activation as well. The biomarkers that you use in these patients as a, to a diagnosis, it's important to differentiate uh, acute kidney injury versus acute uh, heart failure. The, bio, uh, the cardiac biomarkers are routinely used, for example, troponin, BNP, galactin-3, and ST2. And there are some novel uh, kidney biomarkers, which not only uh, help us to differentiate acute kidney injury, 
but also can differentiate the location of the kidney injury, which can help us with the management of this patient. The management is uh, depends uh, of uh, if there, there's a diuretics in the patient with a volume overload uh, who needs decongestion, if the patient need a, a cardiac output uh, support, inotropic support, vasodilator for the patient, especially with the uh, hypertension, uh, arginine vasopressin uh, receptor antagonist or tolvaptan, especially with the uh, patient with the hyponatremia, and if the patient need, uh, this patient need more uh, cardiac output and support mechanical circuitry device should be considered in this patient as well. The concept of the aggressive decongestion is very important for this patient. The, if you look at the uh, outcome in this patient who are uh, uh, decongestion uh, de versus not, uh, not decongested, even with the worsening of the renal, uh, renal failure, if you be able to decongest this patient overall in the long term, they do better compared to a patient who uh, the kidney function is not worsened, but they leave them in the congestion uh, state. The, uh, as we talked about uh, previously, one of the, the most important hemodynamic uh, parameters is CVP. In this, this study, as uh, look at look at different type of hemodynamic par um, parameters, CVP, cardiac index, blood pressure, wedge pressure, obviously all the parameters are in the clinical setting are very important and had to, has to be uh, considered and managed appropriately. However, the right atrial pressure or CVP was the only hemodynamic parameter that is clearly associated with the worsening of the renal function. The diuretic strategy, uh, there's a different studies. They have to look at the, how we can decongest this patient, bolus versus continuous infusion, low dose versus high dose strategy. Even though there are some benefit from uh, using um, higher dose, uh, for uh, decongesting this patient faster or changing the creatinine. However, the message is uh, as long as you will be able to decongest this patient, they do much better uh, versus if you leave them in the congest congested uh, state. We're moving on to the uh, cardiorenal syndrome type 2. This is a chronic abnormality in the cardiac function causing progressive chronic kidney disease. Chronic kidney disease is observed in 45 to 63 percent of the chronic heart failure patient, slight increase in the EGFR associated with significant mortality and cardiovascular event, worsening of renal function in the context of heart failures associated with adverse outcome and prolonged hospitalization. The uh, pathophysiology is a patient with a chronic heart failure, which uh, eventually caused a low cardiac output, activation of the RAS and uh, uh, sympathetic nervous system, subclinical inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, which, which causes an increased renal um, vascular resistance and accelerated atherosclerosis. The, the factors uh, for, there are different uh, risk factors involved. Some of them are genetic risk factors, some of them are acquired risk factor, which causing a low cardiac output. And uh, as uh, the heart failure gets worse, uh, the effect on the kidneys gets more pronounced, which uh, 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 okay, these, these effects caused by subclinical inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, accelerated atherosclerosis, chronic hyperperfusion, and the kidneys after the initial in insult uh, and worsening of the heart failure, the function of the kidney gets worse and eventually gets to the CKD as well. Again, talking about the two-way uh, street as the kidney function is getting worse, can have a deleterious effect to the heart by anemia, hypoxemia, RAS, and uh, sympathetic activation, uh, electrolyte uh, disbalance, and direct uh, uremic toxic effect to the heart as well. The diagnosis is usually done by uh, um, measuring of the kidney function, either creatinine, EGFR, urine protein excretion assay, Novel kidney biomarkers, as, been, uh, as we talked about previously, can help us to for the diagnose. Imaging modality is very important. For example, renal ultrasound, reducing and looking at the uh, cortical thickness, uh, cortical medullary ratio, and uh, parenchymal echo density to identify the chronicity of the kidney disease and severity of the kidney disease. And obviously, echocardiogram to understand what type of heart failure are we dealing with. Is this heart failure reduce ejection fracture, preserve ejection fraction, there are valvular disease, there is a restriction 
physiology or pulmonary hypertension as well. Management, if the patient are uh, volume overloaded, diuretics are again uh, really useful this management. Uh, the management is focused on the uh, chronic heart failure therapy, which uh, the mainstream uh, medication that been used, ARNI, angiotensin uh, receptor, necrocerin inhibitor, or Entresto, ACE inhibitor, angiotensin uh, converting enzyme inhibitors, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, and beta blockers. Vasodilators are obviously used in the patient with the hypertension as well. Moving to the uh, uh, cardiorenal syndrome type 3. This is abrupt and primary worsening of the kidney uh, injury which caused acute cardiac dysfunction. So the primary uh, uh, physiology or pathophysiology is acute kidney injury, either interstitial disease, acute tubular necrosis, acute pyelonephrosis, um, acute urinary obstruction, and the outcome is worsening or acute heart uh, dysfunction. And how they it causes depends on the etiology. It either is uh, based on worsening of the hypertension, increasing the afterload, which causes worsening of the heart failure, sympathetic activation, RAS activation, electrolyte, acid base, and uh, coagulation imbalance, air or inflammatory uh, markers, and endothelial activation and cytokine secretion. The outcome is acute decompensated heart failure, uh, ischemic insult, arrhythmia and eventually decrease cardiac output. The treatment is focused on acute uh, kidney injury etiology and management of the um, uh, side effect or, or complication from it, meaning hypertension, managing hyperkalemia, uh, metabolic acidosis. If the patient needs hemodialysis, they need to go on hemodialysis, continuous renal replacement therapy, uh, treatment of the cause of uh, acute kidney injury, avoiding or minimizing nephrotoxin medication and uh, prevent hypoperfusion and volume depletion is very important on these patients. The uh, chronic renal uh, cardiorenal uh, syndrome uh, type 4 is a primary chronic kidney disease uh, patient who develop heart failure. These are the uh, patients who they have a chronic kidney disease and have a, a lot of uh, either acquired or genetic uh, risk factor which cause ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, uh, air or chronic or uh, coronary artery disease, which can cause heart failure. Chronic uh, cardiovascular involvement in patient affect by CKD at any stages. Renal dysfunction as independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Some of the risk factors are chronic inflammation, genetic risk factor, acquired risk factors, primary uh, nephropathy monocyte activation and cytokine release. These leads to endothelial dysfunction, bone remodeling, insulin resistant, and atrogenesis. The pathophysiology, these are the main uh, patient with the chronic kidney disease and uh, depends on this, that, uh, that can affect the uh, heart at any stages. Uh, they're in the stages and one, uh, two, uh, with how these patients have a lot of other risk factor, for example, some of them are acquired, like smoking, obesity, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, chronic infl uh, inflammation. Some of them are genetic risk factor, um, di uh, diabetes. They can all affect uh, a heart, which uh, can cause cardiac remodeling, uh, neurohormonal abnormality, left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, coronary artery disease, and the whole outcome at the end is chronic heart failure. And as the kidney function gets worse, the insult to the heart can get uh, worse as well. And now we are dealing with anemia, direct uremic, uremic toxin, um, chronic inflammation, uh, the uh, electrolyte and acid-base imbalance, and eventually in the CKD stage five and dialysis, there are other organs are involved which can have deleterious effect on the heart. For example, increasing insulin resistance, worsening of diabetes, worsening of uh, microvascular disease or coronary artery disease. They have direct effect on endothelial dysfunction with the uh, vasoconstriction and oxidant stress that can have uh, more effect on the heart as well. And the, the, uh, the final outcome is chronic heart failure. Event, uh, in the beginning could be uh, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy and diastolic dysfunction and as the insult increases, can progress to the uh, heart failure, reduce ejection fraction, and drop of cardiac output. The management 
is modifying cardiovascular risk factor, smoking cessation, control diabetes, control hypertension, uh, correction of anemia, uh, treatment of the coronary artery disease if they need revascularization, uh, statin therapy for a better um, uh, cholesterol control as well as decreased inflammation, uh, electrolytes uh, imbalance control, acid base control, or some of the vitamin supp uh, supplement that has shown improvement there of uh, an effect on the cardiac and heart failure. The, the last type of the cardiorenal syndrome is type five uh, cardiorenal syndrome. This is combined cardiac and renal dysfunction due to acute or chronic systemic disorder. These are this uh, patient who they have a systemic disease and can this systemic disease can affect both heart and kidney. For example, sepsis, diabetes, amyloidosis, lupus, or, and sarcoidosis. So this um, uh, systemic disease, uh, any of them, can either affect both heart and kidney or can affect one of them. And as uh, we saw in other type of cardiorenal syndrome, worsening of one of the organ can direct on and directly worsening the other um, organ as well. And again, uh, this is kind of the, the concept of the two-way street. The systemic disease can worsen of this organ by multiple pathways that we uh, uh, we talked about. There is a, uh, an inflammatory pathway, hypoxemia, uh, sympathetic activation, RAS activation, or uh, the toxin in the medication that we use or the product of the disease that can affect these organs, which the outcome is heart failure and kidney failure. And that can affect that systemic uh, disease as well and the wishing cycle that happened um, here as well that we talked about before. The management is focused on the treatment of underlying cause. Um, hemodynamic optimization is um, essential in this patient. Uh, if they, this patient need uh, blood pressure support with the depressors, uh, they need a cardiac output support by inotrope or mechanical circuit support. The patient who are congested, diuresing is helpful. Or if the patient they have a significant uh, acid or electrolyte uh, disbalance, the renal replacement therapy could, should be considered for managing of this patient as well. So the take home points is cardiorenal syndrome has a complicated pathophysiology. Even though we have been trying to uh, refine and put them in different categories. However, there's a significant overlap between these syndromes and uh, uh, the identifying the etiology is very important and management should be individualized uh, for the etiology and for the patient. One important concept is multidisciplinary decision-making in this complicated disease. We uh, need to work with all other our colleagues, nephrology, endocrinology, rheumatology um, colleagues for the best management of these patients. Um, thank you so much. Um, I will stop here and uh, I'm happy to entertain any question. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for that uh, amazing overview of cardiorenal syndrome. Uh, you know, I think this again, um, speaks into the need for phenotyping better before we can think about therapies and in cardiorenal syndrome again you know th therapies such as ultrafiltration have not been really um, shown uh, as much promise as uh, we were expecting them to uh, to show now with uh, sglt2 inhibitors uh, ryan do you th you know they, they seem to be the the first cardiorenal drug, if you will, because it seems to have both uh, cardiac and renal side, you know, um, um, uh, benefits to it. Um, uh, do you see a role of SGLT2 inhibitors in acute decompensated heart failure? And you know, are there any uh, trials in, in this arena? Absolutely, I this this uh, SGL2 inhibitors are uh, as 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 you mentioned, there's uh, 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 you know medications and the treatments that is coming, and there are a lot of trials on that. There are definitely significant benefit from uh, this medication in the uh, HEFREF patient, and not only is the cardiac benefit from it, also 
you have you seen the uh, decreasing the worsening of the renal function so there's definitely a lot of emerging uh, you know use for this medication and in the setting of uh, acute decompensated heart failure there are trials that's in the, in the process especially not only helping with the car cardiac uh, effect of it also have the diuresing effect of it so uh, there's more so these are the emerging uh, treatments that is coming and we're going to see more and more use of in the renal of in the in the cardiac and also the cardiorenal diseases thank you very much i think we'll uh yeah, thank you, Ryan, for a great talk. And uh, we're just going to take a 30 to 60 second break while we have uh, our next uh, Dr. Tom McGilvery come in to, to introduce our, our next speaker. All right, welcome back. We have, as you can see, we have a, a new guest in the studio. Uh, we are very uh, pleased to have uh, Dr. Tom McGilvery here to introduce our next guest. Dr. McGilvery is our Chief of Cardiac Surgery and Thoracic Transplant. In addition to that, he's uh, a Master Adult Congenital Surgeon and Aortic Surgeon and an all-around surgeon. Um, and uh, all amazing accolades except for uh, being a Boston Red Sox fan, and we'll try to forgive him for that. But. Uh, well, I, I appreciate your uh, willingness for redemption. Thanks very <laughs> much, uh, Barry. So it's, we're very honored to have our next speaker, uh, Abil Manji. Dr. Abil Manji is the chair of cardiac surgery uh, in the uh, MedStar system. 
in Washington, D.C. Uh, a Beal would be, to keep with the metaphor, considered a utility infielder uh, in terms of heart surgery. He uh, was educated at Brown, uh, did his surgery residency uh, at the Massachusetts General Hospital, during which time he did a, uh, a research fellowship with Victor Zhao in, uh, in cell therapies. Uh, after he left the MGH, he went to Columbia, where he trained in cardiac surgery, and then did advanced training in mechanical circuitry support, uh, heart and lung transplantation, and then another fellowship in advanced cardiac surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, after a stint at uh, Temple in uh, Philadelphia, where he was the director of heart uh, and uh, lung transplantation, he went to Yale, where he was also in charge of the uh, transplantation and mechanical circuitry assist program uh, before moving on to his program, uh, to his, his position now in Washington, D.C. So we're really very delighted to have Abil join us and give us a talk uh, on uh, mechanical circuitry support. And really, is there more to do or have we reached the limit? So with that, Dr. Manji. Hello, good, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Thomas McGillivray and Dr. Ash Guha for uh, inviting me uh, to give this talk and of course, uh, Barry Trachtenberg. Uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to be here uh, with you this afternoon. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you some information on uh, outcomes in patients who have uh, left ventricular assist devices. I'm uh, currently a professor of uh, cardiac surgery at the Yale University of School of Medicine uh, out in New Haven. Uh, I've known Dr. McGillivray for uh, almost 25 years now. Uh, he started uh, his career as a cardiac surgeon at Mass General the same year that uh, I started my internship at Mass General, and I've been very fortunate to be able to remain in touch with him over the years. And uh, I must say that you are fortunate to have him with you as a great guy and, and certainly a great, a great surgeon who I have a tremendous amount of respect for. In fact, <clears throat> he's one of the reasons I, I decided to become a cardiac surgeon myself. Here are some declarations. Um, none of these should provide uh, should prove to be a conflict with the content that I'm going to discuss with you today. And I think in, in these things, it's always important to take a step back and look at sort of where we've come from. Although this slide only dates back to 1995, as most of you know, the history of the race to an artificial heart uh, actually goes back to the 60s. Uh, and in fact, it was President Kennedy who challenged uh, the uh, cardiology community to, to come up with an artificial heart system. At about the same time, uh, he challenged NASA to put a man on the moon. And, and you can obviously tell which one of those two came first. It's been a long struggle uh, for patients who are extraordinarily sick. And clearly, while we've evolved away from the older pulse style devices, which were very much in use when, when I was in training and even when I first became an attending, out to using the uh, second generation devices, such as the HeartMate 2, and now third generation devices, predominantly the HeartMate 3. And then as I'll talk to you a little bit more, sort of a lot more devices under development. But that historical context is important uh, to keep in mind when, when I show you some additional data. So these are really the, the, this has been the era of the rotary heart pump, the HeartMate 2, the HeartMate 3 predominantly, and then to some extent the HVAD, the Heart Assist 5 and Jarvik 2000 haven't quite penetrated the market to the to the same extent. And essentially what we're describing is a permanent implantable device uh, sewn into the apex of the left ventricle connected to the, uh, the rotor and then the outflow sewn to the ascending aorta, a drive line that is externalized uh, and then sits at a controller with battery packs by the side. The HeartMate 3 configuration is not dissimilar to this. The HeartMate 2, of course, as most of you will know, is built around this impeller device, which enabled the dramatic reductions in, in size. Uh, and it <clears throat> the impeller basically is suspended upon two rubies, the one you see over here and one that's kind of hidden in over there. These ruby bearings help dissipate heat 
as the pump is spinning and are designed for a long lifespan. However, as most of us know, there have been problems in the past with thrombosis of this device. Uh, nonetheless, at the time, this was a, a dramatic step forward. So the principle again is really that of the Archimedean screw, you know, dating back to the to the third uh, to the third century, and I think that this this saying is is one hundred percent correct and will resonate with you throughout this lecture. So while the new continuous flow pumps are considered state of the art, it really is an old engineering saying that rings through. There are no new ideas, just old ones that are dusted off and polished. And I think you'll see this resonates throughout the this uh, brief uh, discussion this afternoon. So essentially what we're looking at is a rotor, which is this structure in the middle, suspended on two ruby bearings on which it allows it to rotate um, uh, spherically. The advantages of course, is that it's stable in all directions at uh, all speeds of operation. The disadvantages are that it's a relatively large hydraulic load. It can limit the life and, and there have obviously been reports of thrombus formation at, at the two bearing points. This is the newer generation device, the HeartMate 3. Uh, as you can see, a significantly smaller profile. Again, the inflow here, which plugs into the left ventricle and the outflow, which plugs into the ascending aorta, and then the drive line <clears throat> that is externalized through the skin. The differences with the HeartMate 3 are, of course, that is full magnetic levitation technology. What that means basically is that there are six magnets in this pump that uh, levitate the rotor and then stabilize it in all three dimensions while allowing it to rotate. The, the beautiful thing about this is that there are large gaps between the pump and the uh, casing that allows for greater washing and avoidance of blood trauma or shear. Uh, and, and, and that gap control is really not dependent on the, on the speed of the pump because the six magnets are con continuously adjusting the location of the rotor to maintain that, that gap size. So that's kind of what it looks like. You know, here's the rotator that's being levitated and one, two, three, four, five, six magnets around this that are stabilizing it uh, in position. So even when you have someone uh, who's ambulatory with a pump, you can see that the impeller position really remains remarkably stable at different uh, rates, of, uh, rates of speed or, or adjustment. So, you know, when we look at uh, the, um, the, the history of, uh, of the, the therapies for heart failure, what we do know is if we look at sort of performance and cost on the y-axis, patient utilization on the x-axis, you know, relatively simple therapies, although very elegant ones, such as diuretics, beta blocker, and ACE inhibitors, obviously have relatively low cost and high adaptation. However, as we move leftward along the curve, you know, this is kind of the area what we're, that we're talking about now is the durable left ventricular assist devices that tend to have relatively low uh, patient utilization, at least compared to the uh, um, uh, epidemic uh, incidence of heart failure in this country and the prevalence of heart failure in this country. And, and, the, and the cost, both the cost and performance tend to be very high. And that of course uh, uh, makes sense given how uh, uh, the undertaking that is required to implant and live with the left ventricular assist device. Having said that, the rotary pumps really have become the mainstay for the management of end-stage uh, congestive, congestive heart failure. Their performance are, is excellent. The experience that we've accumulated with them is vast, but the cost is also high. I will say that the use of the word mainstay is perhaps a little bit exaggerated here when we think about the fact that they're close to a million discharges from the hospital, according to CMS, uh, a year with heart failure, yet the total number of implants of these devices is still in that uh, three to 4,000 range. So it's, it's clear, it's far from being a mainstay, but really is an excellent option. So I, I think having some sense of who we uh, consider an appropriate candidate for an LVAD is important. Basically, it's a patient with persistent neuric heart association class three or class four symptoms. It's a patient who has demonstrated intolerance either to an ACE inhibitor or an ARB or a beta blocker i.e. you're unable to uptitrate these meds because of hypotension, profound fatigue, renal failure, et cetera. They generally have had more than two hospitalizations in the last six months and tend to have the, the poorly defined cardiorenal syndrome, which is that your renal function actually deteriorates when you try to uh, diurese these patients. 
They could also have electrical instabilities or greater burden of, of ventricular tachycardias, uh, non-responders to cardiac resynchronization therapies, and then patients who are on high uh, diuretic requirements. So this is a Lasix greater than 120 milligrams per day or persistent hyponatremia with a sodium less than 135. These lower ones tend to be uh, relatively uh, relative contra uh, relative indications. The, the above are, are sort of absolute indications. So the key is obviously with a device that is this expensive and this difficult to maintain, the key is that implantation of the device must indeed improve survival. Uh, and so some additional strategies that we try to gauge of how sick a patient is or what their projected life expectancy is, is a combination of cardiopulmonary exercise testing or putting them through a heart failure survival score. The uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing obviously is measuring, uh, in essence, your metabolic equivalents or what your peak oxygen uh, consumption and delivery are. And in general, what we know is that if you're sort of less than that 13, 14 cutoff, that transplantation or implantation of left ventricular assist device may lead to a, a survival advantage. And this has been well studied, uh, you know, over the course of the last several decades now. Uh, and this is essentially a pictorial representation of the same. The heart failure survival score incorporates a lot of the things we've talked about before, but also tries to incorporate some hemodynamic data. So do the patient have coronary disease? Uh, uh, what is their heart rate at rest? The mean arterial blood pressure, the left ventricular ejection fraction, uh, the presence of a, a cardiac defibrillator, uh, what their serum sodium is, and then what is their peak oxygen consumption. Each of these are multiplied by uh, these multipliers uh, based on their odds ratio of predict predictability. And basically you come up with a, with a uh, score and a prognosis associated with that. Essentially, if you're a high risk a patient, if you have a score of less than seven, and that tends to say that a third of patients with a score less than 7.1 will, uh, will, will be alive at the end of one year. Patients with an intermediate score will have 60% uh, of them will be alive and then lower risk for those with a score lower than 8.1. So in general, it tends to be this category that we're targeting for implantation of left ventricular assist devices. And this again is a pictorial representation of the same. The first study that actually demonstrated the advantage of left ventricular assist devices was the rematch trial, which was run by one of my mentors when I was a fellow at Columbia by the name of Eric Rose. And this was the first study to show two things. Number one, how sick patients who were under optimal medical therapy actually did. Only 25% of these patients were alive at one year and only 8% of them were alive at two years. And it showed that implantation of the old pulse dial left ventricular assist device could actually double the survival at one year and triple the survival at two years of these patients. So it made two very important points. You can tell these are very sick patients, but generally fulfilling all the criteria that we've discussed before. And this is what led to the first Food and Drug Administration approval for the HeartMate 1 or the pulse style device to be approved for destination therapy. Now, as uh, therapy has improved over the years, we looked at the HeartMate 2 trial to see, well, what does that do to your survival? And you can see that now with the HeartMate 2 trial in their, uh, in their landmark study, this one-year survival had improved from 27% for the medically treated patients, 54% for the rematch patients, 74% at one year for the heart made two patients. And when you compare this to the medically treated arm, you'll recall 8% at two years, 24% at two years for the heart made XVE device. And that has tripled now up to 64% at two years for the um, heart made two device. And when you looked at uh, continued access uh, protocols, you could see that patients did even better. So this is compared to the to the earlier trials where you see continual upward and rightward shift of those curves. And this, I think, again, is an important theme that we'll want to keep in mind as we watch uh, uh, the rest of this uh, discussion. If you computed actuarial survival of these patients post hoc, you can see that they're even better. So the one year survival is now at uh, you know, 90 to 85%. Quality of life measures generally improved dramatically at the three month mark once the patient had actually recovered from the, the difficulty of the operation. The Minnesota living with heart failure scores all improved by 44 points. The ability of the patient to walk uh, a certain amount of distance in six minutes improved by over 100 meters. So you can see that not only were the survival metrics improving, but simultaneously the quality of life metrics had also been improving. However, 
<clears throat> what we continue to be burdened with is the incidence of stroke and the incidence of right-sided heart failure, which as you can see in the pivotal trial was at about 5% for ischemic stroke, 3% for hemorrhagic stroke, and about 6% for persistent right ventricular failure. But in the post-approval study, you can see that those numbers start to compress significantly, not so much on the ischemic stroke, but certainly a halving of the hemorrhagic stroke and a halving of the right RV failure incidence, which I think has to do really with the uh, selection, uh, better selection and better post-operative management. You know, there's constant yin and yang between trying to manage hemorrhage and thrombosis in these patients. Because there is this interface with an artificial surface, surface uh, the blood needs to be anticoagulated uh, to a certain extent, uh, but then obviously there's a risk of bleeding. So you'll see there's a constant yin and yang here of bleeding and thrombosis that needs to be measured. When we're talking about thrombotic events, the most catastrophic obviously is thrombosis of the left ventricular assist device itself, which is at about 3% of patients. And we see, we will, I will show you data to show that that number actually increased dramatically over a year. But you know, as you're trying to solve for this problem, you're anticoagulating patients. And so the incidence of bleeding is not insignificant in these people either. You know, it can be as high as 30%, uh, not only from the operative side, but also intestinal bleeding, for example. And then the final piece is the, the incidence of, uh, of, uh, of infection and how that can result in stroke. This is one of the papers that I was referring to earlier, an unexpected increase in left ventricular assist device uh, thrombosis rate. This was published by uh, one of our co-speakers cool today, our, our Dr. Starling back in 2013, who demonstrated that the incidence of uh, uh, pump thrombosis actually increased from about 2% to about 8% over time. Uh, our group uh, uh, actually uh, had some contributions to this as well. Now, when you look at, so that's obviously all historical data. The question obviously is, well, what changed uh, the left ventricular, the, the third generation uh, LVAD, the HeartMate 3, uh, uh, was part of this Momentum 3 trial in which uh, our group was a, was a significant uh, implanter. And uh, some of the data that you see in this, when you compare the older HeartMate 2 device to the newer uh, HeartMate 3 device, if you look at the incidence of uh, pump thrombosis, uh, it is uh, about, uh, about the, uh, a little bit higher. If you look at the incidence of uh, uh, stroke, uh, for hemorrhagic stroke, it is uh, higher. Ischemic stroke, also higher. But bleeding events, you know, appear to be about the same, and infectious uh, incidents appear to be about the same, if not a little bit lower. Right-sided uh, heart failure appears to be about the same. So even with Momentum 3, the pivotal trial on the third generation uh, device, you see an 83% survival, about a 10% stroke rates, more of which are ischemic than hemorrhagic, but a significantly lower thrombosis rate down from about 8% from Dr. Starling's uh, study to about 1% in the uh, uh, clinical trial. But this really, this uh, stroke area is, you know, where we will continue to focus over time. Um, I'll probably just skip through this slide. Um, but this, uh, this is an, another important set of information. This is the uh, Society of Thoracic Surgeons uh, 2020 annual report based on the Intermax registry. This uh, was just published, uh, I think, about a week ago. Uh, my soon-to-be uh, colleague and partner, Dr. Ezekiel Molina, was the lead author uh, on this study. And I'd like to share with you what this shows, because this moves away from just uh, uh, trial-specific data to a real-world experience across, uh, across the country. And it's important, the lessons learned from this are very important. When we look back to about 2010, this is when the HeartMate 2 device was first applied for destination therapy. The HeartMate 2 device is shown in blue here. And you can see that it reached a peak in about 2012 to 2015 with about 2,200 implants a year. But this is kind of that same area you'll recall about 2013 when concerns were raised about the rate of uh, pump thrombosis. And you can see that its, its penetration at the market started to get erased by the HVAD, which is depicted here in the orange. And you can see that the heart made two kind of peaked in 2015 and then steadily declined really at the cost of the, of the HVAD whose numbers grew. The HeartMate 3 came about in 2017 uh, was then approved, and the study I showed you a little bit uh, a little while ago 
came up here, you can see that HFAD has also declined again because of pump thrombosis issues. And HeartMate 3 really is now the, the sort of dominant player uh, in the country. And as I alluded to earlier, you know, even if you sum all of these up, there's only about 3,000 implants a year, which no, in no way, shape or form uh, addresses the epidemic of heart failure in America uh, as we see it today. When we look at you know, who are the types of patients that we're actually putting these pumps in, this is stratified by Intermax level. So Intermax 1 and the blue here are the sickest of the sick. Intermax 2 are stable. Intermax 3 are even in better shape and Intermax 4 can often be at home. And you can see that these numbers really haven't changed that much over time. I mean, Intermax 1, we still account for about 15 to 20% of our implants. Intermax 2 is about a third of our implants. There may be some increase in the Intermax 3 population, but that really is at the cost of the Intermax 4 population. So sick people are still getting implanted. Really nothing has changed in, in that regard. And if you look at the types of patients that are getting implanted, you know, these traditionally have been the bridge to transplant. You can see that those numbers have dramatically declined in the last couple of years, really at the, because of the change in uh, lung transplant, uh, excuse me, heart transplant allocation strategy. So really as a percentage, the vast majority of patients now in the green here are being implanted uh, for destination therapy because it's easier now to get patients heart transplants without uh, having an indwelling LVAD. If you look at a real world analysis of survival, what you see here, this is the, the hazard that you're familiar with that I've shown you before, but the uh, one year survival for all patients with continuous flow devices is about 84%, 81%. The two year survival is 70%. And then we see it start to tail off really about 10% per year. Uh, so it's, it's essentially a quite a straight line um, is after, the, after the first relatively steep uh, drop off in perioperative uh, mortality. And if you look at how we have done over ERA, if you compare the five years between 2010 and 2014 to the five years after that, we can see that just as a function of greater experience, survival rates at all of these time points have significantly improved. And this is going to be a key point that I'm going to be coming back to. You see this entire curve has shifted upwards from red to blue, uh, which, which tells us that as, as a group and as a community, we're far better at, uh, at taking care of these patients. However, the three Achilles heels of these patients remain. So the first is infection. You can see that uh, infections tend to be a real problem uh, in the first 12 months after surgery, more than almost two thirds of patients will experience one, but then there's a relatively rapid decline in this over time. These are not only infections in the drive line, but also remote infections, pneumonia, sepsis, and things of that nature. Again, we see this balancing act between bleeding and thrombosis. So you see the time to a first intestinal bleed. Uh, generally at about 12 months, about 20% 20 20 of patients have had a bleed, i.e. 80% are free. But that number also continues to decline over time. You'd really like to see this line be flat over time. But more and more patients uh, as a population tend to experience GI bleeds uh, over time. And then the balancing act there of, well, if, if we're trying to prevent them from bleeding, we back off on their anticoagulation. And what you start to see is, a, is an increase in stroke. So about 13% of patients will have had a stroke a year after implant. And that curve, again, you know, continues to decline where you'd really like to see it flat. So complications tend to increase over time, infection, bleeding, uh, and stroke. And as you can imagine, with that comes uh, rehospitalization rate. So a freedom from rehospitalization is actually very low uh, at two, three, four, five years out. Uh, most patients, you know, if, if you've been alive for five years with an LVAD, there's almost a uniform chance that you've been rehospitalized uh, during that during that percentage of time. Despite all that, and I think what what people, what we in the community have found encouraging about LVAD surgery. Is, is really the survival piece that, you know, we've gone from being able to get patients to survive, only about 20 patients, 20% 20 of patients to survive at one year to about 50% with the HeartMate XVE, now to almost 90% at one year with the HeartMate 3. That really is what has driven over time the number of LVAD implantations to go up uh, internationally, as well as the number of reporting centers, uh, participating centers to go up over time. It really has been driven by this decrease in mortality rate uh, over time. 
However, there's clearly a, a, a lot of work to be done. Um, I think that, uh, you know, one of the, the things I love about this field and what I love about practicing medicine and cardiac surgery in America is, uh, is our innovative spirit. And uh, one of my co-authors, uh, Pramod Bond, in this paper, um, has started looking at, well, what, in, in far more detail than we had previously, what are some of the risk factors that could impact uh, patient selection. So he's identified lymphopenia, for example, as one risk factor. And I think what we're going to find now that we have largely solved the problem of survival is how can we do a better job selecting patients to ensure that they're actually going to have a, a longer survival time. You know, others of us, and this is a paper that I wrote back in 2013, uh, uh, looked, looked at ourselves in the mirror a little bit and said, well, what are we doing as surgeons that can influence uh, outcomes of patients. You know, we as cardiac surgeons pay so much attention to surgical technique when it comes to things like coronary bypass surgery or valvular repair and replacement. It, it didn't appear to be that we were uh, paying as much attention to, to LVAD implantable technique. And, and so, you know, I think we have seen over the years a larger push to standardize techniques um, uh, for, for LVAD implantation. So now you're looking at, you know, how do we as a community identify and standardize selection criteria how do we select and standardize uh, LVAD implantation uh, criteria? And a lot of us have shifted to you know, minimally invasive strategies. So it's a minimally invasive incision to implant the core. It's a small incision to implant the device and a small counter incision to implant the aortic outflow. And this preserves the sternum uh, for, for future need transplant, for example, or, or, or pump exchange. Another huge attempt has been trying to figure out what to do about driveline infection rates. As you can see, the driveline infection rates, uh, you know, when the velour of the pump was exposed was actually quite high, 0.3 uh, per patient year. But when the velour was withdrawn and kept within the body, uh, that infection rate became quite low. And this was work that David Dean down in North Carolina uh, led um, uh, for, for, for several years. It certainly changed the way I practice. And I can tell you with 100 LVAD implantations, I had only one driveline infection after we had standardized uh, our driveline uh, maturation protocols. So, you know, again, a lot of work, a lot of innovative work being done to, to think about how to reduce infection rates and this is a sort of histograph demonstrating, you know, the, the dense inflammatory reaction that happens when you have a skin velour interface as opposed to a skin silicone uh, interface. The next piece obviously is technological innovation. You know, we've, I've given you a brief historical tour to show you sort of where we've come from, uh, but, but you know, where we're going is actually quite exciting as well. They've been, there's been a huge surge in the development of endovascular pumps. So the Tandem Heart, for example, the Impella, for example, a bunch of others that are pictured in this, uh, in this diagram over here. You know, the Thoratec PHP pump, uh, which was a temporary uh, uh, endovascular pump, and that's what it looks like on a, on a chest X-ray. The RT Cardiac Systems pump, uh, other implantable pumps that do, that dwell, uh, you know, right at the right at the uh, aortic valve interface and are and are uh, excuse me in 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 the uh, in the left atrium and are implanted into the subclavian artery. So miniaturization of these devices is a is a huge effort, as is an effort to augment a renal perfusion uh, in, in order to try to solve the very vexing problem of the cardiorenal syndrome. Yet other people are looking at ways to eliminate the driveline altogether. So, you know, the way you can now charge uh, your iPhone uh, using a uh, contactless, uh, excuse me, a wireless system. Uh, uh, other people and companies have been looking at trying to have wireless charging of a left ventricular assist device so that you can completely eliminate uh, the driveline component. The bottom line is that in our lifetime, certainly in this last year, but all through history, We've been witness to things that uh, we never thought uh, would be possible. Um, some of them uh, absolute uh, engineering marvels and tributes to uh, uh, human innovation uh, over time. And I feel that what we've been able to accomplish with left ventricular assist device therapy um, over the last several years, um, number one, significantly decreasing the uh, mortality rates from that, but now most importantly, starting to focus 
very hard on how to minimize complication rates, uh, specifically when it comes to bleeding, uh, pump thrombosis, and infections. I think that uh, the next 10 years uh, will reveal to us things that we never thought possible as we sit here today. So I'd like to thank you for your time and for your attention, and I will be available for any uh, questions should they come up. Thank you. I'd like to thank you very much, Abil, for that uh, very educational talk. You uh, took us through the history of VADS up to the present, and it is really extraordinary uh, how much progress has been made in certainly the course of, uh, I would say, your and my professional lifetime. So uh, we, we've had uh, some questions that have come in that uh, uh, would be great. Abil is not able to join us for the question and answer time, so we'll do the best we can to field them for him, keeping the same metaphor. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, hopefully the fielding will be better than the Red Sox recently. But anyway, the, uh, so the first question was, uh, is can LVADs be considered to help uh, to wait for potential reversibility of cardiac dysfunction or insult? Uh, for example, weeks after myocarditis or an acute myocardial infarction, uh, if somebody has symptoms that are NYHA3 uh, or 4 that are persistent. What do you guys think? Yeah, so there is, I mean, the whole concept of, of recovery and being able to, to explain the LVAT and if someone improves their ejection fraction. This is a field that's been very well researched, especially the last few years. There's been a lot of interest in that. Uh, it depends on the phenotype. So certainly if you're having acute myocardial infarction, but you, you, know, you, you still have persistent symptoms despite reperfusion, that's unlikely to, to get better. Uh, but th there are, is data that suggests, and these are they're different databases, but overall, you know, younger patients, non-ischemic, certainly, um, you know, peripartum or myocarditis will be more likely, theoretically and with some data to support, that those patients are more likely to be able to recover. Um, in the real world data, if you look at the UNOS, you know, um, if you look at the Intermax registry, only about 1% of patients are able to have their LVAD explanted. Um, if you have um, you know, recent trials that have looked at this where they've really had aggressive measures to try to you know, get them on the best medical guideline directed therapy and then try to um, you know, get them to recover their, their heart, I think it's up to about you know, 20% or so were able to, to get their LVAD uh, explanted. So it really depends on the patient population. Um, and uh, the etiology of, of why they have heart failure, how long they've had heart failure, uh, and of course, how hard you try to push for recovery. But overall, in the real world, it's still 1%. So. I think, and I think we now have, I mean, it was more of an issue 10 or 15 years ago when we had implantable VADs, uh, and the, the, the other temporary VADs that we had were not great options. Uh, so. The dilemma that we were in was, uh, are we going to take this person to astronomy, implant this very expensive device which had its own set of issues? I do think now we have other options that we can hold these patients over, whether it's impeller, a tandem heart, uh, balloon pumps, uh, that can, with much less, invest much less investment, not only in money, but in uh, patient physiology, right. Uh, we can we can stabilize them, and, and we certainly have had uh, you know uh, our, uh, some experience with uh, recovery with myocarditis uh, with impella support. So right. I think, uh, especially in patients who are coming in with fulminant myocarditis or, or near fulminant, yeah. I guess uh, myocarditis. I think we've we've had some success with yeah. uh, temporary MCS. So any any thoughts from you guys on the, the recent data? You know, a couple of years ago showing. You know, higher rates of recovery in um, in patients with in, uh, in the Emma the Emma Burkhoff trial. Uh, I, I think Burke's again, trial. patient. Yeah. I think patient selection is the key, yeah. and yeah. I think uh, yes, I, you know, as we as it's been the theme of the whole uh, summit here. I think GDMT probably uh, for these patients, we have to probably do a GDMT on overdrive uh, to be able to explant them, which is what they've seen in the. the in right. and, and, and certainly, again, when there was that great uh, 
when, when implantable VADs were really ramping up, there were patients whose native hearts got better. Right. Uh, and then there were trials that were put together to see uh, whether those patients could be uh, explanted, and, and uh, a relatively small percentage were. But, but a fair percentage of those patients that recovered then also recurred. recurred. Um, so, but uh, the, I mean, do, do you, in this day and age, I mean, that's not really very much on the menu anymore, do you think? No, I think in selected uh, patients, I think it is still uh, something that uh, we would, you know, there is some desire to achieve. Uh, because I think in younger non-ischemics, if you can, even after, uh, I think we, we, we don't understand the whole recovery after mechanical unloading as yeah. well. I think, and even for patients who've had long-standing cardiomyopathy, mechanical unloading seems to be able to produce the, that kind of reverse model, yeah. reverse remodeling, which otherwise is probably not, uh, you know, achievable. Now uh, it does happen in a minority of them, yeah. and uh, yeah. again, I think I think we just don't understand it uh, as well yet. Yeah. So I think uh, there are a couple of yeah. Uh, the, uh, what questions. Uh, IVC filters in association with LVAD implantation. Yeah, so I mean, I, there's no role for that uh, per se. Most you know, patients with LVAD <coughs> should always. Be on anticoagulation unless they have a contraindication to, to anticoagulation. If they have frequent GI bleeds, etc., then maybe. Um, but but uh, there, there shouldn't really be a prophylactic use of an IVC filter in these patients. IVC filters have complications. They they shouldn't be in long term. Um, I'm sure there's exceptions where that you know you might want to consider it in someone that uh, you know in a rare example or has an LVAD and not able to tolerate anticoagulation and has. A history of DVTs, but I, I think that would be exceedingly rare. O over time, IVC filter complications right. continues to yeah. go up. And as our vascular surgery uh, friends say, they spent many years putting them in, and now they're spending many years taking mm -hmm. them out. Uh, so I, I think if appropriate, if an indication is appropriate, getting an IVC filter that's retrievable and stays in for the prescribed amount of time. But not, not that yeah. commonly indicated, I think, in this population. How about ICDs and LVADs? Uh, is there an indication to give somebody an ICD when they have an LVAD? Yeah, I, I think this is a very good question. Uh, I think we sometimes struggle with this, especially in patients who are, you know, uh, destination therapy or uh, even in bridge to transplant patients. So there is some data now to kind of understand which patients are at uh, risk of having VT post LVAD. So we have to still remember that the right ventricle is unsupported. So if patients on an LVAD have a lot of VT and a lot of shocks, they do seem to have accelerated RV failure. Mm -hmm. So I think it is important for these patients not to have VT after LVAD. Um, so I think some of the markers have been uh, that the, uh, if you have preoperative uh, ventricular tachycardia, I think those patients would benefit from having an ICD even after an LVAD implant. Um, and I think there is some data that even those patients who have preoperative AFib are at more risk for developing VT later on. So I think, so preoperative arrhythmias, I think we'd definitely consider that they should get an ICD yeah. even after LVAD. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's a very, uh, you know, as you said, it's a very controversial area with not, with a lot of great, you know, considering the ICD data in a non-LVAD population, we're looking at, you know, several studies, all thousands of patients and tens of thousands of patients sometimes. In this population, we just don't have the data. Um, you know, patients that have an LVAD, even when they have VT or VF, uh, could sometimes tolerate it very well for hours and sometimes even days. Um, and then you're introducing a device that if they do have a drive light infection that gets into the bloodstream is another source of potential bloodstream infection. So it's not something we do routinely, um, but we're trying to figure out which patients uh, might benefit from an AICD if they don't already have one. Uh, certainly, if they already have one, we're going to leave it in there at the time of the LVAD. If they don't have it in, then we're trying to tease out 
who's at a high enough risk that warrants an AICD uh, at the time or, or post LVAD implantation. So. so what do you guys think about, uh, you know, certainly as uh, Dr. Manji's presentation demonstrated that I mean, the devices have gotten smaller, there's less complications, the survival rate's better, and it, it, it logically makes sense that perhaps the indications for implanting an LVAD should, we should extend it to maybe the patients who have less severe heart failure. I mean, it makes logical sense, but, but, but is that, just because it makes sense doesn't mean it's good practice. What, what do you all think about that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think the devil's in the details. Um, so I think it depends what we're calling less sick. Um, certainly, you know, we don't want to be doing, you know, the Intermax 1, crashing and burning patients, cardiogenic shock mm -hmm. as, a, as, as a large proportion of our LVAT patients. Um, even Intermax 2, which is, you know, kind of the sliding despite inotropes, uh, quote unquote, population. Um, you know, we, we certainly, uh, Intermax 3 or 4 or 5, less sick patients, uh, would be you know better for our outcome certainly, and uh, a lot of patients I think would benefit from it. But at what at what cutoff is, is difficult uh, to ascertain for the data? We do have data from the roadmap trial, which of course is with the HeartMate two, which has more adverse effects than the, than uh, than the HeartMate three, uh, and that uh, you know looked at Intermax you know ambulatory non inotrope dependent patients, and um, you know, it was a trade off. The patients that that were that, and it was also not randomized. It was at the discretion of the physician, and um, the patients that were in the LVAD group uh, had a better, you know, freedom, uh, better quality of life, better, you know, six-minute walk test at a year. Um, but the group that uh, was in the medical therapy arm, um, if they crossed over to the LVAD arm, um, it actually had a kind of similar outcome. So there wasn't, um, you know, that you could do the watchful waiting approach mm -hmm. in those patients. Uh, now, if you did that same trial with HeartMate 3, uh, I suspect you would see a little bit more favorable towards the LVAD group because of a less adverse event profile, but it's still not a benign adverse event profile. So mm. um, that's it. I don't know. Uh, Ash, what do yeah, you no, think? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, is the, uh, the question is, is this, is this time for another roadmap? Yeah. And I think, you know, if we, we have to get better at stroke because stroke risk is still about 10% a year. And I think we need to get to a completely implantable LVAD. I think if we can get to a completely implantable LVAD without a drive line, yeah. and if we can manage strokes, I think that would be the time probably to do a well, another you, another roadmap. You know, if, we had, if we had, if we could sit down and kind of write out our wish list, you know, right. what, uh, if we could, uh, if we could design an ideal VAD, right? I think we would all, you know, completely implantable have some kind of transcutaneous energy transfer, or even better, you know, have a battery that could, even if it had the same durability of an ICD battery or a pacer battery, I mean, that, that I think would be one giant leap right. forward. Uh, if we could improve the blood compatibility, uh, if we didn't need to anticoagulate, uh, that would obviously Decre I mean, with better blood compatibility, we'd have less issues with strokes, and without any coagulation, we'd have less problems with bleeding. If we had a smaller device, you know, they, they could be less, uh, I mean, even though, the, I mean, if you take a look at what the HeartMate 3 looks like now, or the HFAT, I mean, compared to, uh, you know, an XVE, it's pretty extraordinary. Then I guess, too, we, we could add to that list if we really wanted to get greedy, by ventricular support, mm -hmm. you know, right mm -hmm. now, right. you know, we're kind yeah. of, we've got <coughs> one side fits so, yeah. many of our patients, <laughs> not all of our patients. And uh, if we could get some kind of reliable, durable, dependable by ventricular support, I mean, that would really make all of our mechanical circuitry <laughs> wishes come true. <laughs> <laughs> so if any of our uh, MCS device partners are listening, you heard the wish list <laughs> yeah. here, so please get to work well, and uh, see We're not asking do. for much, we're <laughs> not asking for much. <laughs> Well, great. That was uh, really a, a great. Uh, I think we have one more question. Oh. Um, so just popped in. So uh, is revascularization still relevant if a patient who has an LVAD presents with uh, acute coronary syndrome? So Ash, do you want to take that? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, I 
uh, it is really dependent on uh, uh, the scenario. So I think uh, we've had those patients and uh, uh, especially the ones which, uh, who've had an RCA infarct, we've usually gone in and done something about. And of course, if the ACS is associated with VT, that's another reason to do it. So I think there are you know, certain scenarios where I think it would still be uh, worthwhile doing it, but um, I think it has to be selected and uh, done in appropriate patients. Yeah. Agreed. All right, well, that was a fantastic uh, presentation and discussion, and uh, we thank both of our uh, keynote speakers today who really gave excellent talks. Uh, and now we move on to the last session. I think this is maybe my favorite session. This is when we have three of our fellows uh, present cases, uh, all really interesting cases, and we will um, be discussing them. And so first, uh, I'd like to welcome our advanced heart failure <coughs> fellow, Dr. Anusha Sankara. Uh, she is a, a seventh year uh, in training and three months away from uh, no longer being in formal training and will be moving on to, um, to, to join a practice in, in uh, Baptist in Little Rock, Arkansas. And, and uh, thank you, Anusha, for being here and look forward to your presentation. You're, you're muted. muted. Here you uh, go. I hope everyone is able to say, uh, see my screen. So today we'll have the first case presentation. Uh, so I have a 29-year-old male uh, who, with no prior known uh, medical issues, who presented to an outside hospital with acute onset shortness of breath. Uh, put the history, he reported that he reported progressively worsening shortness of breath over five days prior to the presentation. Did not have any other signs and symptoms concerning for any fevers or chills or cough. Um, he had some palpitations that happened actually a few weeks, a few days prior to the onset of these current symptoms, but did not seek any medical attention to that. He does have known prior erectile dysfunction as was using sildenafil as needed, uh, needed for it. And he was laid off one month prior to this and he was using excessive alcohol after his, he was laid off but denied any smoking or illegal drug use. Uh, he had no premature uh, family, uh, no, he, no, he had no family history of premature coronary artery disease or no family history of cardiomyopathy or sudden cardiac death. On presentation to the outside hospital, he was tachycardic. Heart rate was noted to be 140s to 180s. He was afibrant. Blood pressure was on the lower side, and he was needing four liters of nasal cannula, uh, oxygen on the nasal cannula. On an examination, he was reported to be in mild distress, and he had signs and symptoms concerning for uh, volume overload. That is, he had positive JVD, and he had uh, one plus bilateral fetal edema and decreased breath sounds bilaterally. This was his EKG on arrival, uh, which showed atrial fibrillation with uh, RBR. And this was his chest X-ray on arrival, which, was, which showed by uh, congestion in the, both lung fields. This was, these were his labs on arrival, uh, which showed mild troponin elevation and a mild BNP elevation at 747. His lactic acid was, however, normal. His COVID on this COVID era, the PCR was negative and the urine tox screen was negative. So uh, at, at presentation in the ER, he was given amiodarone and digoxin initially for the AFib, uh, but he had no significant response for that. So they planned a TEE-guided cardioversion. And the TEE showed, as you can see, uh, severe biventricular failure. And the second video in here shows a uh, left atrial appendage with a left atrial appendage clot. And then uh, these are two more videos showing the same thing that he had severe biventricular failure. And at this point, when they attempted, when during their attempt for cardioversion, he became hemodynamically unstable. His uh, pressure dropped, and he was needing more pressure support. So at this juncture, I would like to uh, we have we I would like to summarize in the sense we have a 29 year old male with no known prior history of uh, past medical history or cardiac issues, but with known alcohol abuse. It is coming in signs and symptoms suggestive of acute decompensated heart failure, with I would say concomitant cardiogenic shock and uh, AFib with RVR. So at this juncture, I would like to know the thoughts of like uh, what 
And when you see a patient like this, what would be the some of the things going on in your mind and uh, what would be uh, your next steps? So are we on audit? Yeah, so great. So I think that's a, a great uh, start. So I guess a few questions I want to know. I mean, we're trying to figure out the etiology of his disease. Uh, first of all, how much alcohol does he drink? Do we know? Uh, his, uh, when we asked his family, he, they suggested uh, quite a significant alcohol, history of alcohol abuse, but uh, I don't have an exact quantification. Okay. Yeah, and just alcohol is one of those things that, you know, we frequently get a history of with some, you know, with some vagaries, and um, it certainly can cause cardiomyopathy, but I think we attribute a lot more alcohol cardiomyopathy to people than, than, than what, what exists in reality. I mean, it takes a lot, I mean, not that I want to encourage anyone out there, but it does take a lot of alcohol to cause cardiomyopathy, and, and that's typically, you know, daily use for, for years of, you know, at least six to eight drinks daily. Uh, for years is what we know from, from retrospective data for, for what that's worth. Um, certainly um, concerned about fulminant myocarditis. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this is in the COVID era in the last year or not, um, but uh, what other thoughts are you thinking in terms of etiology? I think those, you know, of course with the, I guess COVID and, you know, in the, in the, in the current. Cardiomyopathy? It, it, it can be, uh, you know, but usually tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy presenting with cardiogenic shock is Fairly, uh, because they do dilate over time, and uh, um, usually the ones presenting with cardiogenic shock have a non-dilated ventricle, so I think yeah. uh, it's rare, but it's uh, certainly possible. Just want to see if our uh, other two panelists, Dr. Bhimraj and Dr. Fida, are also uh, on, or? Yes, sir, I, I'm on. Uh, Can you hear me? Yeah, great. If we can highlight Dr. Beamer, Dr. Fida, if somehow to get them also on the screen, that would be great. Um, I don't know if that's possible, but if not, we can just hear their, their audio if they have any comments so far. Yeah, I, I think you know, both of you pointed out uh, the, the, the mechanisms to be uh, used as a differential. I think I, I also want to point out to the audience that, Anusha, correct me if I'm wrong, the uh, labs look relatively benign. So when you're saying cardiogenic shock, I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, people can be in shock and how are you defining shock? I'm guessing as you move forward that this individual seems sick, the tachycardia is not a good prognosticator. Uh, it's a compensatory mechanism and that based on the echo, echo images you showed, they looked pretty bad. So we'll see how the case pans out. I think all the etiologies that were discussed by the rest of you are, are probably valid differentials at this stage. I mean, simple things like thyrotoxicosis and, and you know, sometimes we forget about B12 and those things which are not that common, but uh, I think definitely thyrotoxicosis needs to be kept in mind too. Thank you. Yes, uh, he going back to the first question. He uh, did have a significant history, but that was like one month prior to the presentation. Going back to Dr. Trachtenberg's question, and uh, the reason I said cardiogenic shock was, uh, as I know about uh, what happened next, uh, he did have uh, uh, worsening uh, hypotension and uh, needing increased pressure support. That's how I said cardiogenic shock. So, uh, going back to our uh, presentation. So uh, given severe biventricular dysfunction uh, with cardiogenic shock, a uh, patient was initiated with uh, initiated on ECMO, uh, an extracorporeal life support with BA ECMO. Uh, he had bifemoral cannulation, and he was also uh, placed on impala CP via right femoral axis, and he was transferred here for further evaluation. When he, uh, when he came over here, uh, he was uh, noted to be still tachycardic. Uh, he was at this point incubated and sedated, and he was on VA ECMO, which was flowing at five liters per minute, and Impala CP at only at P3. Uh, his pressures were, uh, his maps were 80 on a support of norepinephrine uh, nephrine at two uh, milligrams per minute, and he was also on amiodarone. Um, and physical examination was uh, the significant uh, finding was his lower extremities were cool to touch, which was probably uh, perfusion from the egg, lower perfusion from the egg now. I seem to have an issue with the. 
So Anusha, while you're figuring out, you're stuck on the slide, so maybe I can use the opportunity. You can move it yeah. if you can. But I think it's it's interesting that typically when people end up on ECMO, and I'm guessing the decision of ECMO was made elsewhere with need for BIV support, but it's normally when somebody is extremely tachycardic and cardiogenic shock and you know we resuscitate them and put in an ECMO, it's almost immediate that you notice the heart rate settles down if the heart rate is a compensation for the shock. So it's interesting to me that despite uh, despite on ECMO and CP that if the patient is still tachycardic, I wonder if Dr. McGilvery's comment on is a tachycardia mediated with whatever reason is, is, an, is a possibility, but that just comes to mind that despite your support system, you're still tachycardic. And I, I want to also uh, get thoughts on, uh, you know, initiation of uh, support and cardiogenic shock from Dr. Fida, who's uh, uh, works in one of our sister hospitals and you know in terms of choice of support in uh, in different hospitals and w you know how to use what is available in, in, in your hospital yes hi can you guys hear me yes okay so uh, yes I, uh, I think what we would have loved to see in the case presentation and I believe it, it must be coming um, uh, right uh, in the case is what are the initial presenting hemodynamics uh, uh, to decide on the support. Um, but it, uh, what information Anusha has presented, it looks like uh, that this young man deteriorated pretty quickly and the decision was made to proceed uh, with uh, via ECMO. So um, if, uh, if the time allows, um, uh, if the time allows and it is a less um, in less fulminant presentation, then uh, we can always start with less support because less, uh, and, and if, if the patient is tolerating that, because that also means less complications from not only cannulation, uh, but also bleeding um, uh, complications and with ECMO, inflammatory syndrome and everything else. But uh, usually, um, so, so the way this case is heading, at least with the presentation that is given, it, it, it's possible that this is a fulminant myocarditis we are looking at uh, uh, that, that is requiring via ECMO. But uh, again, if we can support the patients with lower support like IABP uh, or an impella uh, and, and quickly assess them as if they are improving or not, uh, then that would help, um, uh, and, and the, the decision making with the Swan GANs uh, uh, would be really helpful. Thank you. And I guess there's a question now. That, uh, uh, they cannot see the EKG very well, but are there Q waves in the lateral territory? Uh, there were no Q waves. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to share my screen right now. Uh, I'll probably have to reboot this computer. It, we can pre proceed with the other two presentations. I can probably just... Uh, let's see if I, I think uh, we may be able to do it here. Yeah, if you just, if I think I have your slides and uh, and we can... Yeah. Can. yeah, while you guys are troubleshooting, I think Nadia brought up a valid point of hemodynamics. And if I may have to guess, we might not have had hemodynamics in this situation and depending on where you are, sometimes you're just moving forward with, with what support you can. And also in this case, it sounds like it was more of a ECPR, at least maybe not ECPR, ECLS, which means that you're almost coding the patient or in the, in, during a code, you're using uh, mechanical support. And in those situations, sometimes you have to bite the bullet and do the max support for BIV. Another thing to acknowledge is uh, I think there are two schools of thought that are evolving. One is what Nadia said, which I think we probably, most of us in this center practice, where do the least support that you can, but you want to start early in that least support, provided it's justified by your physiology, and then very timely assess, reassess, and escalate care. Another school of thought that is prevalent in some centers is throw in the max support, which is by view support, even if there's a suspicion, and then slowly de-escalate. I think I don't think there's any evidence to go one way or the other, but I think you have to you have to remember both schools of thought depending on which center you're in and what's available. 
Um, but if you do a minimal support, always have to reassess very quickly to uh, upgrade the support as needed. Those are all good points that, uh, you know, we're at, at big medical centers, we're fortunate to have these big warehouses of a variety of different <coughs> devices that we can carefully select and tailor which device, which technology will fit the patient. M many centers have to choose which <coughs> device they'll have and, and hope that that will fit the majority of their patients. So I, I think that uh, if you have the ability to have a number of different devices and you can be very, you can target exactly what you're trying to treat, uh, but, if, but if all you have is ECMO, ECMO is the best choice. All right, great. So I have the slides up, and uh, Anusha, you can just tell me when to move forward, um, but we have the, sure, the next uh, slide up. I think I got it. The secrets are being revealed. Yeah, this is, I think, this is an issue. Uh, if you can share the screen with the slides, I can continue the presentation. Okay. Do you have the slides? Yeah, yeah they're up here. Okay. Okay. So, um, as I've said, uh, on arrival to HMH, he was still uh, he was on support with VA one in Palacios C three, and he was on norepinephrine and amiodarone, uh, epinephrine uh, plus of support mm -hmm. and amiodarone. As Dr. Dimrash pointed out, he was still in April with RBR and uh, after arrival to HMH here, and okay. I have. Uh, if you are able to see the slides, I have the TTE uh, on the up on the slides uh, when he came into the when he came here, which still showed uh, severely depressed biventricular function. In the right heart catheterization, uh, as uh, we were talking about the hemodynamics, it was performed as he, after he came here, and it showed elevated biventricular filling pressures. This was on ECMO and impeller support, and uh, at this time we were considering possible myocarditis and that was the reason we performed an endomyocardial biopsy. And the pathology it showed only, uh, so was reported as uh, borderline myocarditis. It was uh, read as mild focal interstitial infiltrate with mild edema and minimal focal myocyte damage. And in summary, it did not have any features consistent with the significant myocarditis or chain cell myocarditis. So we did not we did not initiate steroids uh, given the lack of features uh, of uh, concerning for Jane cell myocarditis, and the hemodynamics remained stable uh, with bedside. Uh, and during the course of the hospitalization, we were able to drain down the ECMO flows down to two liters per minute. And at this point, uh, we felt it was able to be decannulated with a backup of possible impeller 55 if he does not tolerate the decannulation. But we were able to decannulate him in the OR on day five and continue the impeller CP. And the impeller CP was later able to be removed in the cath lab. And uh, the inhaled nitric oxide, which was started for by our right side support and the mildrenone were able to be weaned off in a few days after after winning the mechanical circulatory support. And this was the uh, echocardiogram on day 11. As you could see, uh, there was uh, improvement in the biventricular function uh, and was reported as uh, at a 45 to 50%. And uh, this was the MRI that was done because there was still some concern for uh, myocard, uh, for uh, still was, we were trying to uh, look for the etiology of the myocard. Uh, acute decompensated presentation. So it was read as late focal late gadolinium enhancement, which could be seen in some cases of myocarditis, not in all the cases of UDVC diffuse uh, gadolinium enhancement. And uh, next slide, please. And these are the representative uh, videos of how this EF improved uh, compared over the course of the hospitalization with adequate support.
we did just send out genetic testing in this patient, uh, which was uh, came back positive with TTN. Uh, so, and at this juncture, uh, this was this came back after he was discharged for home on adequate guideline directed medical therapy, and uh, we were able to actually send him for genetic counseling as uh, when he came back for a follow up visit. At this point, I'd like to uh, just. Uh, Touch base, uh, touch briefly on ECMO support, uh, use of ECMO support in these patients presenting with acutely compensated heart failure and cardiogenic shock. After publishing of the shock trail, early use of uh, mechanical circulatory support has increased uh, in the United States along with the use of increased use of VA ECMO. This is the graph showing the consistent increased use of VA ECMO over the past several years in both in MI patients and in patients with uh, heart failure presenting with cardiogenic shock. So uh, when do I consider uh, VA ECMO in my patient? Um, next slide, please. So uh, it allows, uh, VA ECMO allows uh, temporary cardiopulmonary support and it, al it allows the time where, uh, whereby you can allow for either recovery, either in cases, of, like in cases of uh, myocarditis, or it allows time to decide or uh, to, uh, evaluate for advanced therapies. It can be considered in patients with refractory cardiogenic shock um, needing uh, biventricular support, such as patients presenting with fulminant myocarditis or patients presenting post-transplant patients presenting with primary graft dysfunction. And it also has been recently included in the guidelines for uh, extra as eCPR, as extracorporeal CPR in patients presenting with refractory weak arrest. Of course, contraindications include any irrecoverable condition or any un unwitnessed asystole, or if this is not in accordance to the patient's wishes. So once I have my patient on uh, VA ECMO, do I have a role for uh, Impella or intraatic balloon pump? VA ECMO increases LV afterload by increasing the by due to the retrograde flow uh, of uh, blood in the descending aorta, and this by uh, increases the complications for uh, white out lung or catastrophic complications like LV thrombus, which we've sometimes seen in patients. In these patients, uh, ECMO intraatic balloon pump or impella helps to unload the heart and thus by decrease the LV after filling or after uh, LV filling pressures. And in words of Dr. Bimraj, actually truly rest the heart. Uh, so briefly touching on the genetic testing in uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, after genomic sequencing was introduced, more than 60 mutations were identified in dilated cardiomyopathy, of which TDN, LAMN, and SCN5, which is a voltage-gated sodium channel, uh, were among the most common mutations. And usually genetic testing is positive in about 15% of sporadic DCM and about 30% of familial dilated cardiomyopathy. And, but the pheno, even if you have a gene, the phenotypic expression depends upon maybe gene penetrance and also, of course, environmental triggers. Um, and uh, what is the importance of uh, genetic testing in these patients? It also uh, not only helps in genetic counseling of the patient and screening of the immediate family uh, members, but it also helps uh, prognosticating these patients in the sense these patients are at higher risk of atrial fibrillation and non-sustained ventricular tachycardia and also decreased survival. I think that was the last slide I had. Thank you. So great, that was a, a really fascinating case. I think everyone got expecting fulminant myocarditis and, and found to have a, a genetic cardiomyopathy. So uh, it, it was, did he have a family history of, of, uh, of heart failure? No, he did not. Uh, he was the first, uh, he was the only one in his family who had cardiac issues. Yeah. And, and did his EF completely recover after or did he just get out of the shock state? He EF uh, recovered and further imaging that we had uh, here, he was actually seen a couple of times in our uh, clinic. Yeah, that's a f really uh, great, case. great case. All right. Thank, thank you. you uh, thank you, Dr. Sankara, for that. And I think uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Uh, Salil Kumar, uh, uh, who is one of our STARS second year cardiology fellows, uh, who uh, Sal, can you come on? Okay. Uh, and Sal uh, uh, went to medical school in Ohio State and uh, uh, then did his internal medicine residency uh, at uh, uh, Albert Einstein uh, College of Medicine in, in, in New York. And uh, um, 
uh, now has joined us to do his cardiology fellowship and is, is on track to be a heart failure transplant cardiologist. <laughs> Um, jumping right into it, so today I'll be presenting a case. Thank you guys for all for having me, and thank you guys for tuning in. Um, so we have a 78-year-old female who has a history um, who presents with worsening dyspnea. So she states that three weeks prior to admission, she started to have chest pain in the upper abdomen, and it would radiate to the mid-sternum, um, and this lasted and it was constantly pre present and it would gradually worsen over the next three weeks. And then one week prior to admission, she started to develop dyspnea on exertion. She had a mild non-productive cough. Um, with this, she had no orthopnea, no PND. She had some, she reported some lower extremity swelling. She denied any fever, chills, sore throat, no hemoptysis, no dysgeusia, no anosmia. Um, and she didn't have any presyncopal or syncopal episodes. This dyspnea on exertion progressed over the next week until she started to develop dyspnea on rest. Her past medical history, she just had hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. There's no really relevant surgical history or social history for this case. On physical exam, seeing her when she arrived, um, she was in respiratory distress, setting 70% on room air. She was tachypnic. She was afebrile. For her blood pressure, it was 201 over 124, so markedly hypertensive. And her heart rate was 101. And on the telemetry by bedside, it appeared to be a sinus rhythm. On exam, just looking at the patient, she was in respiratory distress. She had an elevated JVD at a 45 degree angle. She was tachypnic, um, but her lungs did sound clear. She was tachycardic with a regular rhythm. Um, otherwise, I couldn't appreciate any murmurs, rubs, or gallops. And then otherwise, her extremities were warm and she had one plus edema. So at this point, without any laboratory data or without any further imaging, it's important to keep in mind what would be on your differential diagnosis. I know it's early in the case, but this should help guide what further testing you're going to order. And most importantly, what you want to do, and especially when you're in the ED, is rule out life-threatening causes of chest pain um, that can um, be lethal. So these include ACS, aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, spontaneous pneumothorax, and esophageal rupture, tamponade. Um, for here, this patient looked like she was presenting with evidence of predominantly right-sided volume overload and respiratory distress. Um, so things like PE with RV involvement come to mind and are higher on the differential. And, um, whether or not she has an arrhythmia or valvular heart disease affecting the right side also is on the differential. But important to go into this thinking broadly, think about your other systems. I know it's a heart failure summit, but you have things like pulmonary embolism, pneumonia on your differential. And from a metabolic perspective, this could be anemia that's worsening a patient with underlying heart failure. So jumping into the labs, um, this patient in labs is most notable for an ABG that was consistent with a chronic respiratory alkalosis um, with metabolic compensation. Um, she has hyponatremia and um, hypokalemia, and she has a transaminitis with a hepatocellular and a cholestatic liver test elevation pattern, and she has a myelolactic acidosis. The troponin here is normal, and the next one ended up being normal as well, effectively ruling out ACS. Your BMP is a bit elevated, which goes along with this history we got obtained of having possible some right-sided volume overload. Her CBC overall is unremarkable and not really contrib contributory. Um, her EKG shows sinus tachycardia, which is why I didn't put it up here, and her chest x-ray showed no significant pulmonary pathology, no evidence of pneumothorax. And so at this point in the case, we have someone who has hypoxemia, um, with a chronic respiratory alkalosis, uh, you really don't want to miss pulmonary embolism. So appropriately in the ED, they attained a CTPE. Um, so to our surprise, uh, the CTPE showed a mass here in the right atrium. Um, and then you can also see it. It's a four by six centimeter mass and it appears to be extending into the 
IVC. And so at this point, in order to get a better understanding of what the mass looks like and the hemodynamic effects of a mass, the first thing we first and probably one of the best screening tests, our original test for a cardiac mass you can get is a transthoracic echocardiogram, which can help you, appre help you appreciate what the hemodynamics are here. So this is a right ventricular focused view. If you guys can see it playing, um, you can see this big, it's about 4.7 by 4.2 centimeters here on the echo dimensions we see. It's coming in and out of the right atrium and translocating up until the tricuspid valve. And it's quite remarkable. Um, and then here, just another RV inflow track focus view to appreciate it. We did, um, there was some contrast imaging done that wasn't able to put up here, but it did show very little uptake into the mass itself. So now we're posed with the question of what is the etiology of this cardiac mass? And whenever you are presented with a cardiac mass, the basic things you're going to think about is, is this tumor? Is this thrombus? Is this vegetation? Or is this kind of a anatomic related structural lesion that's accentuated. So in these patients, it's important to think about the context of why they're presenting. So um, typically in order to get a better diagnosis of what your cardiac mass is, you can typically use more advanced cardiac imaging modalities, which I'll talk about a bit later. However, um, in her, um, on day one, of her presentation, she developed respiratory distress, needed to get intubated, and she had um, hypotension when laying completely supine. So you transfer her into the left lateral decubitus position, and her pressures would raise. However, still with this, you would need to give her um, uh, vasopressor support, and it was just not feasible to get her to the imaging lab to get a cardiac MRI, which would be ideal to uh, better characterize the tissue characteristics of this mass um, or getting her to CT or to a PET. And so what we did is uh, tissue is the gold standard of diagnosing any cardiac mass. Is um, Dr. Bimraj was able to take this patient um, to the cath lab and with help from our um, advanced imaging faculty, we're able to use transthoracic imaging here to visualize the um, uh, a right heart cath um, and biopsy by Ryer cath for uh, fluoroscopic guidance as well. And at this time, after the pathology came back, we found that it was a um, it was hepatocellular carcinoma, and AF, serum AFP levels were elevated, um, and we were able to clinch a diagnosis of uh, metastatic hepatocellular carcinoma. This is further um, as she got better. She was able to get an MRI of the abdomen which showed a liver tumor, 4.8 by 3.8 centimeters, that was really invading the local vasculature of the hepatic veins, going to the IVC and the IVC invading into the right atrium. So a very dramatic presentation for her. Um, on day seven of her hospitalization, there was a multidisciplinary meeting. Unfortunately, she was deemed not a surgical candidate due to how sick she was. She then underwent um, transarterial chemoembolization of lemur mass um, palliatively. Um, and she was found to have hepatitis, chronic hepatitis B, which is likely the cause of why she had hepatocellular carcinoma and started on, on uh, treatment for the hepatitis for chronic suppression. So this brings us to our talk about cardiac tumors in general. When you're first approaching a cardiac tumor and you've diagnosed that the mass is a tumor, you have two different pathways you're going to take. First pathway is you're going to decide whether that this is either primary cardiac tumor or secondary cardiac tumor. The secondary cardiac tumors are far more common. They're, by definition, malignant. They have four main mechanisms of spread, hematologic, lymphatic, intravascular, direct invasion. So in this case, it's direct invasion from liver into the IVC and then to the right atrium. And uh, the three most common malignancies associated with cardiac metastases or long breasts and hematologic malignancies. On the other side, we have primary cardiac tumors, and here 90% of the primary cardiac tumors are benign, with an incidence of 
1,380 per 100 million individuals. Just because they're benign doesn't mean that they will need, end up needing operative therapy depending on the hemodynamics of how the mass is um, affecting the patient on a day-to-day -day basis. Cardiac tumors have a spectrum of the way that they can present. They can be asymptomatic and caught on imaging and be in this incidental loma. They can present with systemic symptoms. So these include constitutional symptoms to fever, arthralgias, weight loss, fatigue, and as perineoplastic syndromes. For cardiac symptoms, um, they are mostly all due to the secondary to the mass effect of the tumor itself. They can result in decreased myocardial function or blood flow. They can result in arrhythmias. They can interfere with heart valves, causing regurgitation or pericardial fusion with or without tamponade. Here in our patient, um, you kind of have an obstructive type physiology where it's plopping into your uh, tricuspid valve. And as the patient progressed, it was obstructing blood flow back from the IBC, which is why um, we had to turn into left lateral decubitus. And finally, uh, these cardiac tumors can present with embolic complications of pulmonary systemic thromboembolic phenomenon. So as I alluded to, we have different multimodality imaging that we're very blessed here at Houston Methodist to have access to. Um, first test that we should obtain is a transthoracic echo. It's useful for understanding the hemodynamic effects of the mass and it's optimal for imaging small, high, highly mobile masses, so masses less than one centimeter or masses arriving, rising from the valves. On transesophageal echo, um, it does have some added value. It can help clearly delineate, especially for atrial masses, the size, the morphology, where it's attaching to and the extension of the mass and the hemodynamic effects. And 3D uh, real-time imaging can also further help characterize the size and the shape of the mass. Ultrasound enhancing agents um, can be used to help define if a uh, mass is vascular with malignant tumors more likely to have uh, highly vascularized structure and there's more enhancement in the tumor itself. Uh, on CMR, we, it really helps with um, showing the tissue characteristics by looking at your T1 and T2 mapping. Um, and from there, you can really try to define what the mass is and make a diagnosis of how going to an invasive step of biopsying the mass. Here, we haven't talked so much as about cardiac CT and PET, but they're both useful in their own ways. Here, I present kind of a flow diagram from uh, a review article from the uh, Journal of Cardiac Oncology from Jack and as we said, when we have cardiac mass, you need to make sure that you indeed have a tumor. This involves looking at the clinical context of the patient. Um, and if you do have a tumor, it's most likely, again, that it's a metastatic mass first and foremost. Once you exclude that it's a metastatic mass, you know that it's a primary tumor, it's most likely benign. And you can kind of triage what is the mass or what is the likelihood of what kind of mass it is depending on the age group of your patient. Uh, pediatric patients have one set of differential diagnoses and adult patients have one set of their differential as well. And then you can go on to use your cardiac imaging, advanced cardiac imaging to further define what the mass is. We can also stratify what mass is possibly present based on the location. So here, for example, in the right atrium, our differential should have included thrombus, myxoma, lymphoma, sarcomas, including angiosarcomas, uh, metastasis, and lipomas. And finally, HCC with cardiac involvement is can happen. It's about 1.2 to 4% of, uh, it complicates 1.2 to 4% of all HCC um, carcinomas. HCC itself is the fifth most common cancer in the world, men and ninth in, in women worldwide. If you have a patient who has HCC presenting with RA involvement, uh, the median survival is two months and may improve to four months with aggressive therapies. There's a wide, like all cardiac tumors and masses, there's a wide variable uh, clinical presentations out there that a patient can present with. So that's all I have for you guys, and I'm happy to help try to field any questions. So thank you, Sal, uh, for that uh, excellent presentation. And this is, you know, 
as we have a large cardio oncology program this is not uncommon thing for us to see these masses both on the right and left side and i have a question for dr trachtenberg here in terms of uh, you know when to biopsy these masses uh, it often comes up and uh, um, we do use MRI quite a bit. Do you want to sort of elaborate the role of MRI sure. and also, you know, in terms of deciding when to, when to biopsy? Sure. Well, I think MRI is very useful to get characteristics of the uh, of the mass and, and to see, you know, whether it leans towards, you know, sometimes it could just be a thrombus versus versus a, a, a tumor. So I think you know MRI is quite good at differentiating you know, a, a, a clot from a from a mass. So, but once you have, if, if it's suspicious for not being a thrombus, then really um, you need to get tissue somewhere. So once you have a cardiac mass, uh, the next thing I would do would be uh, doing some kind of uh, full body imaging, especially a PET imaging. If there's extra cardiac tissue that may be more amenable to biopsy, I'd pursue that. If there's not, then you really need to get some tissue because if you have a cardiac lymphoma, it's treated very differently than a cardiac sarcoma or myxoma, et cetera. Um, and so you really need to know what you're treating. So if you don't have any other mechanism of having histology, then a cardiac biopsy for a primary cardiac tumor would be the way to go. Uh, and I guess there's another question by Dr. Bhimraj about why the patient would feel was feeling short of breath, and most likely it is from uh, pure obstruction. Now, whether there were certain small subsegmental PEs which could have, you know, uh, gone, it's hard to know. But uh, uh, I, I think pr probably both of them contributed to why the patient was feeling uh, short yeah. of breath. Yeah. And Sal, I, I presume you were you were thinking hepatocellular carcinoma this whole time, right? That was number one, two, and three on the <laughs> So, you know, so no, that's it's a great presentation. Um, uh, any other uh, thoughts or, or questions? Uh, questions? Looks like um, looks like no. Thank you, Sal. That was a great presentation. Uh, appreciate it. And for our third and final presentation, it's my great pleasure to invite Dr. H. J. Ali. Uh, Dr. Ali uh, was an internal medicine resident at, at Brown University uh, before we recruited her uh, here to Houston Methodist. She is uh, a star first year fellow, uh, and I'm not just saying that because she wants to do heart failure, um, but uh, we look forward to uh, many years of her success and uh, look forward to her presentation today. Thank you, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Let me see if I can share my slides here. Okay. Can you hear me okay? All right, so I'll get started. Um, so uh, again, uh, my name is HJ. I'm actually uh, presenting uh, with some of the materials that have been pre prepared by Dr. Miguel Castro, one of our advanced heart failure fellows. So the case that I'll be presenting is a 59-year-old gentleman with a history of hypertension and asthma coming in with one week of uh, progressive shortness of breath on exertion. Uh, he reported not uh, having shortness of breath just after walking a block and having lack of energy. And this is, in the, uh, this is actually uh, in association, we asked for some heart failure symptoms and he denied any orthopnea, PND, and bendopnea. Uh, but he had had some significant weight loss, 40 to 50 pounds in the past six months. And so his PCP had done a very uh, extensive workup as outpatient, um, including multiple CTs and MRIs. And uh, CT chest was, uh, came back concerning for COVID pneumonia. And so he was told to present to the ED. On review of systems, uh, again, the weight loss, as I mentioned before, as well as lack of appetite and difficulty sleeping. And he also noted some intermittent confusion, having, having pain and weakness in his bilateral lower extremities and difficulty walking. He also had some back pain that radiated along uh, the bilateral lower extremities for the past month. He also had this history of bilateral hearing loss and otherwise denied cardiac complaints. Again, no chest pain, palpitations, and leg swelling. Um, and uh, other infectious symptoms he denied, no GI symptoms. Um, and, uh, you know, so of note, his PCP was concerned about, you know, this peripheral neuropathy, um, unclear cause, uh, and, um, 
they also sent a perineoplastic panel that was negative. Other history, so uh, the past medical history, as I mentioned, uh, he had tympanoplasty back in 2018, which had not helped with his hearing loss. Um, family history was non-contributory. He was originally from Morocco. Um, and these were his meds, including an inhaler, uh, pregabalin, um, some hypertensive meds, and uh, a stat. On physical exam on arrival, he has some concerning vital signs. So he was hypotensive, 90s over 50s, heart rate of 100, um, no temperature, no fevers, uh, but he was mildly tachypnic and 92% on room air. And his BMI was noted to be 16, uh, so it was only 103 pounds. And otherwise, again, uh, concerning that he was somnolent, he was actually aphasic at the time, appeared very cachectic. His cardiac exam, notable for tachycardia, and he did have mildly elevated filling pressures, JVP estimated to be eight centimeters, and trace edema bilaterally. He had uh, de decreased breath sounds bilaterally on palm exam, and then on neuro exam, just really not following uh, commands, no focal signs, and he was noted to have reduced muscle bulk in his calves bilaterally. So at this time, we'll pause uh, for a differential diagnosis. Uh, just to summarize the 59-year-old uh, history of hypertension and asthma, coming in with one week of uh, progressive shortness of breath and has elevated filling pressures on exam. And the background has some constitutional signs and uh, polyneuropathy. Um, I could offer a differential here. So uh, essentially kind of one way to, I think, tie some of these symptoms together is uh, thinking about systemic processes affecting the heart. So infiltrative cardi cardiomyopathies such as amyloidosis comes to mind, um, sarcoidosis, other auto autoimmune diseases. Um, as uh, Sal uh, uh, did, you know, presented in his present, uh, told us in his presentation, certainly metastases to the heart are possible uh, given his constitutional symptoms uh, had preceded his heart failure symptoms. Um, uh, things like HIV or other infections causing cardiomyopathy is also possible. Um, so I can pause here. I don't know if uh, the um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Trachtenberger, Dr. Guha, if you had anything else you wanted to add to the differential. Yeah, yeah. no, that's a great start. I think pretty comprehensive. Uh, let's, uh, Dr. Fida, Dr. Bimraj, do you have, have anything to add to, uh, to that differential? Sounds uh, I, like... I, I think Maybe it is a, this is exoticism, but it's interesting. There are some gene mutation syndromes for cardiomyopathy <coughs> because it's a heart failure conference and uh, sensory neural uh, uh, loss of uh, hearing loss because that's, that's one thing that became obvious. Uh, but of course, the weight loss and other things, we're thinking amyloid because we're an amyloid center. Uh, I think right now it's a broad, broad differential. Um, Cardiac cachexia doesn't cause diarrhea, so that's or that doesn't cause weight loss per se in this context. But that's also another thing to think about. Uh, uh, those are just a few extra additions in my mind. All right. So without further ado, um, just some more objectives here. His EKG I just presented here, but effectively a, a normal EKG, and then the CT chest that brought him to the ED. So. Uh, this was a CTPE protocol, negative for PE. The pulmonary artery was normal in diameter. And then uh, they did note there were some clusters of lymph nodes. It's hard to see particularly in this view, but the largest one uh, of, the, of the lymph nodes was measured at 1.7 centimeters. Otherwise, known masses noted here. And uh, they did uh, note the obvious sort of bilateral patchy, patchy ground glass opacities more in the right lung than the left. Uh, then moving on to the labs. So here we see that he had leukocytosis on presentation, uh, uh, as well as uh, thrombocytosis. And on differential, you see the significant hypereosinophilia. And on chemistries, uh, he is hypochloremic, um, low albumin, some signs of um, uh, poor, poor nutrition. And COVID-19 was uh, negative. Uh, BNP was elevated for him, 468. And certainly, given the high eosinophils, we checked for IgE, which was elevated. And CRP and SED rate were elevated as well. And troponins uh, were rising, uh, despite the um, you know, lack of chest pain. 
And then moving on to some images. So uh, obtaining the echo here, the there's mild left ventricular concentric hypertrophy. Its EF is noted to be uh, mildly depressed, 40 to 45%. And uh, there's some uh, mildly reduced RV function here uh, noted as well. Uh, otherwise, no pericardial effusion and uh, the valvule, the no major valvulopathy is noted. So HJ, just to pause here, I mean, I think that's a pretty impressive uh, um, differential on your white blood count with 40% uh, eosinophils. Um, so a patient with a background of asthma, I know you highlighted that a couple times and probably if we were taking a board question that would have been something we would have uh, put our eyes on, but, but we weren't thinking about that until now you're showing us a very abnormal eosinophil count. So just want to see, you know, the panel now that we're seeing this, uh, this eosinophilia, you know, what they, and looking at the echo, there's a few, you know, different types of eosinophilic myocarditis, which I'm guessing you might be um, showing us in a moment, but what would our panel kind of do as the, the next step here? So, I mean, the echocardiogram, as AJ pointed out, uh, LV uh, is pretty normal size. There is mild concentric uh, hypertrophy, but uh, we're not seeing the characteristic signs of eosinophilic uh, myocarditis here, um, which would be infiltration of the uh, or patchy dense. Um, I don't think you guys can see my cursor, but in the apical uh, form, we can see some fibrotic changes there. Um, I see in the short axis view, um, which is probably more of an artifact than, a, than an actual uh, filling right uh, under the, um, the posterolateral uh, papillary muscles, uh, which is probably not uh, the telltale sign of eosinophilic um, myocarditis. RV is a little bit on a bigger side um, and uh, the function is probably uh, mildly reduced. Um, so uh, I think at this stage, um, at this stage, just by echocardiography, not having any significant valvular disease on both the mitral and the tricuspid and the aortic valves, we can see in the peristernal long axis, the differential is still broad as to what we are dealing with. So I, I think uh, HJ, I'm, I'm sorry, I might have missed it. But is there troponin elevation, you said? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, their, their troponin was elevated uh, to about one, at 1.3. And then the eosinophils, as Dr. Trackenberg said, was what, 40%? 44%, yes. Yeah, I think the biggest, and, and, and Barry, I'm glad you pointed towards that direction. One of the, I, I feel like personally, one of the biggest misnormers still in the field of medicine is when we say myocarditis, Everybody is thinking of a dying patient coming in sick in cardiogenic shock because that's been the picture that we painted. I think it's important to recognize that there's a whole segment of what I uh, cardiomyopathy is what I call as inflammatory cardiomyopathies, and eosinophilic infiltration, lymphocytic infiltration, is a possibility where the presentation is not that acute. Uh, and, and what Nadia was talking about is also a differentiation where it is a uh, Loeffler syndrome or the eosinophilic myocarditis, as it's called, essentially for some reason in those individuals, it forms these webs in the apex. But I think it's important to remember and acknowledge, and I don't know what this case is, it could be that, but if you have 40% eosinophils, you have troponins and symptoms with with look and a little bit of a wall motion abnormalities, to me, you can have eosinophilic inflammation. And I've seen patients come in with allergic myocarditis, which might not be fulminant and from ranging from any insult that can happen. But of course, the eosinophilic syndromes need to be ruled out, which include hematologic syndromes. Um, and in, depending on which part of the world you're coming from, there are other eosinophilic syndromes that can be caused. But as simple as I've seen temporally associated drug-mediated eosinophilic myocarditis, as like even Levaquin, uh, you know, I had a patient with that. So the distinction should be important to understand that these patients don't have to come in as that fulminant myocarditis. These are inflammatory cardiomyopathies where the immune system is attacking the heart for whatever reason we still don't understand. 
and and you know i guess common things being common with troponin leak and you know somebody in 59 uh, what what do, what do our panelists think about actually just going ahead and doing an angiogram to make sure the patient doesn't have you know coronary disease no, I think it's it's very uh, reasonable to to do that. I would either uh, some kind of ischemic workup, whether it's a, a coronary CTA if it's less likely, or direct angiogram, um, especially if we're considering whether we're going to biopsy this patient, take them to the lab anyways, which um, we'll see what happens. But uh, I definitely think that the patient deserves some kind of ischemic um, evaluation, even if the eosinophilia is staring us in the face. Um. So I'll uh, continue with this case because the next test that uh, the team, oops, excuse me, let me see if I can, uh, I may have to reshare, give me just one sec. All right, here we go. Oh, there we go. All right. so. This MRI may or may not play, but um, the next step uh, the primary team took was to get a cardiac MRI. And what this showed was, again, the reduced uh, LVEF of 35%, reduced RV uh, uh, function as well. Um, and uh, of note, as you can see, this gadolinium enhancement, um, uh, that there is some endocardial uh, gadolinium enhancement of the LV myocardium and in both papillary muscles. Um, that Dr. I know Dr. Fida had mentioned before in the echo, and as well as in, even in the left atrium. Um, there was also noted to be some paradoxical septal motion, and uh, there was a, a bit of a pericardial effusion that was noted um, here as well. So I think, I, well, I kind of wanted to pause here and ask up to the panelists, uh, as far as the next steps in, um, in diagnosis, uh, what they, what you might order next. Well, I, I think I, you, yeah. <laughs> sorry. You showed it, but, uh, but I think end of the day, it's good to uh, in, uh, talk about some of the things. When MRI, we're, we're using MRI quite a bit in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, maybe sometimes excessively, but I think there's a, there's a method to that madness because you don't want to miss inflammation or reversible diagnosis for heart failure. So I think I think one of the things to remember for, for everybody is when you're seeing a cardiomyopathy patient or somebody with cardiac involvement, like troponins to me mean the myocardium is getting damaged even if the EF is normal. And Ash brought up a very valid point. This could, finally this could end up being just CAD, who knows? But if it is CAD, well and good, but presuming it's not a CAD, you want to find reasons that can be reversed. And MRI is a very good screening test. And as Hedge pointed out, MRI just shows you expansion of intracellular space. And that intracellular space can be either deposited with collagen or it could be deposited with a bunch of uh, cells. So, and depending on where you are and who's reading the report, sometimes the reports will mislead you by calling it SCAR. And what they're saying is it could be SCAR, but it could also be active inflammation. So you need to know whether what is in that interstitial space and either you do a biopsy or to know that it is active inflammation or not, as HJ pointed out next, PET scans becoming more and more uh, a primary next step to differentiate if there's still active inflammation or not. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I mean, I think an important next step for me would be, one, as, as Dr. Bhimraj mentioned, even though this patient has a clear history of asthma, uh, which is relatively common, want to make sure there's no new drugs that can be causing a hypersensitivity reaction, and it sounds like that's not the case. So, so we need to think about, you know, idiopathic eosinophilic myocarditis, uh, certainly could be, you know, something like Sherg strauss um, I had to confess that I had to look up where um, in relation to the equator Morocco was um, because, you know, certainly um, subtropical Africa 
uh, especially in Mozambique. Um, Davies disease or endomyocardial fibrosis is very common. I think Morocco sounds like a red herring in this situation because it's, uh, it's, it's quite a ways away from the equator. Um, or um, or Leffler's endocarditis. So I think for me, getting some kind of, um, you know, looking at your ancas to look at, at your Schirk Strauss and, and pulmonary um, uh, comorbid diseases. Um, and, you know, in the back of my mind, if none of these are, are positive, considering hematology for a bone marrow biopsy, but I think starting with your, your blood biomarkers and then a low threshold for a cardiac, bio, a cardiac biopsy um, to definitively diagnose this uh, might be something to consider. Yes, yes, thank you for that. So I'll uh, present the rest of the case uh, and the workup that, that was done. FDG PET was performed, which here, as you can see on uh, the, uh, the, the glucose imaging, you can, you can see inflammation up to actually 54% of the myocardium. Um, involving both papillary muscles here, um, as well as uh, the left atrial wall, which is not pictured, um, and pretty significant uptake in the lateral lateral wall, as you can see. Um, so the rest of the hospital course was notable for, you know, given that he had encephalopathy on an, on okay. a mission. Okay. Um, sorry to interrupt, but I think yeah. I think it's important to uh, differentiate the FDG PET scan from the ischemic PET scan that, that not many institutions might have. So when you go back to those scans, it's, it's important to know that this is, when you say PET scan, a lot of institutions do perfusion PET scan using rubidium. And uh, that is, that's not going to show the FDG uptake because this is glucose uptake which can be used for viability, but in this situation, it's being used for inflammation. So when you order PET scans for this, you should be very specific and say FDG scan for inflammation or sarcoid or something like that. Right, right. All right, so then moving on, again, the brain imaging had shown uh, that he does have some uh, infarction in the left basal ganglia. Uh, the, there was uh, on MRA uh, some significant findings of severe stenosis in the, in the intracranial uh, um, arteries, and he was started on some on DAPT and statins. He also underwent bronchoscopy given the CT findings of the hazy uh, infiltrates that you saw before, and he was found to have 54% deosinophils come back uh, from his bronch sample. Uh, the right heart cath uh, showed um, essentially normal filling pressures at the time. I think this was probably after some diuresis, um, but the biopsy was negative for eosinophils. At this time, he was started on high-dose high dose steroids and as well as GDMT. And even three days later, he, he had some improvement in appetite and was following commands um, and was able to be discharged. As far as uh, the follow-up, um, he was certainly feeling better two months later, and he was seen by rheumatology um, as outpatient, turns out. And uh, I, I will say that, you know, we haven't actually talked about the what, what the underlying diagnosis is yet. I myself had to look this up um, uh, because this, this gentleman ended up having a Chark Strauss uh, or uh, eosinophilic vasculitis with polyangitis diagnosis. And the criteria for diagnosing uh, seems to be that um, certainly we would need help with from rheumatologists to make this uh, uh, final diagnosis. It's always helpful to have a biopsy showing vasculitis with eosinophilic infiltration. But in fact, on the rheumatology, American College of Rheumatology diagnostic criteria, um, he already met uh, many of them on presentation. He had asthma, um, greater than 10% eosinophils on the, on the diff, mononeuropathy, um, as well as um, uh, sort of this transient uh, pul uh, pulmonary opacities, although I suppose we didn't know how transient they were. So he actually met four out of the six criteria already, which gives him this uh, you know, possible diagnosis of Turk Strauss. The other two include paranasal sinus abnormality and uh, the biopsy of uh, uh, the blood vessel, as I mentioned before. Um, so anyway, so rheumatologist uh, started him on a steroid sparing agent, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so, uh, next, I think uh, I will dive into my discussion of eosinophilic myocarditis. So, this is uh, a rare form of myocardial infl inflammation characterized by eosinophilic infiltration, uh, often ac accompanied by peripheral eosinophilia. Here, we see uh, several underlying conditions that can cause eosinophilic myocarditis, as we talked about um, things like the EGPA that uh, our patient had, uh, parasitic infections, 
Uh, these may include, as uh, Dr. Trachtenberg mentioned, in the, subs, uh, in the sort of uh, tro tropical areas, uh, strong buoys or uh, toxicorrhosis, which can also be uh, present uh, you know, even in the States. And then uh, hypersensitivity reaction to drugs. And some of these medications include um, things like anticonvulsants, so hydantoin or carbamazepine, um, allopurinol or hydrochlorothiazide, which are pretty common drugs, um, which uh, which can cause, uh, which can lead to the syndrome of duress. Um, but even other drugs that are new, and so it's important to take that careful history as we discussed. Other solid cancers can cause perineoplastic syndromes, but obviously things like acute leukemia, myel myeloproliferative disorders have to have to all be in your differential. And if all of those things are negative, uh, the patient can end up with a diagnosis of idiopathic hypereosinophilic syndrome. Um, as far as the infiltration of the myocardium, there are really um, two uh, major stages. The necrotic inflammatory stage or the acute eosinophilic myocarditis, um, which is what we suspect our patient had given the FDG PET findings. Or they can also have the thrombotic and fibrotic stages um, uh, known as left cardi cardiomyopathy. As far as the clinical presentation, um, it can be uh, pretty uh, variable. Uh, most uh, more common in males and uh, in the middle ages, 20 to 51. Um, these patients can be posse symptomatic. Some have severe symptoms um, or present with acute myocarditis. Um, but not everybody has to, like Dr. Beamer had said. They can come with sudden cardiac death or um, have restrictive cardiomyopathy from the chronic fib uh, fibrotic stage of this disease. As far as pathophys, um, so through various triggers, um, you can have a peripheral hyper, uh, peripheral eos hyper eosinophilia, and uh, cardiac involvement is quite common, up to 50 to 60%. Uh, eosinophils can, in fact, remain viable in the cardiac tissues for weeks. And these patients, when they have uh, the IL-5 uh, sort of release from the lymphoid tissue cells or the binding of Th2 cells, can uh, activate the eosinophils to degranulate. And, that's, and, and the, the final result is um, necrosis and thrombosis, uh, as well as fibrosis over time. As far as evaluation, again, the careful history is really key here. Um, so whether there are drugs known to cause hypersensitivity or any new drugs that the patient was started on are, is important to note. Any history of travel uh, where eosinophilic um, uh, diseases are common and family history of eosinophilia. There are such thing as um, familiar hypersensitivity, so it's important to take that history as well. Um, EKG, you can have many sort of this huge variety of findings, um, including T abnormalities, Q waves, uh, bundle branch block. And uh, as far as echo findings, uh, you know, there have been actually studies, more small, uh, small scale, about 50 patients or so, looking back to see if there's any predominant um, uh, patterns with eosinophilic myocarditis. And they found that uh, it can really result in LV failure, RV failure, any of the valve pathologies. Um, so there's not really one that, uh, that we associate eosinophilic myocarditis with, but uh, over time, the left lower myocarditis can end up with a restric restrictive cardiomyopathy. As far as diagnosis, biopsy is helpful, but not definitive. So sensitivity is only 50% due to sampling error. And otherwise, as we saw with our patients, CMR and FTG PET can be very helpful. Um, and uh, eosinophilic myocarditis can be associated with uh, late gadolinium enhancement, sort of patchy or diffuse in the sub end of cardio space um, that is not in the, uh, in the territory of uh, the coronaries. So this is sort of looking at the late release criteria. Um, and uh, as you can see here, myocardial edema and non-ischemic myocardial injury uh, are some of the main criteria to, uh, to look for. As far as treatment, really no evidence-based guidelines. Uh, there's some evidence supporting the use of steroids, um, but it's really not fully understood how this um, how the steroids can be helpful. Um, obviously, they can uh, sort of tamp down the immune system uh, overall. Um, but it's but there are there is this uh, encouraging uh, availability, I would say, of of uh, non-steroidal agent mepolizumab, which is an antibody against 
um, uh, blocking the antibody against uh, IL-5. And so uh, by using this IL-5 mechanism, uh, they have been able to show that uh, peripheral eosinophilia can be stabilized. Um, and perhaps that is that can be a, a, a helpful goal for patients who have EM uh, as, uh, on, in addition to the steroids. RCTs are yet to be performed. And this is just a quick review of the uh, of eosinophilic myocarditis. Um, this is based on uh, this is a JAK publication back in 2017. Um, this showed that EM, uh, the median age is about 41 years. Uh, the main symptom representation, like our patient, is dyspnea, and peripheral eosinophilia is observed in most cases, 76 percent. Um, the uh, EF tends to be lower side on the 35 uh, percent was the median. And uh, the most uh, frequently associated disorders uh, were actually Turk Strauss was one of them, um, as well uh, up to 34 percent, I'm sorry, th uh, 13 percent. Um, but otherwise, most that tend to be idiopathic um, or um, uh, hypersensitivity reactions up to 34 um, percent. These patients can be sick, so temporary MCS was in fact used in 17 percent of the patients. So in conclusion, uh, EM is a rare form of myocarditis, uh, peripheral hyperosinophilia, and cardiac symptoms should arouse some clinical suspicions, as was with our patient. And the diagnosis can be made with biopsy, but uh, CMR and FTG pad can be useful. And uh, steroids and other uh, steroid-sparing agents, like mepolizumab, um, are reported to be effective, but more data to come. Fantastic. That was a uh, great case, H.J., a really, uh, really interesting and fascinating case. I think we all learned a lot. Um, what, what is the role of, of the INCAs uh, in the diagnosis for these patients? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. i sorry that I skipped over that. This patient actually was INCA negative, and it uh, turns out for Church strauss patients uh, who have EM, they're, they're less like, likely to be positive for, with INCA. So it's, um, I suppose if it's positive, it can be helpful, but uh, interestingly, in myocarditis patients, they tend to be uh, uh, less prevalent. Great. And I just want to kind of touch on one thing that I mentioned earlier about, about um, you know, sub, tropical, subtropical Africa with, with endomyocardial fibrosis. So there's two distinct, so endomyocardial disease is a broad term for either, you know, Leffler's uh, endocarditis, which is clearly associated with eosinophilia, and, and that's, you know, what you discussed. And then there's endomyocardial fibrosis, or Davies disease, which occurs in, in you know, tropical, subtropical uh, climates. And that doesn't clearly have an association with eosinophilia, but it looks like end-stage um, Leffler's endocarditis as well, with that, uh, you know, f kind of f fibrotic apex of bi both ventricles and AV valve disease, and um, really not a clear ideology of that, and it hasn't really been um, consistently associated with elevated eosinophils, so that, but um, a lot we still don't know about it. So, uh. A fascinating case. Thank you. So, yeah, a great case, and I think that that wraps up the day. Um, again, uh, any, before we wrap up, any, I see Dr. Bhim Rajan, Dr. Fida, any, any final comments from our panel? No, I think that's a, that's a, those are wonderful points that were made uh, in this case uh, overall, uh, and, 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 and I think it, it brings to light that when Hedge talked about this as a rare disease, I think I always recollect that we thought amyloid was rare until we realized we we're missing it. So I personally think inflammatory cardiomyopathies are probably missed more often than not, and uh, we should do everything to make sure we look at look for reasons early on so that reversibility for a cardiomyopathy is, is explored uh, but uh, this is this has been a great conference thank you barry and ash for you know, all the wonderful sessions and coordination yeah thank you to uh the audience uh, for for the active participation we apologize for some of the technical difficulties and, and hopefully if you, there's any slides that you weren't able to see, you'll be able to get um, uh, uh, through if you stay tuned for, for email and be, have access to everything. I think on YouTube, we will, we'll let you know. Um, but uh, again, we want to thank you guys. We want to thank um, HFSA for co-sponsoring this event, uh, Texas Chapter of ACC for, um, for endorsing this as well. 
And um, we would like to thank our, our numerous sponsors, including Abbott, who, um, who sponsored us uh, with a grant of uh, support for this as well. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's, that's it, yeah. That's it, yeah, no, uh, thank you all for, you know, uh, uh, attending the conference, especially since we've postponed. I hope it were, you know, the, the, we apologize for the initial inconvenience, but uh, uh, again, all these videos should be available and hopefully next year we'll have it in person so that we all can meet each other and uh, get to uh, uh, interact uh, personally. Absolutely. Look forward to the seventh annual Heart Failure Summit, Houston Heart Failure Summit. Thank you guys and uh, we'll see you next time.